Yes. Anyone, uh, any observers, guests, uh, should all be up in the gallery. That's it. You may wa wave at your loved ones <laughs> or enemies. <laughs> That's 9.30 then. 9.30 it is then. Uh, could I also remind you, please, if you haven't already done so, to turn off your mobile phones or iPads. Um, take the MP3 players out of your ears. It might be more entertaining than the meeting, but we would like you to pay attention. Uh, Sue or Steve, do you want to say anything about the exits and other arrangements? Thank you. And any, any instructions for when we get to the lunch break? Right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now I'll ask uh, Reverend Gilmore to uh, give our opening prayer. Thank you very much, Chris. It's great to be here, and it's wonderful to be able to welcome you to St. Andrew's and St. George's West Church. I thought I would share a reading, a poem, a prayer, and three stories. The sound of church bells ringing across town and countryside resonates through our history. Bells cheer us when we celebrate festivals alongside such things as music, dance, art, drama, literature and laughter, and at special times, such as when we gather at conference and meet old friends and continue conversations and enjoy good food and a glass of wine or beer or gin or whatever takes your fancy. God is for these things, and in Psalm 150, God values all musical instruments. Praise God in his holy house of worship. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him with a blast on the trumpet. Praise by strumming soft strings. Praise him with castanets and dance. Praise him with banjo and flute. Praise him with cymbals and big bass drum. Praise him with fiddles and mandolin. Let every breathing creature praise God. They should have mentioned bells, of course, in that passage, and bells are mentioned three times in the Law of Moses, and it's worth looking for those and reflecting on the role of bells. I think bells offer a transformational quality in our lives, and so I chose this passage from the book of Romans. Paul says, so then, my brothers, because of your great mercy to us, I appeal to you to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service, pleasing to him. This is the true worship you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to do what is good and pleasing to him and perfect. Thanks be to God. This church was an attempt by Major Fraser at the end of a competition to offer something perfect for God. This was the age of enlightenment and this was the leading city of the enlightenment with such great figures as David Hume. You're in one of the great streets in Europe, George Street, and this building was supposed to reveal enlightenment qualities. There was supposed to be no stained glass. It was supposed to be all clear glass. The idea of the elliptical design was that people could see each other and be close to each other and share community. And through the years, we've managed to transform this church from only being for worship to being a Christian Aid book sale, which has raised almost £2 million for Christian Aid over the last 
40 years or so. It becomes a festival venue at Edinburgh International Festival, and we do very well. We don't have to recruit because people like performing in this building. There's a marvellous acoustic, and it becomes a Christmas tree festival. It can be used for lectures and for conferences. I'm sure Major Fraser and those who were involved in the creation of the new town of Edinburgh would be pleased. I said three stories. The bells which were in that tower rang on the day of James Clark Maxwell's baptism in this place. Some of you will recognize that name. On Albert Einstein's wall in his study, he had two portraits. Not surprisingly, one was Isaac Newton, the other was James Clark Maxwell. I was told by the professor of physics at Edinburgh University of the te top 10 equations ever created in physics, Clark Maxwell made five of them. His statue is just outside on the left-hand side as you leave. Second person to mention to you is Andrew Mitchell Thompson. Again, if you turn from the building, turn left, look at the top of the statue tower there, and you'll see Lord Dundas. Lord Dundas was somebody who had tried to ensure slavery continued for the benefit of industries in Britain and in Scotland. If you turn right and look to the end, you will see St. George's Church, now part of this congregation. Andrew Mitchell Thompson came there as minister in 1814. He was the strongest abolitionist in Scotland over the next 15 years and had strong contact with William Wilberforce. He also wrote some hymns and psalms. The third person reveals the third aspect of this congregation, the disruption in Scotland, which you really don't want to know about. But in 1843, the Church of Scotland split in two. It happened in this building as Dr. Chalmers led out the new Free Church down to Tanwell and St. George's Church, as many churches in Scotland, fractured and became St. George's West from the old St. George's. The most important person for you, perhaps, in the history of that congregation is Sherlock Holmes. Dr. Joseph Bell was the person on whom Sherlock Holmes was based, and he was an elder in St. George's West. If you want to see Sherlock Holmes' statue, you go one street down to Queen Street and right to the corner opposite the Catholic Cathedral. There is history. There are good thoughts. There is a lot to learn in this Enlightenment city. We are here to prepare ourselves for conference, and we're here to offer our prayers. Let us pray. God, though this world depends on your grace, it is governed and tended by mortals. So we pray for those who walk the corridors of power in our parliaments of this and other lands, whose judgments we value or fear here. We remember those who gather in conference today that there may be a strong feeling of fellowship, that there may be good conversations, that relationships are strengthened and the future prepared by discernment, by wisdom, by rational thinking. We thank you for all those who work in bell towers across this country, for the fellowship in the hostelries afterwards, for the activity of the peels and three hours of concentration and hard labor. We remember that many are undervalued, that sometimes it's difficult to create a full band, that sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's wet, and sometimes there are other inhabitants in the bell tower. Living God, we pray not only for ourselves, but for your world, and we remember today the people of Manchester in particular. We can scarcely understand how a young man would choose to go to the end of a concert with young women and explode a device and deliberately take their lives. 
He is part of our country, and we have to change as a nation, to care for our children better, to set better examples and values so that this nation continues to grow in love, in charity, and in peace. Our prayers we bring in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I thought I would read a hymn to finish, and many of you know these words, but we decided that we weren't going to sing it. We call from tower and steeple upon the day of days, all faithful Christian people, to worship, prayer, and praise. We ring with joyous gladness when man and wife are blessed. We peal in muffled sadness for loved ones laid to rest. By union free and willing, the work of God is done. Our master's prayer fulfilling, we would in him be one. One, as the church our mother would have her children stand, befriending one another, a strong and steadfast band. Our lives, like bells, are changing. An ordered course pursue. Through joys and sorrows ranging, may all whose lives ring true. May we, through Christ forgiven, our faults and failures past, attain our place in heaven, called home to rest at last. We receive God's blessing. May the blessing of Almighty God enrich us. May the blessing of the loving Christ surround us. And the blessing of the Spirit, which is holy, give us peace, which is beyond human understanding, keeping our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of Christ from this day to the end of all our days. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ian, for those words. I hope that uh, they will make us mindful of... Uh, responsibilities we've got today and give us the strength to uh, make the right decisions. Thank you. Have a great day and enjoy your lunch. <laughs> Thank you. I must say the, the reading from the, the Ringer's hymn, I still, there's still one line I want to change to read a strong and steadman band. <laughs> I'll now ask the secretary to uh, report on representation of uh, societies. Thank you, Mr. President. 66 societies are affiliated to the Council with 188 representatives. There are 11 vacancies, and those are in the colleges, Derby, Durham and Newcastle, Leicester, Lincoln, Grand Avenue, Middlesex, North South, Southwark, and Waterfield District. There are seven white members, four official members, and six ex officio members. I would ask the description to you in from the East Derby and West Knots should now be on our doormat. <laughs> <laughs> Arrived on Friday or, or Saturday after we'd left home. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, now we're going to ask the new members, we're going to welcome them. Uh, some, of you, some of you were at the welcome meeting yesterday, but we want everybody to see your faces. Um, I'd also remind you that if you haven't uh, signed up your data consent form, you need to do that with Carol later on. Um, Mary will read out the names of the new members, and perhaps as your name is read out, you would stand up so the rest of the council can see who you are and who to blame. Mr. President, new members of council have been elected as representatives for the following societies. For the Bath and Wells, Aaron Mulder. I've seen Aaron somewhere. Yes, hiding behind the lectern. <coughs> for the Bedfordshire Association, Linda Garton. For Cambridge University Guild, James Dan. No, 
for the Coventry Diocesan Guild, Annie Hall, Becky Johnson, and Joy Pluckrose. Three in a row. Right. For the Guild of Devonshire Ringers, Mark Heritage, um, and he sent his apologies. For the Dorset County, Andrew Smith, returning member. Somewhere over there. Right, for Durham University Society, Jeff Ladd. Right. For the Ely Diocesan Association, Sally Mew. No relative. Right. <laughs> for the Four Shires Guild, and also sent his apologies, Matthew Kemble. For the Guildford Diocesan Guild, Mike Bale. For the Hereford Diocesan Guild, who sent his apologies, Gareth Jones. For the Hartford County, Trevor Groom, a returning member. For the Irish Association, Vivian Chamberlain and Don McLean. For the Kent County, Philip Barnes, returning member. For the Ladies Guild, Rosemary Hemmings. For Leeds University Society, Catherine Thorley. For the Leicester Diocesan Guild, and again she sent her apologies, Leanne Brooks. For the Litchfield and Walsall Archdeaconry Society, Derek Giddens. For Liverpool University Society, Martin Bristow. For the Llandaff and Monmouth Diocesan Association, Sam Bolingbrook. For the North American Guild, Eileen Butler. For the North Wales Association, but again having apologised, Beverly Furness. For the Norwich Diocesan Association, Pippa Hughes and Katie Wright. For the Oxford Diocesan Guild, Graham John. For the Oxford Society, Emma Stanford. For Oxford University Society, Robert Hornby. For the Scottish Association, Tina Sturklin, <coughs> returning member. For the Sutherland Nottingham Diocesan Association, Chris Birkby and Jim Crabtree. For the <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, please don't make me laugh. <laughs> Otherwise all you'll hear is my coughs. Right. For the Suffolk Guild, Neil Dodge. For the Sussex County Association, Stella Bianco, returning member. Rob Lane and Stephanie Pendlebury. For the University of Bristol Society, Patrick Wheeler. For the Winchester and Portsmouth Diocesan Guild, Andrew Johnson and Alan Yaldon. And for the Yorkshire Association, Andrew Aspland, returning member, and Janine Jones. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome you all to the Council. I hope you will enjoy the proceedings and I hope that you will also contribute to the future activities. Uh, it's very nice to see quite a few new young people uh, to offset the average age which I'm add to. <laughs> right. Right. If I can just um, recap on other membership changes. One additional member, Bob Cools, was re-elected at the Ports Portsmouth meeting but he's since resigned and one additional member has been elected a representative member, that's David Willis for the Guild of Devonshire Ringers. Two representative members of the previous council now represent different societies. Richard Andrew is now a rep for the St Martin's Guild and Robin Woolley for the Society of Sherwood Youths. And following her marriage to Patrick last autumn, Kate Debott of the East Grinstead Guild is now Kate Wills. Now, are there any other changes that I don't yet know of? Because it would be nice if the answer's no. <laughs> none, none of you did a runner and got married at Gretna, no? Right, OK. Um, apologies for absence. Right. OK, next list. Right. Mr President, apologies have been received um, as follows. From John Baldwin and David Thorne, life members. From Peter Trotman additional member, Michael Orme, Chester Diocesan Guild, Mark Heritage and David Willis of the Guild of Devonshire Ringers,
Brinley Richards, East Derby and West Knotts. Philip Bailey, Ely Diocesan Association. Matthew Kemble and Chris Povey of the Four Shires Guild. Mark Davies and Bill Nash of the Gloucester and Bristol. John Croxton and Gareth Jones of the Hereford Diocesan Guild. Tony Crowther from Hertford County. Alison Britliff of the Lancashire Association. And Leanne Brooks from the Leicester Diocesan Guild. Linda Foddering from the Middlesex County Association and London Diocesan Guild. Beverly Furness, North Wales Association. Peter Adcock, Norwich Diocesan Association. Andrew Howes, Salisbury Diocesan Guild. Robin Woolley, Society of Sherwood Youths. Mary Jones and Norman Mattingly of the Truro Diocesan Guild. And Jackie Brown of the University of London Society. Are there any other apologies? Yes. So it's always very good. Yeah. And sorry, what was that one? Thank you. Any more? Yes. Uh, and yeah. Ernie. And one over here. Sorry, could you say that again? Any more? No? Thank you very much. I'll now ask uh, the Secretary to give the names of those members or former members of the Council who have passed away. Would you call? Kindly stand. Stand, please. Right. Brian David Threlfall, Cambridge University Guild, 1954 to 84, then an honorary member from 84 to 1990, and again the Hereford Diocesan Guild from 96 to 2002, and the Gloucester and Bristol from 2002 to 2008. Brian attended 43 meetings and he died on the 3rd of June 2016. John Edward Camp represented the Oxford University Society from 1969 to 1978. He attended eight meetings and died on the 17th of October. David Beecham of the Worcestershire and Districts Association, he represented them from 1957 to 1975 attended 17 meetings and died on the 30th of October. Jill Staniforth represented the Ladies' Guild from 1951 to 1981. She attended 22 meetings and died on the 7th of January 2017. Frida Cannon represented the Ladies' Guild from 1984 to 2008. Frida attended 20 meetings and died on the 14th of January. Eric Naylor represented the Bath and Wells Diocesan Association from 1967 to 1987. He attended 19 meetings and died on the 27th of January. Norman Arthur Johnson represented the Durham and Newcastle Association from 1984 to 1999. He attended 12 meetings and died on the 31st of January. Ruth Margaret Foreman represented the Middlesex County Association and London Diocesan Guild from 1966 to 1969. She attended two meetings and died on the 19th of February. Brian Morris Buswell represented the Southall Diocesan Guild from 1956 to 1966. He attended seven meetings and died on the 26th of February. Christopher Charles Roberts represented the Chester Diocesan Guild from 1981 to 1994. He attended 12 meetings and died on the 7th of March. Philip Malcolm James Gray represented the New South Wales Association from 1957 to 1962 
and then ANZAB from 1962 to 1996. Philip attended 33 meetings and died on the 10th of April. Geoffrey Richard Drew, honorary member 1970 to 1983, and then Norwich Diocesan Association, 1999 to 2005. Geoffrey attended 13 meetings and died on the 15th of April, 2017. I'll ask Robert Perry to say a word. Almighty God, we thank you for the lives and work of those whom we now commemorate, whom we see no longer, but whose service we recall. We acknowledge their contribution to the work of this council in times past, and ask that we, in our present period of service, may speak and act with courtesy and soak with humility, as we, like those who have gone before us, work for the good of ringing in the way that seems right to each one of us. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Now go to the minutes of last year's meeting held in Portsmouth. Uh, that appeared as page from page 418 on the uh, supplement. Um, there, yes, Mary. That's right. There's one correction to make to the minutes of the last year's meeting, at least one that I know of. Um, in the attendance list, the North Wales Association is subsumed under North Staffs instead of being on a separate line and with a heading in bold. And this has been corrected in the version which will be signed and placed in the minute book. Are there any other corrections which anyone has spotted? If not, can I ask that, uh, are you in agreement that I sign, sorry, has somebody raised their hand over there? No? Can I ask, uh, yes, Ernie. Thank you. Right, proposed and seconded that the minutes be adopted. Are you all in favour? Any against? Thank you. Now, before we uh, pass on to uh, some of the more formal uh, items, um, I'd remind uh, all of you, uh, please wait for a microphone before speaking. Uh, for the new, for any new members who are not familiar, uh, we'd like you to give your name and the name of the society or association that you represent, so people are aware of uh, who's speaking. Um, I should also point out that the meeting is being streamed live, so um, the Duke of Edinburgh is watching at Buckingham Palace, you know, <coughs> ready to say, you know, what a strange bunch they are. <laughs> um, and uh, it's also going out live on the internet, so anything you say which is derogatory it will be recorded for posterity. Um, it's also being recorded to assist with the minutes. Uh, if there are any members who have interest, financial or business interests in the bell related trades, you should declare that um, uh, as a, a relevant interest prior to any proceedings which might be affected. One thing very important today, because we've got quite a lot of uh, contentious items probably to discuss later on, uh, ask all members to be courteous to their fellow members. Um, we are all volunteers. We're all here for the good of ringing, ringing and ringers as a whole. And um, uh, non-members, of course, are seated in the gallery, so there's no confusion. Okay, um, are there any matters arising from the minutes, which you've just approved, which are not covered by items elsewhere on the agenda.
No, nothing? Right, okay, thank you. Um, I will now ask the um, Secretary to uh, deal with the annual report of the Council, which uh, is on page 429 of your supplement. Right, right, Mr. Sorry. Mr. President, since the annual report was prepared, there have been a few changes to paragraph 4. There are now only four additional members and 188 representative members. That's in the penultimate sentence of the paragraph. And then in the appendix on page 430, in the first sentence, um, we need to add that the Durham and Newcastle Diocesan Association now also has one member fewer. In the second sentence, there are 188 representative members, 146 of whom were members of the previous council. And when we calculated this after the latest changes were notified to us, we think that's 77.66%. <laughs> and there are 42 new members, of whom six have been members in the past. In the second paragraph, 43 representative members of the previous council are not returning, and Alan Roberts of the Worcestershire and Districts Association, his name should be added to the list of those who'd been members for 14 years, for more than 15 years. Alan had been a member since 1987. With these changes, I formally propose adoption of the annual report. Thank you. Christopher Omani and Zeb, I second the adoption of the report. Are there any questions? Michael. Michael Church, Winston and Portsmouth Diocese and Guild. I think that, uh, forgive my friend on my right, please. Um, I think as his convention, it would be appropriate if we noted after the name of Tony Smith in the appendix for the membership of the council, the fact that Tony was a past president of the council and the period during which he served. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any other points? The proposal to adopt the report has been proposed and seconded. Are you all in favour? Thank you very much. Anyone against? Thank you. Um, I'll now ask our treasurer to uh, bring up to date with accounts. Mr. President, uh, I'm pleased to present the 2016 accounts. The independent examiners have issued an unqualified report, I'm pleased to say. I have little to add to my report and accounts. However, I would briefly follow the report as follows. As emailed previously to all members, unfortunately there was a minor error came to light with some of the comparative figures, those are the 2015 figures, in the printed copy of the Statement of Financial Activities these do not affect the current year in any way. I'm not proposing to go through the whole list as it was emailed round to everybody. My apologies for this. Net movement on funds for 2016 was a deficit of £21,134 following the payment of grants of £20,700 from the Bell Restoration Funds. Interest receivable, surprise, surprise, is down on the previous year, and this is expected to fall again in the current year as interest rates for savers have fallen once more. Council meeting expenses were up by £418 compared to 2015. Crag expenditure for 2016 was 1,052, and expenditure budgeted for 2017 is just over £2,000. Total funds raised towards Christchurch, including gift aid of 15,494, of which 10,000 has been paid. There is therefore a balance remaining at the moment of 5,494 pounds. Khalifi project funds raised to date are 4,930, of which 2,476 has been paid to leave a balance there 
of £2,454. I wish to thank my fellow officers and other members for their help during my time in office and wish my successor all the best. Subject to any questions, I wish to propose the adoption of the 2016 accounts and if somebody would be willing to second that, I would be grateful. We have a second. Thank you, Fred. Fred Bowen, Essex Association. Have you any questions for the Treasurer? Proposed and seconded. Are you all in favour of the adoption of the accounts? Thank you very much. We now come to the important uh, part of uh, electing officers for the forthcoming <laughs> session. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure to say that Christopher O'Mahony, sitting to my right, uh, representative, uh, has been proposed and seconded. And there being no other contestants, I declare you duly elected, Christopher. Do the proposer wish to say anything before? Uh... I think it's important that he should. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, no, they aren't. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Um, a hard act to follow, and I'm very humbled uh, but privileged to. Uh, to share this journey with you over the next three years. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, now, the next uh, post, we actually have a contest for, which is, which is quite heartening. Uh, normally, we have trouble getting people to volunteer. Um, we have two nominations for vice president, and I'll ask for uh, their proposers to speak in a minute. Uh, the first one is uh, Peter Wilkinson, not the Wilkinson from Kent, the Peter Wilkinson from Cheshire, who is uh, um, chair of the Bell uh, Restoration Committee. And I'll ask Stefan if you would wish to say something. Good morning. My name is Stefan Jentek. I'm a co-representative of the Chester Diocesan Guild. I'm here to propose Peter Wilkinson from Chester Diocesan Guild as the candidate for vice president to help those members, oh, and to inform those members about Peter to help make the decision. I'll say a few words about his background. Peter was born and bred in Cheshire, Weaverham, and became interested in ringing during school time. He became a student in York in physics and was a steeplekeeper at York Minster and master of the York College's Guild in the mid-70s. I noticed Peter take a few steps this morning on the way into the building. I thought it was probably nervousness, but apparently he was kissing the statue of Maxwell, I think. He was, after returning to Cheshire, after a student he became a member of a local branch, got involved in various roles, chairman, secretary, ringing master, deputy ringing master, and um, eventually moved on to guild committee responsibilities in the late 90s. He has a breadth of experience in various, or in, in many roles in uh, ringing organizations. He was master of the Chester Darson Guild for four years, 1999 to 2003 and has been a Bell Restoration Officer for our Guild since about 20, 2005. He's been a member of the Central Council since 1999, has attended all meetings, um, I believe, and has been involved in Bell Restoration Committee since 2008. He joined the Admin Committee as an elected member in 2011, and then when became Chairman of the Bell Restoration Committee, in 2014, he became a member as, as the chairman. In his activities on Bell Restoration, both for the Guild, which I know much more than that for the Central Council, he's very proactive in getting things done. He's concerned to make sure that the 
activities of the, Cent of the Bell Restoration are known to all ringers and to all of those involved in the upkeep of towers. So he has quite an in interesting engagement. He's re recently rejuvenated the idea of seminars and workshops on Bell Restoration and has I think the Bell Restoration is now sponsoring the um, calendar for next year to get the message out to the various people about the opportunities for Bell Restoration. He's keen to work with other committees and networks frequently in order to um, engage the right people to help push forward um, the restoration and also the spreading out of new towers. In the Guild, he's been involved in bringing on youngsters through various projects. Um, he was involved in the show, is involved in the Cheshire show where we introduce ringing to many young people as they visit the agricultural show. He was very supportive and helpful in the initial team that we put into the young ringers um, striking competition, the Cheshire Cats. And it's, it's good to see that two of the ringers he mentored have now gone on from being members of the Cats to very industrial, industrious ringers in the world of bell ringing. Peter has good leadership and decision-making qualities. He's, he's a member of the local parish council and the town council and deanery synod. And uh, I've, I've actually looked through one or two of the minutes from those meetings and he seems to be able to arrive at fair and impartial decisions when there are quite diverse points of view being expressed. So, one last thing to say about Peter is, having been a teacher for 35 years or thereabouts in physics, he's now the, the, man, the go to man for potholes in West Cheshire. <laughs> so, if you want to know about potholes, talk to Peter. If you want to know that Peter can fill potholes and ensure smooth ride for those concerned, he's the man to go to. So with that, I commend Peter to you as your next Vice President. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does the seconder, David Jones, wish to say anything? David. David Jones, Chester Diocesan Guild. Um, Stefan was very thorough, so I don't really have much to add other than saying I would like to second the nomination. Thank you. The second nomination is uh, for David Kokodi of the Sussex Association, and I'll ask the proposer, Tim Hind, to come forward. Sound check. <laughs> All receiving. Mr. President, I'm Tim Hine of the North Staffs Association, uh, and I'm here to propose David Cacaldi. I want to say that David has shown through his experience that he is a leader, a teacher, and that he carries things through and he believes in collaboration. David learnt to ring in Sussex and was a district ringing master at the age of 16. He's always been very involved in his association. He's been district secretary more than once, secretary of the Sussex Bell Restoration Fund and also master. He's tower captain at Stenning where over five years he's trained a new band virtually from scratch. He's very keen to encourage ringers to progress. That's not just ringers from his own tower. He's been a tutor and worked on a wide range of ringing courses. He's also arranged and led belfry maintenance courses regularly in Sussex. He's researched and written a history of the Sussex County Association, which was published in 2012. David joined the council in 2007, was elected to Towers and Belfries Committee, and is currently chair. 
and in 2014 he was elected to the admin committee. David is a trained teacher but joined the police in 78 and he's retired after 30 years. He's able to devote time to the role of vice president and he's happy to work very hard on behalf of the ringing community. David thinks this is especially important at a time of change. There's much work done. We need to ensure ringing has a healthy future. David thinks that these are exciting but challenging times with pressure within the council and from outside. If elected, he's keen to work in collaboration with other parties outside the council for grassroots riggers, and he wants to deliver for them. David's own association has been changing itself. He recognises we must reach out to all ringers. Ringing is evolving in many ways. Everyone has a set amount of time they can commit and it's important to have realistic expectations of people. And finally, I'd say David has enjoyed ringing and he's keen that others have a similar experience. So in closing, I'd say he is a leader, a teacher, and he carries things through. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Uh, does David Grimwood as seconder wish to add anything? David Grimwood from the Kent County Association. I'm really delighted to second this proposal. I've known David quite a while and always struck by his passion for ringing and uh, commitment to other ringers and all that he does all the time has that in mind. So I'm very, very pleased to be able to second this. Thank you, David. Now I'd remind members that this election is by ballot. You should all have ballot papers. If anyone hasn't got one, uh, perhaps the uh, a few people. Yes, certainly. Yes, uh, I, I, that is very remiss of me. Uh, obviously, the new members may not know the faces. So, could we have uh, Peter Wilkinson and David Kakodi up the front here, ready for the tomatoes? In the blue corner, Peter Wilkinson from, from Cheshire. <laughs> and in, in, the, in the slightly risque pink corner, <laughs> David Kokodi from Sussex. Yeah, it's those. Um, ballot, if anyone stand. hasn't got a ballot paper, do ask one of the uh, Scottish Association stewards. Uh, fill it in and pass it to the tellers. John Barnes, you wish to say something? No, oh, you've got a ballot paper, right? Okay, if you fill them in and pass them in. A secret ballot to prevent mafia style recriminations afterwards. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, the tellers will take these away and count. In the meantime, we'll, we'll uh, move on. The uh, subsequent uh, posts. Wait for them to be collected. Yes, yeah, all right. And remind them to connect out. Mm. Don't forget the top table. <laughs> Most important. Yeah, let me pass them through. Yeah. yeah. Do you get double points for both? <laughs> I can destroy these guys. <coughs> Is that the idea? <laughs>
Right, all papers been collected. Okay, we'll we'll move on then. Um, now that little bit of excitement is over. Uh, the subsequent four posts have all only had one nomination each. I'll read them out. Uh, for Secretary, Mary Bone, proposed by Derek Sibson and seconded by Stephen Nash. Our Assistant Secretary, Carol Franklin, proposed by Alan Regan and seconded by David Kokodi. Our Treasurer, a uh, new Treasurer, Andrew Smith. Would Andrew Smith like to stand up, please? Where is he? Andrew Smith, that's it, uh, to take over from the other Andrew. Uh, it's not compulsory to have the same name, but it helps confusion in bed. Um, <laughs> proposed, by <laughs> Maureen, <laughs> proposed by Maureen Frost and seconded by Tom Garrett. Uh, public Sorry Relations Officer uh, Caroline Stockman takes over from Kate Flavel. Caroline, would you like to stand up, please? Caroline, over the back there. Proposed by Nick Elks and seconded by Kate Flavel. As they are all only the only nominations, I have great pleasure in declaring them all duly elected to their respective posts and thank them for coming forward. Um, now we have to the two people who are returning. <laughs> and we have to say special thanks to the two retiring officers, Andrew the Treasurer here, and Kate Flavel, wherever she is. Kate, our retiring Public Relations Officer. Christopher. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to pay a special tribute to both of these people for their efforts on behalf of Council and on behalf of all ringers. Um, certainly, as, uh, well, dare I say, like a, an excellent Public Relations Officer, um, Kate is nothing like the Alistair Campbell that we know from the Director of SPIN. Um, but has worked tirelessly to raise the profile of ringing in the public, in the public domain, uh, and also uh, within the ringing community itself. Uh, Andrew also, uh, again, working very quietly in the background to uh, balance the books in some fairly difficult financial times in terms of uh, investment strategy, uh, but making sure that we have a, uh, a viable organisation now and into the future as well. And I have, on behalf of the officers, I've got a couple of little gifts if you'd like to come forward. A leather bound copy of the Craig Report. <laughs> to uh, elect independent examiners uh, for the accounts. Uh, Jeremy Cheeseman and Wendy Godden uh, are both uh, uh, in rotation retire. Both are eligible and willing for election. Uh, are there any proposals for independent examiners, please? Yes. Wendy Godden be re elected. Would you? Sorry, Ian Self, Truro Diocesan Guild. I propose Wendy Godden be re elected. Second from Lynn Hughes. Uh, Robert Wood, University of Bristol Society. I'm pleased to propose Jeremy Cheeseman. Thank you. And second. Are there any other proposals for the independent examiners? We have proposers and seconders for Jeremy Cheeseman and Wendy Godden. Can we get them to stand up, please? I'll, I'll leave you to judge which is which. It's Wendy and Jeremy. Uh, if there are no other nominations, I declare them 
elected as independent examiners and thank them for their past work. <laughs> now we have uh, the election of additional members. Um, Alan Baldock, Peter Trotman, and David Willis retire. Um, David Willis has now become a representative member. Um, and the following uh, recommendation nominations have been received. Uh, Alan Baldock, proposed by David Kokodi and seconded by Graham Hills. Tim Barnes, proposed by David Richards and seconded by Bruce Butler. And Peter Trotman, proposed by Kate Flavel and seconded by Doug Davis. You will find uh, supporting uh, uh, evidence in page 415 of your supplement. Uh, so we don't require anything else from the proposers, but if anyone else wishes to speak, do so now or forever hold your peace. Supporting speakers. Yeah. Okay, no, no comments? Um, the election is by paper ballot. Um, and uh, for each nominee, uh, they require to have a majority of those present and voting. So, yes. Uh, the actual ballot paper is blank, so you have to add in uh, one, two, or three names uh, as uh, uh, you are inclined to support their nominations. You should all have blank ballot papers to put names on. Can't control where people sit. refer them to the uh adding the bits. Sorry? Adding the and adding the more extra bits. That's right. Where is that which page does it appear? It's the it's not the beginning. No, that's my that's my yeah, Sorry, can we give the... All right. Uh, Scottish stewards, are there any windows that can be opened? Right. It's no good trying to commit suicide from the lower windows. Okay, if all the papers have been, been collected, I'll just say uh, a few words. Um, the next item is change ringing for the future, which of course is one of the main uh, reasons for all our deliberations at any time. Um, there was a short piece which uh, you will find on page 433 of the supplement, and I would like to just add one or two little comments to, uh, to that uh, report which I I put in. Um, uh, first of all, there is, there, there is reference to um, 
reducing the groupings of, of committees and uh, uh, there were some groupings looked at which brought it down to about three groups. That's something for the future. Um, York, you probably all want to know what's happening about York. Despite repeated requests, uh, some within the last 10 days, both written and emailed to the Dean personally and uh, henchmen, uh, there has been no announcement about either appointment of ringers or head ringers or resumption of ringing on a regular basis. Um, it's very sad. Uh, we uh, have kept in contact. We've tried to uh, push things along, but obviously York is playing it very close to their heart. Um, on safeguarding, I had a meeting earlier this month with uh, Right Reverend Peter Hancock, who is Bishop of Bath and Wells, and he, he's the lead bishop on safeguarding for the Church of England. And uh, topics included inconsistency of application between dioceses and parishes, and the need for a fair system of risk assessment and appeal process, which of course is very pertinent to uh, uh, the York situation and I shall be giving an update uh, in the ringing world very shortly. In terms of external contacts, uh, I had a meeting uh, with Sir Tony Baldry, who you've now had to address you as Chief Executive of the Church Buildings Council. And um, uh, so I think we've made a very good uh, contact there for future work. And also pleased to uh, announce that Agreement's been reached with the National Trust headquarters for um, bell ringing demonstrations in churches on or near National Trust premises. Uh, I have written out to respective societies about this, and as soon as all those, resp those responses are in, um, we should be making arrangements with the National Trust regional uh, offices. Continue to uh, keep contact with the Founders Company, who, as you know, have been uh, great benefactors of us in the past. Uh, just to let you know that um, there were uh, inquiries about uh, UNESCO and bell ringing, and uh, UNESCO and government were both approached regarding having ringing designated as an intangible cultural heritage and despite much exchanges between the two bodies. Uh, UNESCO cannot proceed uh, with having us uh, designated as such because the UK government is not a signatory to the Convention on Intangible Cultural Heritage, despite the fact that 163 other countries are. Say no more. Um, in terms of outreach to ringers, uh, we've had two series of seminars, uh, one uh, with uh, ringers uh, in, in general being invited, and a more recent series uh, specifically aimed at uh, affiliated society officers. And the feedback and experience from these uh, will be used in the future, and it's the intention, apart from anything else, to uh, issue a good practice um, guide taking from the good work that local societies are doing. In secure, regarding security of central council records, um, the changing ways in which peel ringing is recorded, uh, the, uh, you may have read about the change with uh, Peels UK and Bellboard and Ringing World, and that's been the subject of deliberation between the Ringing World and ourselves, and uh, with a view to achieving both continuity and consistency of records. The invaluable data produced by the Dove Stewards, and we shall refer to that later under the Dove Stewards report, is being transferred to a secure server uh, based on the latest suite of IT systems and programs. So that's ensuring security for the future. And, um, as part of the overhaul, I hope I'm not preempting anything else, as part of the overhaul of, of IT and website, uh, the potential for direct contact and membership has been explored 
and possible options were presented for feedback at recent local seminars. In short, the Central Council officers have continued to seek to improve and advance the interests of ringing, notwithstanding any review which is in process. Thank you. Robert. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Ro Robert Perry, Truro Guild. Uh, can you clarify your comment about the National Trust? Uh, I only asked the question because in Cornwall we have a parish church, an open parish church, on a uh, National Trust site at Land Hydrock House yes, in Bodmin. Uh, I've not had any contact about it, that's all. Right. Um, I, I have written to the, the Truro Guild, so um, you, should, you should have seen something on that. Another question, yes? Uh, um, Lovell Wood from Salisbury Guild. Um, on the uh, uh, National Trust front, I'll just fill you in on the Sturton has just been rehung, and we will be using them as we do every year, so you can be assured we've been doing it well ahead of the system. On another point on DBS, uh, we in the Guild have several um, vulnerable adults who ring, but the, the DBS organisation will not accept vulnerable adults as being a, a ringer. And when I put vulnerable adults on the forms, because I'm the DBS officer for the Guild, uh, they are, will not accept it until I remove it. Right. Um, the, the, the question of vulnerable adults, uh, I have in fact just had in this last week some communication from uh, uh, church headquarters in Westminster uh, with a, with a new definition of vulnerable adults as they see it. And I will uh, be putting something in, in my article about that. But if you want to speak about that separately, and uh, that's by Anthony, I'll do so. Um, Stefan? Yeah. Uh, Stefan Jantek, Chester Tarsus and Guild. Chris, you mentioned the issues at York. What actions are being taken or considered to prevent and mitigate further occurrences? In terms of, I, I think York is a, is a unique situation um, which is very much down to the local church management. What I would say, and it's something which uh, I think I said in, in one of my uh, recent uh, missives, is that it's most important that all ringers everywhere ensure they have a good relationship with their respective incumbents. Uh, if, if you don't see your incumbent, if you're not part of the church community, uh, it's important that you made, make Ringer's activities known and also ensure that, in particular in regard to safeguarding, that uh, we meet requirements and are not seen to be resistant to it. Uh, I, 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 without going into what is still really um, I should say sensitive uh, background uh, I, I, although the York situation is unique the, it has created both amongst church um, officials and indeed in the public arena and the media uh, a suspicion that ringers may be somewhat of a uh, tainted group and that's something we've got to work very hard at to make sure that our image uh, is restored and that York is seen as a, 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 a one-off. So that's uh, what I can say at the moment. Um, just in terms of the, um, the National Trust thing, because there are one or two places where, for instance, Croom, Dabito and Worcestershire, where they do have regular ringing on, on, the, on the estate, but uh, the initiative they're looking at is to actually make it an advertised event as you, uh, those of you who are National Trust members uh, National Trust regional magazines have their list of summer events and we want to get bell ringing as one of those public things all good publicity Any? yes John
following upon uh, John Harrison of the Diocese and Guild, uh, following your comment about ringing becoming a tainted brand, that clearly is an issue. Uh, but from my experience, uh, of concern to another well-known body should be the fact that the church is becoming a tainted brand from York. Um, you know, it's, it's not both sides that are oh, suffering, no, no, no. and I think that needs to be. We need to bear that in mind. It's not just those who are suffering. I would say, John, and, and to the rest of you, that in relation to York, um, as I did, I said in, in a recent letter to the Ringing World, that contact was made not only with York but with the the two archbishops and the lead bishop on safeguarding. Uh, with our concerns as to how things were being treated at York. Ian Oram. Yes. yes. Ian, Ian Oram. Uh, Ian Oram, Society of Royal Cumberland News. Uh, Mr. President, before we leave this uh, subject of safeguarding, I think uh, the, the Council owes a tremendous debt of gratitude to, to you for all your work in uh, talking to all the various authorities in trying to create a nice, smooth, uh, transition from one lot of uh, guidance to another. Your work is very much appreciated, Mr. President. Thank you. Ian. Okay. Kate and then Sue. Hey, Kate first. Then. Oh, sorry. Cape Flavel, Surrey Association. Um, I just wanted to say that the, the publicity around York um, has, has had a, a very positive impact in some regards as well, which we don't want to overlook. I know in my own church, um, our church wardens came rushing up to me as we came down from ringing one Sunday morning to say how much they loved us and they didn't want to sack us at all. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, there are stories all over Facebook and everywhere else um, from other cathedrals ringers and, and, and country parish church ringers talking about um, their congregations and their clergy, reassuring them of their love and support, um, which is, is really nice to have that kind of reaction. So let's not forget that as well. Thank you for that comment. Sue? Sue Marsden, Ely Diocese and Association. Going back to this tangible heritage business, is there any chance of putting any pressure on the government to sign this declaration? if we all wrote to our MPs, if it is going to be of benefit we to could, ringing. We could indeed, yes. Yeah, why not? Thank you. Any other points? No? Thank you very much. Yes. Right. Um, we, we, have a, uh, we have a result um, for the election of Vice President. In favour of David Kokodi, 99 votes. In favour of Peter Wilkinson, 66 votes. Spoilt papers, two. And using the incorrect ballot paper, three. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this is the intelligentsia of the exercise. <laughs> um, so the number of tax countable votes was 167. And I'm pleased to... Uh, announced that David Kokodi is duly elected as our new Vice President. <laughs> David? I'd like to thank Peter uh, and his uh, proposer and seconder for uh, uh, putting himself forward. We know that Peter does a tremendous amount uh, for the council and I hope he won't be daunted uh, and that he'll continue to give support to all the officers. But thank you very much, Peter. Um, we had uh, three nominations for uh, additional members. Uh, the voting, which I'll give you in a second, all fulfills the uh, requirement for uh, majority. 
and the three are all duly elected. Alan Baldock, 146 votes, Tim Barnes, 145 votes, and Peter Trotman, 144 votes. Uh, there were spoilt, seven spoilt papers. <laughs> so uh, Alan, Tim, and Peter are all duly elected as additional members, and um, uh, thank you for standing and for both past and future work. Okay, um, now we come to uh, some of the more serious work of the day. Um, coming on to formal motions, I would uh, again repeat the request to members to be uh, courteous to each other during debate and remind you to be as brief as possible. Um, in anticipation that there may be quite a lot of you wishing to speak, uh, we, we will, I think, put a guillotine of three minutes per person. Um, and also, if possible, not to repeat points that have already made. So if some, one person has made a, a point which is 90% the same as you were going to say, uh, you may uh, decide to uh, sit down. Um, <laughs> and be prepared for uh, me to uh, cut you off in short sentence if uh, you're being a little bit too verbose. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, I'll just explain one thing. Um, according to the rules, mo motions uh, need to be put forward by two members of the council. Um, Philip Barnes and Patrick were only formally became council meeting uh, members uh, at the start of this meeting. So consequently, the, um, the proposals are slightly, uh, slightly different. <coughs> okay. Now, the um, motion A uh, from the Council Action Review, Review Group. The summary report uh, you will find in your supplement, pages 425 to 428. There's also been extensive uh, availability of the full report, 87 pages, which I hope you've all read intensely, uh, supplemented by uh, subsequently a further 28 pages of frequently uh, asked questions and answers uh, given on behalf of the review group. There is only one, I, uh, in, in my position as chairman, I'm going to let you have your, your, your say. There is only one thing that I would point out. Um, there was an inference in one of the uh, FAQs that the publication of the report 28 days before was to meet the requirements of the council. The deadline for putting forward motions does not preclude publication of report at an earlier date. I just wanted to make that clear. Okay. Um, right. Phil Barnes, would you like to wish to say something? Philip Barnes, Kent County Association. Um, to the gentleman upstairs, computer two. Okay. What we'd like to do, Philip Barnes, Kent County Association, um, recent and previous member. Um, I think most of the people outside will think of me as a lifer, although I've had two periods of parole during my, uh, my sentence. Um, what we'd like to do is to break this into three parts. So firstly, we are proposing, and I am moving, 
that the Council received the report. Ideally, discussion about that should be around factual background, around any points regarding the principles of change. And then when we come to the, the proposals, that is motions B and C, to then talk about the specific changes that are being suggested. Uh, and, and I think, Chris, that that was the way in which you'd seen this going as well. So I, I hope that that is undoubtedly common ground. What I'd like to do for those of you who were not at the open meeting yesterday or didn't see whatever was visible online, um, just to just briefly say three things. We were both honored and humbled to have been chosen for this task because there is no one on CRAG who is not a supporter of the Central Council. Let me be quite clear about that. We do, however, believe that ringing has changed in the last 126 years and that it is important that for the future of ringing, of which we talk a lot, we need to think differently we need to probably organize ourselves differently. We also followed on from the principles that John Harrison and Ruth Marshall um, brought forward last year that are in decision K, again looking to the future. And from that background, we set out from the very beginning to ask as many people as possible for their feedback and using all um, routes open to us other than sending a blanket mail to the entire population of England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, Canada, etc., etc. Um, I don't think we could have done any more. We've used all electronic means. We've used the good offices of the ringing world for whom I'm particularly grateful, not only for their support, but particularly for their forbearance in, in publishing our various bits of information. People spoke. We heard a lot back. This is what people said was good about the council. It is a single point of representation, particularly in England, where the established church is perhaps a little easier to talk to. People really value the good records and the historical archive, and particularly and I'd like to pay my own tribute to Tony Smith in this, the methods archive and the method collections. Absolutely crucial, so that my grants are triples is the same grants are triples that I will ring if I go to Vancouver. The strong volunteer ethos, the fact that indirectly it allowed the ART to form, and the links with the ringing world and with Dove. So, a lot of people said a lot of positive things. However, there were negatives. The commonest piece of feedback was how poorly the council communicates with the ringing community. Now, this is not usually about people. Please do not think this is about people. This is about systems. Because if it takes five emails or five forwarded emails to communicate with the grassroots ringer, it's a bad system. You're going to get failures. But the end result is the council is seen to communicate poorly. It's also felt that it doesn't properly promote ringing to the public. Most ringers feel it's irrelevant. You can read it all there. It is uncomfortable reading for anyone in this room. It is particularly uncomfortable reading for someone like me who, since 1992, has been on and off the Central Council. However, it is what people are saying, and we need to listen to that. We analysed all of this, and the desired characteristics for a central ringing body are that it be more nimble and more rapidly responsive, more proactive, more strategic, more efficient and more effective, open, engaging better, and more focused on its accountabilities to ringers who we are here to represent. Interestingly, if you look at the characteristics of what a, the charity commissioners would expect of this charity, it's pretty much the same. 
We feel that it therefore needs to be smaller, that our officers need to be truly empowered. They are the trustees of this charity, and as such, they need to be empowered to act as the trustees of this charity. We should open up our work to all, our activities to all, and some form of membership to all. Because if people have even a 5P stake in the council, they will have more of an interest in what is going on. We feel that the council needs to deliberately work with others to do what ringers need, not to try doing everything itself, and to be very open to what others are doing. But we really need clear governance and accountability so that when we meet as a council of representatives, as we've described it, we are in a position to track what people have said they're going to do and actually hold them to account for doing so. It's not a scary thing, but it is an important thing. So those are the characteristics that we are trying to achieve with our proposals. And with that, I will rest and just ask John Harrison to formally second this, part, this motion. John Harrison, Oxford Diocese and Guild. Before I formally second the motion, I'd like to acknowledge the extent of the work that the Craig team's done on our behalf. The quality of the research and the insightfulness of the conclusions reflect an enormous amount of effort and commitment for which I'm sure you would all like me to thank them. The need for council to reform itself has been clear for decades and I have seen more than one president come into office with reform in mind and leave three years later with those hopes of reform largely unfulfilled. Last year we stopped waiting for evolution and by an overwhelming majority we made a bold declaration of what we thought the modern council's roles and responsibilities should be in decision K and we agreed to commission a review of how the council would need to change for it to live up to that declaration. Now we have the result. The report endorses the ringing community's need for a central body like the Council, and it gives a comprehensive summary of its perceived strengths and weaknesses, together with a plan of how it should change to serve the needs of ringing better in the future. So on, uh, on your behalf, I'd like to thank the Crag team for all their hard work, for doing what they, we asked them to do, and for doing it within the very tight timescale that we set. I'm therefore happy to second the motion and also, for those of you interested in those things, to remind you that between 50 and 60 people are watching this debate online. Thank you, Philip and John. Now, this particular motion, A, is purely about receiving the report. It's not about any of the detail of implementation or adoption of uh, recommendations which are the subject of uh, motions B and C. Does anyone wish to speak regarding the adoption of the, uh, uh, the uh, receipt of the report? Yes. Andrew Johnson, Winchester and Portsmouth, Darston and Guild. Are all the members of the CRAG committee actually named in the report, just for future reference? Uh, they were published in the Ringing World, I believe, Phil. They were. Um, it would provide us with the opportunity for... We, we have nine members here in total, um, some of whom are in the public gallery because they're not members of council. Um, would you like to stand so that you can um, hopefully be thanked rather than... Um, <laughs> Hillary. So, going around the room, if I may, we have David Smith, who is President of ANZAB and a council member, we have Clyde Whitaker from Hampstead, member from the Middlesex County Association, Duncan Walker from uh, Cumbria, um, Pat Walker, who will be seconding uh, Wheeler. Oh, Wheeler. <laughs> Sorry, I'll get into real trouble for that. Um, who is um, University of Bristol rep. 
upstairs we've got from left to right we have Roger Booth who will, many of you will know was for many years a member of council, Alison Everett who is from Sussex and in terms of grassroots ringing I hope she won't mind me saying that she rang her first court appeal during the um, period that Craig was underway called by another member of Craig, Simon Meyer, who may be watching online if he's not out ringing appeal, a past member of the council and a past master of the colleges. And last but not least, Tony Furnival, who until 0929 this morning was a <laughs> NAG representative on the council and rings at Trinity, New York. Um, those, are, those are the members. The other person who I've not mentioned so far who has been a real rock in terms of common sense and keeping everyone grounded is Peter Bennett, again for many years a Central Council member, um, but who really felt that the journey up from Newport to Edinburgh was a little bit too much. Thank you for that clarification, Phil. Uh, another one, Robert Perry. Uh, uh, Robert Perry, Truro Guild. Uh, can I just uh, obtain clarification? Can I just obtain clarification? Um, does the Crag team feel that all the all the uh, uh, principles or need to, proposals need to be adopted? What would happen if um, I don't know seven of the proposals were adopted and two were not? Because for my own sake, um, I'm very happy with many of the proposals, but I do have misgivings about at least one of them. I think they, they come in two groups. The first group do fit together very much as a set of, if you like, contingent proposals. There are issues of detail around some of them, but the most important thing, and we'll say this repeatedly, many of the proposals, we believe, can be implemented in a shadow form. That is to say, the council will continue to function precisely as it normally does for the next year with the officers who are the trustees so the, 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 the five principal officers if I can describe them like that being the leaders of the implementation team so they would garner around them uh, a, a small group of others in the same way as Craig was pulled together to help put things forward. The point at which this becomes very real is the meeting next year when the appropriate rule changes properly crafted and I'll come to rules when we go through the proposals um, will, will need to be put together so it's almost that we get a you can think of it in a number of ways a year's trial to see how it's going before finally deciding alternatively it's and the way that I tend to prefer to see it is that it will assist in a, a smooth transition. Um, the second motion, or motion C, will actually have things that are the other main proposals. They are not so interdependent as, as motion Bs. Does that hopefully help? Uh, thank you for that, Phil. I think we're, we're, in, we're in danger of straying into uh, debate on the details of the two subsequent motions. Um, what we'd, we're asking now is uh, about receipt of the report um, and acknowledgement of all the work which the Craig team have done. Ernie. Ernie Dilley, Runciman, Lancashire Association. Two questions. Um, first of all, you've introduced the current Craig team. Could you just go through who else was initially on the team and why they gave up being on the team? And the other question is about the, your surveys. To quote from the proposal last year, the group will carry out a review of parties, including Ringers at Large via a survey, representatives of churches and other Tower Bell or owning organisations, Ringing Societies and the Charity Commission. Could you tell us about your survey of Ringing Societies 
um, bell tower or, or, or owning organisations and the charity commission. Okay, well, the, I'll, I'll start at the end. The charity commission were were contacted by one of our members who. Um, and they had no view. They, they don't engage in a sort of preemptive debate about if we do this, what about that. You go to them with a firm proposal and then they say you need to tweak this or tweak that. In terms of bell owning organizations, bell owning bodies, um, I have to say that we used the same technique as to reach out to ringers in general. Um, I think it's fair to say that we didn't write to Morpeth Town Council, Merton College, Oxford, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And likewise, you have to remember that in our distribution of requests for feedback, for submissions, those were routed through the Central Council's communication routes via all societies. So, you know, they, they received the same request as, as everyone else. It has been one of our frustrations, is getting out to all societies, and I think it's done more than anything else to certainly convince me, and I think some other members of the group, that our current communication lines simply don't work. Not for want of effort, but they just don't work. Any other points? Oh, yes. Ah, initial membership, pardon me. So we had one member um, who, who didn't make it to the first meeting. Um, that was at the time when um, Ruth was in charge as um, delegated from the officers for pulling the group together. Um, what I heard was that he felt that he could do more in his local guild or association rather than um, be part of CRAG. That was Robert Wellen. Um, second, we had Andrew Howard, who is a ringer at Wivelliscombe near Taunton. Um, Andrew got frustrated with us. He got frustrated at the amount of time we were spending um, pulling the report together, and he was absolutely convinced, um, which I share to some extent, that nothing can be done in ringing without an absolute focus on making ringing a properly funded activity. Um, that is to say that ringers need to be willing to pay the same kind of amount as you would for many other hobbies, be it joining the British Cycling or so on. Um, Stefan Zencheck will speak for himself perhaps, but um, had a, a change in his personal circumstances that meant he wasn't able to um, spend the amount of time. Our other member was a brand new um, learner ringer who'd been ringing, I think, about eight weeks by the time um, she was persuaded to join up. And she came along to the first few meetings, but then rather disappeared and, and became uncontactable. I even deputed Ruth to um, ask as well, and, and we, we've heard nothing back other than the fact that a spy has told me that she is still ringing, which is the good news, because she's under 30, as far as I can tell. Are there any other questions? Yes, uh, Tina. Tina Steckland, Scottish Association. Oops, sorry. I would like to put the motion so we can move the debate forward, please. Thank you. Uh, Jane. I would like to speak, if I may, please, Mr Chairman. Or it's a procedural motion. It's been proposed that the motion be put, Jane. Yes. So uh, I, I, I must ask the members to show by hand uh, their willingness to receive the report of the no, crack no, no, review. No, no, you've asked Just, if they want yes. the motion to be put. Do you want the motion to be put? That's the proposal? Yes. Seconded by Kate Flavel. Okay. In that case, we have a proposal and second that the uh, report of the Crag Review team be received by the Council. Uh, we have a vote on whether the motion is Are you... Okay. Are you happy that... Uh, are you in favour that the motion to receive the report be taken? Overwhelmingly, yes. Thank you. Right. I'll then ask the motion again. The motion is that we receive the report 
by the council. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you very much, Phil. Uh, are you all in favour of receiving the report? Any against? No. Thank you very much. Now, the next. Sorry, we have an abstention there. Are there any abstentions? Any abstentions? One. One over there. Yeah. Fred. Fred. Too. Fred. Fred. And uh, Roland Backhurst. No others. Two abstentions. Thank you. Right. We now come on to the uh, more contentious items, the proposals B and C. Um, you will have seen a note which was sent round to all uh, members setting out the uh, principles and limitations which uh, uh, we uh, have to grapple with today. Um, I think the, the, the Craig group accept that uh, any formal changes uh, in terms of changes to rules and composition of the council and officers uh, cannot take place until we've had uh, the proper procedure under the rules uh, which would involve the detailed proposal being in, uh, incorporated into rule changes and put to the full council next year. I don't think there's any dispute over that. Um, what you have got to discuss uh, today, this morning, um, is the content of the two proposals B and C, uh, whether um, you wish to adopt the contents, whether you wish to amend the contents, and no doubt there will be some, no doubt, sorry? Struggling to hear. Right, no doubt there will be many uh, people uh, wishing to speak. Um, Phil, can I ask you uh, if you want to say some more about Motion B, please? Yes, please. <coughs> could I have um, Computer 2 again? We've read a lot recently about um, what the Council can and can't do. These proposals arise from a vision for the future, a journey, if you like. And I don't know how many people are watching us online now, but people will be watching their Twitter feeds and so on. We, we are under some scrutiny, all of us, whether you're a cragget or an anti cragget Notwithstanding that, it is important that as we take a step into the future, we take a bold step. It's not a step into the unknown or a step up a cliff. It's a step in a certain direction. As I said earlier, in 12 months' time, you get to decide whether the autopilot is set for that different destination. But if we don't set off on the journey, we won't do so. Those of you who were at the open meeting yesterday will know that I said that 99 years ago, at the council meeting in 1918, when the First World War was still raging, the secretary of the council, the Reverend C.D.P. Davis, initiated a discussion on the council, whether it was efficient, whether it was effective, how it related to ordinary ringers. As far as I can tell from the meeting reports, it was adjourned about four times because they went on. I think it was all the same day. I and mean, they, they must have had a need for quite a number of cups of tea. Um, but nevertheless, a lot of people then said the council was too big. At that time, it was 112 members. I th still think the full size of the council now is well over 200. So we've managed to double in size from a council that 100, sorry, 99 years ago was deemed to be too big. 
they asked about having elected chairman for committees because they thought that would be the best way of getting the right people to do the job. Still, we do not actually elect or appoint the chairman of our committees. We, appoint, well, we used to elect members to our committees. We no longer do that because it has become an administrative overhead. The time is ripe for change. It is, you know, the need for change in the council is beyond urgent and the time for change is now. So our conundrum has been how to make this happen in a timely way, but at the same time to ensure that there are no hiatuses, no, no crevices for the council and for ringing to drop into. And that is why we have proposed things this way. Take a step forward still maintain the current group doing things the way that they're doing them at the moment, but with a definite view that by this time next year, we will be agreeing to properly step into the future. Okay. We believe that there are, our proposals can be divided into a number. There are things that are actually perfectly possible under the current rules. The rules are interesting when you read them in depth. They actually don't tell us a great deal about what the council should do or how it should do it. They don't actually even mention the trustees, although it is implicit in Rule 16 that the trustees of the council are those five officers. So, if nothing else, the rules are in need of a radical reform. Um, they would not be adopted as Charity Commission compliant rules now. There are other things that the officers, as the trustees of a registered charity, have huge discretion to do. Um, if the meeting tells them to do it, asks them to do it, unless it would be financially imprudent, we have every right to expect the officers to follow our request. One of the things that they can't do is change the rules themselves. Let's be quite clear about that. So that the yellow dots, there are some things that absolutely require rule changes, but there are many that if we're being pragmatic, we will set up in shadow form ready for next year. In other words, the magenta dots. And then there are some gray areas. Not many grey areas. So proposal A. It was noted last year, I think by Caroline Stockman, that the council, it's not quite clear what the council is doing, what it's here for. It hasn't got a plan. The only plan it has, it appears, is to maintain the steady administration as happened last year. So, we can't change the charitable objects other than through a rule change, and that is entirely right. So, to incorporate the, measure, the, the, the vision, i.e., what we want ringing to look like in the future, that's all it means. What we're we aiming for, what does good look like? The mission, which is, what is this council going to do? to help create that good future for ringing and activity statements, in other words, specifically, what are the different areas of the council going to do? So that needs a change in the rules. However, in the interim, it is good practice for any organization to have a plan. Because if you've got a plan, when we come back next year, you, the representatives, can ask the officers, committee chairs, work group leaders, I hope, what have you done? You said last year there was that. The plan said we need to do this. That is just good practice. It doesn't require a rule change. In proposal B, the rules don't actually say who manages the Central Council. 
It says how you elect people. They go on at length about how many representatives an association is needed, you know, for, for their uh, number of members. They don't actually say how the councils run. So what we are suggesting here is that the, the trustees, the officers, are allowed to manage its affairs, and in the future, subject to a rule change, there will be an elected additional group of people who we have called an executive. You can call it what you want, but we call this an executive for clarity. In the meantime, there's a lot of work to be done. I don't want these guys falling over, so we recommend that in shadow form for that first year, they garner a people of a group around them that they appoint, they recruit, pull together to do the huge amount of work that we need them to do for one year. After that, so they'll be acting like the executive, except they will not have the trustees' powers. They remain with the officers, just like now. Okay? We think that that should happen sooner rather than later. We think that no later than November 2017 is reasonable. Last year, you voted to set up CRAG. We had our first meeting face-to-face -face on the 15th of August. We had our first teleconference in July. It is possible to get on and do things. And it is possible to get volunteers to do things because we got volunteers to do CRAG. Okay? So, as we then continue on, we're simply saying what the executive should be accountable for. And I hope that there's nothing there that is controversial. Set a direction. Show some leadership. There's one of our local ringers in Kent who, um, in her response in her submission, she used a particularly, I think, pithy phrase, which I will try to find. I can't find it immediately, but it went along the lines of, after a long discussion, she said, enough ranting from me, full stop. I want the Central Council to succeed and be the leader of ringing. Flickering candle won't do. A grassroots ring, a very competent grassroots ring, I have to say. But nevertheless, she thinks that we're a bit of a flickering candle. Now, there is some controversy, I know, around our next proposal. So let me explain why that is there, and it's twofold, about the Administrative Committee. It is our view that once you have a fully constructed executive, the role of the administrative committee is really no longer there. Just to remind you what the terms of reference say, organize the annual meeting, coordinate the activities of the committees, and to undertake or deal with urgent matters that occur in between council meetings. But of course, the admin committee meets every six months. So, it's, it's not necessarily able to deal with things that would be perhaps urgent in a, in a 21st century sense. What we propose is not changing those terms of reference in year one. But I would say, and this is no disrespect at all to the members of the committee, because there has been change in the membership of that committee over many years, that if we were today to ask the admin committee to deal with this report, the words long and grass immediately come to mind. Smothered and dead are the next ones that come to mind. So we feel very strongly that this, a new approach is needed for new ideas. Terms of office, three years renewable, no more than once. We already have three-year terms of office for our, our two principal officers. Why do we think that there should be limits to terms of office? Number one, for fresh blood, fresh ideas. And number two, 
because you need to succession plan. There are certain tasks that if they're left to one person, a single stray bullet, or more likely getting hit by an Edinburgh tram, <laughs> will cause a pretty unavoidable loss of service. We need succession planning. There is no doubt that to change the trustees of the CRO, that's a rule change. So what you're doing is a vote in principle for next year. You get to vote on it properly next year, but it's a vote in principle that we want to actually set up a group who can get stuff done for us, for ringers, for ringing. We think that there should be some flexibility so that you know, ringing doesn't necessarily have every skill that's necessary. Sometimes you need to get additional skills in from outside, and we feel that the, the trustees should be, or the executive should be able to draw in other people, up to a maximum of two, who might bring special skills. That's common in charity constitutions. We'd had feedback that um, notwithstanding the contested election today, some people are put off by the idea of a, a six-year sentence as vice president and president, um, and that having the implicit assumption that one leads to the other um, might be helped by a name change. And it is absolutely no personal disrespect to Carol that as we move forward in terms of an executive group, we feel that once that's embedded, the role of Honorary Assistant Secretary needs to be reviewed because things will clearly be done in a different way. And it's mindful that the Council sometimes is a lot better at setting things up than taking them away. So that's Proposal B. That's, the, if you like, the chunkiest one of all. What about the work groups? It's not just a fancy change of name. The difference between a current committee and a new work group will not merely be size or merger. It will actually be that we would hope that the new work groups followed the strategic plan so that what the Towers and Belfries Committee was focusing on was very much about what, in a discussion with the executive, seemed to be the most pressing things in ringing. That's not to say that they wouldn't be able to innovate and do their own thing. That's entirely right. But what we do want is our committees to work together, not pulling in opposite directions. That sometimes happens. And that they are coordinated to a common goal. Having work groups with an elected or an appointed um, leader actually allows them to garner the people around them who will do the work properly. And they won't be clones, because you won't be a successful work group leader if you only have people that are just like you. You need a variety of skills. You need a variety of approaches. And I have to say that one of the successes of CRAG has been that there has not been a great deal of groupthink. Um, there have been some pretty challenging um, debates and differences of opinion as we came to our final conclusions. Um, most of these can occur in shadow form. To enshrine them in the rules will need a rule change. I have to say, and you know, I, I'm not planning on offering myself to be the rules meister who helps the um, officers bring forward the next set of rules, I have to say that we would be better off having a set of rules that said the council will recruit such work groups as it requires from time to time according to the following principles, rather than having the name of 17 committees in the rules. Last year, we didn't get a ringing trends committee, but it still has to be a committee because it's in the rules. There has not been a rule change this year, I don't think, to remove the ringing trends committee. So unless something dramatic happens, we'll have a ghost committee again because of the way our rules are put together. 
So what about the Council of Representatives? We think that a separation of powers is important. You can't hold yourself to account. What do I mean? I'll give you an analogy from one of my recent jobs. We set up a, a new um, merged hospital organization in Sussex. And when we did so, our new chief operating officer had a big round table meeting for our performance meetings. And all that would happen is, not literally, but figuratively, the spotlight would move around the room from department to department. And they were all there trying to hold one another to account. But of course, none of them did, because they didn't want to be picking on someone else when five minutes' time they could be picked on themselves. It's human nature. They didn't fail to do it, they just didn't do it. So actually having a group whose job is to scrutinize and make sure things are going in the right direction, who are separate from the doers, is very important. That is what the Council of Representatives we see would be doing. Agreeing the rules, agreeing the Constitution, scrutinizing, agreeing or not, the annual report and accounts electing the members of the executive. That is what we mean by a separation of powers. So the executive would be accountable to the Council of Representatives. We do think that as this um, is set up, that it will need looking at, is the Council of Representatives going to be too big and how might it be made smaller? Almost inevitably, it will be too big, because having a group of nearly 200 people acting in a scrutineer's role just doesn't work. It doesn't work in organizations. But nevertheless, there will be a lot of real power to guide and direct the organization from the Council of Representatives, and that is as it should be. But not to fiddle around themselves with the intricacies of method extension. I give one example merely because I think it may chime with you know, some members here. It's important to allow the experts to bring stuff forward and if they go wrong it will soon be apparent. This proposal is actually to continue the work that Christopher has already started, starting to direct direct links between the council and individual members. And to build on that and to have a real relationship with individual ringers. That may flourish, may be really good. It may wither, we don't know. I don't have a crystal ball any more than anyone else. But if we're going to get good communications and a better reputation, we have to reach out. Okay? That's going to require a lot of discussion with the affiliated societies on a one-to-one -one basis. There are some that will embrace it. There are some that will be highly suspicious of it, I'm sure. And, like any good organization, we also propose that over an occasional basis, and we've said every three years, that the governance arrangements need to be reviewed. Do they still work? How can they be made better? And the final one for this is that to pull this all into place, we would like a small group pulled together. We think that you should ask that a group be brought together specifically to produce a new set of rules. In fact, even if everything else gets thrown out, which I really hope it doesn't, for the future of ringing, the rules need a radical overhaul. They do, you know, uh, we, we spoke yesterday about detonate and renovate. Um, I'm afraid the current rules probably do need detonation and rebuilding a really nice, new, up-to-date version that the charity commissioners will love. Um, and procedures that will help us to be a more nimble organization. I'm going to rest there.
Pat is going to say a few words, hopefully, hopefully a lot fewer words than me, but... Um, OK, uh, I'm Pat Wheeler, uh, and I'm here as a representative of the University of Bristol Society, for, as of 9.30 this morning, or whenever it was. But I'm new to the council. I came on to Crag as somebody who'd never been on the Central Council, who'd always viewed it from outside. Yes, I'm aware of what happens here a little bit, um, but certainly as somebody who was looking from outside. Um, it's been great being on Crag. It's been great thinking about the future of ringing. It's been good about thinking about how to get a dynamic organisation, um, how to encourage fun things to happen, how to um, enthuse people, how to create a dynamic organisation that people want to volunteer and want to be involved in. And I think one of the key things we're trying to do, do here is to say, look, there's 35,000 ringers out there who... A lot of people have ideas, a lot of people have skills, a lot of people would like to be involved. And how do we draw on that 35,000 rather than just 200 or so people we do at the moment? So, and there's a lot of great things going on. You see a lot of things around the room which show you that there's innovation, there's change, there's different ways of teaching, there's different ways of promoting ringing. We'll all remember the barge going down the uh, River Thames in 2012 great way of demonstrating what bell ringing was uh, and you know, getting a little bit of TV coverage and so on there. So there's lots of good things happening in ringing and the central organisation of ringing should be at the heart of that. It should be motivating. Not necessarily doing it all, but certainly motivating it, getting people involved and making it exciting. The other thing I'd like to say is there's nothing really new about what we're proposing. Lots of organisations, from governments to universities that I work in, to no doubt the health service, um, and lots of charities, all work in the same way, of having a representative body that holds the directors to account, an executive which is in there to make decisions, and there to protect the volunteers, the people doing the work. Um, the people doing the work have good direction, they know what they're aiming towards, they know what their mission is, they know what goals they're trying to achieve, and that helps to motivate everyone. So based on that, I've found working with CRAG to be a fantastic uh, opportunity. We haven't always agreed with each other, certainly not. Um, I'm expecting that we've practiced many of the arguments that we, we may be having in the next few minutes. But what we've come up with, we, we believe, is workable. We believe it's workable because we've looked at lots of other organisations. I mean, I myself work in a university. I also belong to a classic car club, which went through exactly the same process uh, a, a few years ago. And we see these things working. We see these things motivating people. And you know, that change, that enabling people to to become involved and to feel responsible for what they're doing is something that's important. So based on that, I would like to second the proposals. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Philip. Now, there is a lot of uh, detail which you, you, you've all read the Craig report. Our job today is to look to what we think uh, collectively uh, is the right way to advance the interests of ringing and ringers as a whole. We are really here in an enabling capacity and that's really how we should be looking at it. It would be possible to have a long, long debate. No doubt there are very many diverse views about the individual uh, elements of, of content of, of both proposals B and subsequently proposal C. Uh, but I think I in reality, and this is uh, just uh, my little bit of guidance, is that since we are not voting on something which uh, is actually a change of rule today or a change of organisation today, we are really looking at principles and what principles we wish to enable. 
Now, obviously, you will all have varying views on what's before you, and so obviously it's your right to make your views known. So, have we any comments? Sorry, yes. Chris Turner, Lincoln Guild. I and my fellow colleagues broadly accept uh, these proposals. We think they are wonderful. We should be taking them forward. But we do have a concern about the makeup of the executive. Uh, the Crag proposals talk about an executive of eight. But in fact, what is written down here at the beginning of, propo of uh, proposal B is an executive of possibly only four because it says it's made up of four central council officers and no more than four other elected members. Zero would categorize as no more than four. I'm unhappy with that. So all I want to propose as an amendment is the elimination of the words no more than which appears twice in the first paragraph of Proposal B. Is there a second for that? Is there a second for that? Yes. Yes, I'd second it, please. Chris Sharp, Lincoln Guild. Chairman, if, if I may shorten things a little, um, I've just had a a quick chat with Pat. Uh, it was certainly never our intention to create a, a four-person oligarchy and um, the principles of size are important but eight would fit absolutely in the correct um, size and would be entirely in keeping with most charities. So we're happy to incorporate that amendment into you our would, proposal. You'd be happy to amend your motion Indeed. in that respect. Motion, it's not amending the motion. No, amending, amending the proposal. It's amending the wording of, the, amending the wording. The wording of their proposal. Yeah. So the first paragraph then of proposal B will the council will transfer management of its affairs, including the development and delivery of strategy, to an executive of eight people, including president, deputy president, secretary, and treasurer, and four other elected members. So, no, no more than. Yeah, no longer more than. <laughs> Mr. President, Fred Bowen, Essex Association. Um, the we seem to have now have a contradiction because proposal B requires that the extra four people be elected, that it be done no later than November this year, and we have no mechanism for electing those four people. So um, we ha now have a contradiction. Thank you. Uh, Robert Wood. R Thank you, Mr. President. Robert Wood, University of Bristol Society. Um, this, I think, is an incredibly important piece of business, and I'm certainly the most important since I've been on council. And my congratulations to the CRAG team. I think they've done a fantastic job, and I welcome the report. I think there are three things I need in order to vote on this. One is the information. We have a lot of information in the report, but there's still more to come, I think. And I think the officers and the CRAG team need to work together to achieve that. We need consultation, and I don't think we've had enough. It's been too short, and it's been what I would call passive. The information has gone on the website and in the ringing world and on a few Facebook groups. We need an active, well-designed, driven, managed consultation exercise, which involves, I think, all of us. We have to get off our backsides and go out and engage with the members and actually explain what the proposals are, draw out the, those um, responses and feed those back into the process. And finally, we need the several hours of debate that you referred to, Mr. President. It isn't sufficient. We have a full agenda today. We cannot spend two to three hours debating this subject, and that's what it needs. So. As far as I'm concerned, we, we need to address this. 
you won't be surprised, Mr. President, that I too have a, an amendment to propose. It doesn't kick it into the long grass. It doesn't stop us making the decisions that need to be made next year. But I think it, it will require more consultation. It will enable the CRAG team and the officers to work together. And it won't prevent the shadowing that uh, Mr. Barnes has referred to. So I'd like to propose that the council empowers the officers to take forward the proposals A to F of the Council Review Action Group report during 2017-18 through consultation with affiliated societies and develop any necessary detail and motions for rule changes in readiness for voting at the May 2018 Council meeting. And that, I think, will provide us with the flexibility to enable this to move forward effectively. Mary, what's the oh. Mary, what's the I have written it down for you, Mr. Uh, President. Well. Is there a second for this amendment? Linda. Thank you, Linda Garton, Bedfordshire Association. I'd like to second this proposal using some of Phil's um, terminology. I am very much a cragette. I am very much in favor of this um, change, the changes that are proposed. But I'm also conscious that there are people in sitting here today who do have reservations about lack of consultation. I think that this proposal does enable, it empowers the officers to move forward, possibly the, um, to get over the, the hiccups, if you like, or the, the um, slight problems, one of which, like for example, Fred has raised. It gives us more flexibility, it, it asks for discussion, but it doesn't slow down the process at all, which I'm very much in favor of. Thank you, Linda. Uh, you, did, anyone else? Um, if I may, by way of clarification, Christopher Omani and Zeb. <clears throat> uh, one of uh, those most famous ringing poets, Tennyson, tells us to, that we should ring out the old and ring in the new. We aren't strangers to change in ringing. We are change ringers, and we can be change agents today. Um, let's be brave enough to change ringing. That being said, and this is in support of the amendment, um, unlike Brexit, where there's been plenty of press saying, crikey, be careful of what you ask for, where there wasn't a lot of clarity in what the offering was it, ahead of us at that referendum. Unlike Brexit, we've had a lot of paper, a lot of explanation, uh, an 87-page full report, uh, a growing set of FAQs, lots of correspondence through all sorts of media channels. I think we've been quite well informed, which is a good thing. Um, as I've mentioned yesterday and in other fora, uh, it, it is always a concern to me the ringers don't respond to things well, so we know we've had a less than 10% response across the whole fraternity. Um, how do we interpret that over 90% of apathy is a challenge for all of us. Um, but we have a task here. Um, I also want to make it clear why we're doing this, why we're considering change, and we mustn't forget the big issues, the big trends that we need to confront and address whether that's recruitment, retention, leadership, sound financial footing, participation, you know the mantra. Um, what's been put to us by Robert and Linda uh, points out that the published motion, the wording of that published motion, um, doesn't quite match uh, this concept that we're voting in principle. And I think the amendment clarifies that. Thank you. Yes, Veronica. Veronica Downing, Suffolk Guild. I received an email last week uh, from our chair of the Guild Management Committee, and he wanted 
on behalf of the Guild Management Com Committee to provide Suffolk support for the CRAG uh, proposals. In principle, some of the issues that you've talked about uh, are areas that do need a bit more thought and the amendments and so on do need um, a consideration as well. But you were concerned about the lack of feedback and I'd like to say that the Suffolk Guild as a whole generally supports Craig. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on the proposed amendment? Anthony, another word? Yes. Uh, Anthony Lovellwood, uh, Salisbury Guild. Um, we, the Guild as a body had a chance to talk about this at the AGM two weeks ago, which is the first time as any branch or anybody within the Guild had a chance, being only a fortnight earlier, that it was published. I know there was stuff in the ringing world for weeks and things beforehand, but the majority of people don't take the ringing world and therefore won't have read it. The consensus out of the AGM was that more time was needed in order, following on the amendment, more time was needed for consultation and for us to get round the branches, talk to them all about today's meeting and everything that's in the report and feed it back to the uh, chairman, the president. Um, that could be done if particularly if five or ten questions, specific questions, were there to, uh, to for the branches to answer. Um, but with us attending, that is guild officers. So Thank you, I support the amendment. Uh, Doug Davis. Doug Davis, Kent County Association. Um, everybody's saying we haven't had enough time to consult discuss um, and all of that. Craig has been trying to communicate and consult with ringers, grassroots ringers, since they formed last year and they've managed to reach 2,000 odd. You know, what do we think they're going to be able to achieve or we're going to be able to achieve to improve that? You know, these 90% of people that didn't respond, to be honest, probably don't care what's going on here. Otherwise, they might have responded. What is another year of discussion and consultation going to do? Let's just get on with it, please. Yes, Charles. I'll try not to drop everything as I stand up. Um, <coughs> Charles, not the Lancashire Association. I think this is an extremely good amendment. We've all, I think many of us have had a lot of concern. In the first place, within the last month, we have been presented with a report. The full report runs to 19 pages. In the last month, Craig very helpfully, and I mean that sincerely, have given us some frequently asked questions. When I last counted, there were 60 frequently asked questions, and we received those this last Monday. I'm afraid a week for the final thoughts of Craig is not time enough to have consulted, even if we all work as well as Doug and the Kent Association. Uh, yes. Vivian? Barbara Wheeler, oh, yeah. Durham and Newcastle. Craig have done exactly what we asked them to do last year. And now we're trying to do what we always do and say, let's put it off for another year before we do anything. Peter? Uh, right, so Peter Nibbler, Winchester and Portsmouth Guild. Um, we've just been discussing this um, amended and um, proposed amendment to the motion, uh, but I may not be the only one who didn't quite catch all the words of it. So. Uh, my first question was, can we have a clarification as to what, and it would be nice if we could have it up on the board as well, can we just clarify what the wording of the motion was? Uh, whilst we're doing that, I would uh, say that I think it is very important that we don't uh, accept motions that put things off for another year. That would be a very foolish thing to do. Um, the idea of running two things in parallel that Phil proposed is clearly a good one. Um, there are, however, some implementation issues that I would 
like Fred mentioned, exactly what would happen at the next meeting. There are a few details there that I think are a bit tricky in the way the things are worded at the moment. So what I'd be looking for is the way that we can progress with the um, parallel system that Phil outlined without getting tied into procedural issues uh, and allowing a bit more feedback. Because I think people feel happier when they see something actually happening uh, that they'll understand what it is that we're now talking about. So if the motion would let us do that, that would be good. We're just getting Thank the you. motion up onto the screens. Um, they're tapping away even as we speak. Uh, Paul, I'm going to limit the, limit the comments in a minute. Paul, Marshall. Uh, Paul Marshall, Worcestershire and Districts. Um, I find it difficult to understand how the two organisations can run in parallel when um, Proposal A says the Council will by the end of May eight, uh, 2018, okay that's uh, next year, but um, certainly in Proposal B the Council will transfer management and so on. There's, there's these, all these wills uh, as part of the proposal and I can't find how the proposal says, su suggests that the two organisations can run in parallel when the uh, management of the uh, organisation will be transferred by a certain date. Thank you. Before, I'm not going to, I'm going to cut the comments there. Before we put the amendment to the motion, uh, Phil, do you wish to respond at all? Uh, I don't want to respond to the last one because it isn't actually strictly about the amendment. No. Um, so it would, be, it would be wrong to do so, but I, I will try to hold it and, and when we come back to the substantive motion. Um, since the typing hasn't happened yet, the, the amendment is that the Council empowers the officers to take forward proposals A to F of the Council Review and Action Group during 2017-18 through consultation with affiliated societies, bringing any necessary detail and rule changes to the council meeting of May 2018. I'm torn on this one because that's essentially what we're doing. Um, this is basically what we are suggesting should happen. My concern, and the reason why we're not willing to uh, take that, is that this could quite easily delay things by 12 months, even if it's not the intention of the proposer and seconder of the amendment. I feel, I don't know if any of the rest of you do, people's eyes burning into my back saying, just do something. I'll just ask Robert Wood as a proposer of the amendment whether he wishes to add anything. Nothing really to add, Mr. President. Uh, sorry, Robert Wood, uh, University of Bristol Society. I would just reiterate, this does not slow it down. This is nowhere near the um, long grass. This is keeping to the same timetable as the original proposal. Um, it simply introduces more flexibility and I think allows for more and better consultation. Somebody said about, yes, they consulted 2,000 people, but that was on in, as part of their process of developing the proposals. It's not on the proposals. And the proposals themselves have not been adequately consulted. Um, and, and I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm in favor of these proposals. I'm a supporter of the CRAG proposals and, and the CRAG process. But I think we need to make sure that we do it correctly. This doesn't slow it down, nowhere near the long grass, and it, it doesn't stop the shadowing. It, it really does keep the thing going, but introduces the flexibility and scope for more consultation. That's all. Linda, do you wish to add anything? Thank you. Just to add to what I said earlier, I am very much a cragette. I think the reason that I was prepared to second this proposal is because I am aware of people who are hesitant 
on the basis of consultation. I don't want this, the other one, <laughs> to fail. So this is just amending it slightly to ensure that it, that action is taken and that we do go forward and that those who are doubting on the basis of consultation, it's just um, right. giving that option, basically. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Now, I'm going to ask to um, put the amendment to the, to the uh, proposal B to the floor. Um, not the word in there. The wording's on the screen. So can't read that. <laughs> so this is uh, a new motion B. So it's an amended motion B, not what's published. So this is, uh, anyway, here we go. That the council empowers the officers to take forward proposals A to F of the council review action group report during 2017-18 through consultation with affiliated societies and develop any necessary detail and motions for rule changes in readiness for voting at the May 2018 Council meeting. That's the amendment proposed by Robert Wood and seconded by Linda Garton. So can we... John Harrison, Oxford Diocese and Guild, you cannot put an amended motion. First, you have to vote on whether the motion should be amended. Vote on the amendment. Can I have a show of hands? Those in favour of the amendment to motion B. Keep your hands up. A recount there. <laughs> Right, hands down. Now, those who are against the amendment to the motion.
Okay. The, uh, the amendment is lost. There being 61 votes in favour and 95 against. So, uh, <laughs> so we are back to the substantive motion of uh, motion B. Are there any comments or questions on the substantive motion? Jane Wilkinson. Past president being prejudiced against, I think, because I've been jumping up and down like nobody's business. Can't hear you. Well, you will be able to now. That better? Wilkinson, honorary member, or whatever sort of member we are nowadays. I would love to have Dr. Barnes as my doctor. I am so absolutely convinced that even if he was going to cut my foot off, I know it's not his department, that he would be doing it kindly and nicely and convincing me that it was absolutely perfect. The Crag Group has done an awful lot of good work. I was hoping to get the chance to suggest that because it has been put in to do a radical, indeed, you could say iconoclastic job about it, and it, that is what we asked it to do, and it has done it, and it has done it superbly. But there are other views, which we've heard a bit before now. I would like to suggest, and I'm not putting it as an amendment, but I happily would, that we take proposals A to F individually, rather than as one bulk, bulk, bulk motion because quite a lot of us would be happy to support some of them, but not quite so happy to support all of them. And I think the maximum support that we get for the proposals, the more convincing it will be. I'm a little uneasy that it all says will, because that, in my book, is the beginning of a train running, and I think may would have been a better word. But I would hope very much, and I will put it as an amendment if you prefer me to, that we might take the proposals individually. It shouldn't take very long, given the feeling of the meeting. Any other comments? Robert Brown, Devon Association. Um, again, thanks to Craig for all the hard work and everything they've done. Um, I read the document several times, and uh, you know, like a lot of people, have got um, views that uh, may necessarily not uh, go with all the points. But overall, it set a path in which we need to follow. And for me, it's quite simple. You know, this is a principle. We're voting on a principle. We're not voting on anything else. Let them get on with the work. The devil's in the detail. The detail needs to be worked out. Any other comments? Yes. No. no. I have reason to know that. F <laughs> Sorry, Nigel Orchard, Ringing World. It, it will become clear. I have reason to know that Fred is a stickler for the rules. <laughs> and, and he is right. If we are going to consider this uh, particular proposal to have a, uh, an executive eight, four of whom are elected, I'll just point out that we need a mechanism for doing so. We should not lose sight of that. Pip Penny Land from Mon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'd just like to say that when I put out the, um, for everybody in the Land from Mon to read the Crag report and get back to me, they got back to me with amazing speed, 100% said, go for it all, go for it. Now is the opportunity, the window of opportunity has been opened. If it, this door closes, it'll be another 20 years before we get anything sorted out. I'd like to go back to when I very first came onto the council over 10 years ago, and I was going to go onto the education committee, and I asked this question, and this is the first opportunity we've had to address it, and the question was, how do we communicate with the people from the centre that don't read the ringing world? This provides an opportunity for a direct line from the ringer in the tower to the organisational body, and I simply think we have to go for it. All of it, all together, it comes as a package. Yeah. Uh, one more, uh, Paul, you had your... Yes, sorry. Um, can I um, ask that my earlier question is answered? Thank you. Which is... Uh, I, the, the, the fact that I find it difficult to understand how the two organisations can run in uh, parallel, one as a shadow, uh, when the proposals say that the executive committee will do this and this will happen 
uh, and it doesn't seem to me that there will be a mechanism to uh, not vote for it uh, next year because it said this will be, you know, all this. Phil? Okay. Um, I was merely waiting for any other questions. Language was difficult. In our report itself, um, when we've talked about the things that should happen, um, that is the language you would expect of a group coming to their, um, the people who've commissioned their piece of work, in this case the officers and central council. We would typically say, you should do this, you should do that, you should do the other. When putting a motion forward, the words may, might, and should are wishy-washy um, and properly have no place in my humble opinion and in the opinion of most of my colleagues in a motion. So that's why, and also to answer Jane's point, um, it's also the reason why we used will throughout. It's so that the council has the opportunity to make a definite decision. In terms of running in parallel, de facto they would run in parallel because as I've said earlier, we fully anticipate that the organization will continue to run, but at the same time, the new um, parts of it, ready for next year, will be got up to speed. If this time next year, we decide that actually, no, many of us will be disappointed, but those shadow structures, shadow work groups and leaders, Will, be, will need to be stepped down. And that's inevitable. Um, but if you assume that on, I don't know what the date of the next council meeting is, but on May the 29th, you can have one way of doing things, and the day after, you can have a brand new way of doing things. It, it's not like changing the guards at 10 Downing Street. Um, when you have a change of government, because of course the civil servants are still in place. We're, we're not suggesting that um, this is all done in a sort of dramatic bang. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, Paul. Sorry, uh, um, my response to that would be that uh, take the example of Proposal C, the new executive will by November 2017, realign the current committees into a significantly reduced number of work groups. That is not working in parallel. That is, that is a total change, surely. The, okay, the, the expectation is, if people are going to do this in a, 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 a sensible, forward-looking way, was that the work group, the committees that are likely to form the new work groups and their new members, so people from outside this room who we hope to get involved in the work of the council, would start meeting together to decide how they are going to do it when it goes live at the end of May next year. No, because the committees themselves ceased to exist, according to this, in November 2017. No. Can, can I just clarify, I think, that, 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 the, uh, that the effect of uh, what we decide today is an enabling vote to allow work to continue on uh, the development and structure of a new organisation. There will be no transfer of powers as such until a full and proper vote has been taken in May next year with the appropriate rule changes. You understand that? that that's what we're, we're talking about, an, an enabling decision. I think uh, we, we've had enough comment there. There's obviously a, uh, a, clear, a clear body uh, in, in as much as you've... Uh, uh, turn down the proposed amendment to the motion, I would now like a proposition uh, for the amendment to be put, to, for the full motion to be put. Well, it's been proposed and seconded. Already. We've had it proposed and seconded. We've had the motion 
proposed and seconded. Is it your wish that we now put it to the vote? Yes. Right. Can I have votes then in favour of motion B? No, no, no. Stand down. Can, uh, stand down. So uh, any against? Stubbs, Plum. Count. Yeah. It, hands up, please. Anyway, it's carried by a very clear majority. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you wish to speak now, Phil, to um, motion C? Yeah, hopefully less controversial, I hope. Um, Let me just quickly, very quickly, talk through these. Concept of professional support. We see this in two ways. The first is that, actually, I'm, I'm going to use the trustees again, the officers, actually do have the power already to spend some of the council's cash, subject only to getting past Andrew and Andy in the future, um, to further the council's charitable purposes. That may sometimes require going outside and getting professional help. We have particularly looked at two areas. It is not exclusive, but actually having some real professional communication support, the kind of folk who know which producer to phone up at the BBC, who know exactly who might be able to drop something into local radio, people who may be able to get a bell ringing theme into Emmerdale, something that would start to improve ringing's picture outside so that it becomes a true picture, that ringing is seen to be fun, something that people of all ages can take part in and want to be part of. That is the kind of thing that a little bit of professional comm support might do. And I may be wrong, but I'm not aware of that skill set within certainly my fairly broad circle of acquaintances within ringing. But I do know from my professional experience how valuable those communications experts are in getting the proper view out there. So that's one possibility. ICT we've also mentioned, not because Dave and Doug and Peter Trotman are anything other than superstars, but they are, at least two thirds of them, are superstars with full-time jobs. And sometimes you need a bit of bandwidth to help you do things more straightforwardly and more professionally. So that's what this proposal is about. The second one is slightly different. And the, the members of CRAG who have had much to do with ART and other people who've had a lot to do with the ART say how valuable their part-time administrator is in making the organization hum. Um, they are a far smaller charity than the Central Council in terms of their um, income and expenditure, but they have thought it is a prudent thing to do and to at least scope out and see how the council might have some part-time probably um, professional support so that the officers can get on and do the important strategic and leadership tasks rather than necessarily having to worry too much about authorizing the next email to go out um, through the email list. So these would be prudent. We've called them blue because actually they are within the scope of authority of trustees of any charity. So that is G. H. Um, the feedback we had from members of what might be described, well, is described as the black zone, the advanced ringers, the Bristol Maximus and above, 
those who are, in my opinion, pushing back the uh, boundaries of ringing with innovation, is that the council actually has little to offer them. But sometimes what the council seems to do, seems to do, but it's their perception, is that it is actively antagonistic towards them. It seeks to limit what they can do. And I think that is an unfortunate and unintentional consequence of the paradigm, the mindset that we have with our current decisions. We have tried tinkering with them repeatedly over the entire lifespan that I've been on the council. Indeed, I remember Steve Coleman at my first ever council meeting in 1992 proposing that the um, decisions should be abolished. We disagree, but we do think that a blank sheet of paper is needed and someone who will come at it with a fresh mindset, somebody who is not allied with the pros or the antis, the classifiers or the free-range um, particle brigade. That is what that is about, and I think it would be a powerful statement for the Council to send forward that it intends doing things differently in the future. And then finally, reviewing the name and branding of the Council. Let me be clear where this came from. There are a significant minority of people who responded, but no one responded in the opposite, saying that the name Central Council actually carries some toxic connotations. It's unfortunate. This is not to do with the second part of the title of the Council, which is of Church Bell Ringers. We, I hope, throughout our report, have been quite clear that the link with the church all over, but especially in England, is absolutely crucial. And that what we would hope is that a new body will have a grown-up peer relationship with the church and church authorities. So this is not about changing the name away from of church bell ringers. It's actually about the new executive having the opportunity to ask people what they think about the name, what they think about the way in which the council is seen. Because what we've heard has not been uniformly positive. Second one, just as is planned for Lancaster next year, let's turn this meeting into the centerpiece of an exciting ringing festival that ordinary ringers of all abilities want to be part of. Like, a, like an annual ringing road show. Now I know how tough it is organizing ringing road shows, but if you organize an annual conference, typically they're not so tough to do because you've done it in the recent past. And finally, when the new changes are in place, I think there is a genuine need to see if the triennial nature of the council and its business in terms of everyone closing down um, at 9.29 this morning and being reinvigorated, hopefully like a phoenix from the flames at 9.30, um, is actually still necessary. It's, it's a tidying up proposal. So that's that. And Um, I think Phil's done a very, very good job of uh, describing the, this set of uh, proposals. Um, uh, I would like to second those. Uh, and I think the only thing I would like to add is that this is it, it's responding to the, the feedback that we had, the, the overwhelming feedback we had in certain areas. Uh, and I would like to commend these proposals to you. Thank you. Thank you, Phil and Patrick. Uh, anyone wish to comment or raise questions? Uh, Joy. Uh, sorry. Joy Pluckrose, uh, Coventry Dyson Guild. I'd just like to ask on proposal G whether there is a ceiling to the number of pe professionals that can be um, invited in, as in number or as in a financial limitation on that, or is it just a carte blanche?
so is that the number of individuals who the yeah, but I, you said the number of individuals under G, so that would be the number of people who joined a professional support group. I think that would depend on need. I'm not, I don't think any of us are suggesting that um, tomorrow morning that um, Christopher, Mary and, and, and company should be on the phone to KPMG to to have a, a selection of trainees. On a, all we're saying is that on occasion, and I suspect those will be relatively rare, but on occasion that the council accepts that it will need to spend money to do its work. So there's no limitation, but neither is there an expectation that it will be hundreds of people. And these would be discrete jobs of work. This would not be... Um, an ongoing relationship, in my mind at least. Thank you, Phil. Any other comments? Is it your wish that we put the. Uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Peter Niblett, yeah. Uh, right, Peter Niblett, Winchester and Portsmouth Guild. I'm the chair of the Methods Committee, and also I am Phil's brother in law, I gather. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, vested interest. I gather there's been some speculation on uh, Ringing Chat uh, websites and the like as to whether the two of us will uh, be continually continue to talk to each other afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me assure you we will. Um, but I do have some questions about a proposal H. Um, as Phil says, this is largely uh, sort of driven by the what he calls the black zone and it seems to me somewhat separate from the main uh, set of proposals that you have already agreed, um, which I support. Um, the issue that I really have here is the, to do, well, two parts really. Um, I'll, I'll be talking later in my proposals on um, the evolution versus clean sheet. Um, the uh, view of the Methods Committee is that we do need to pr proceed with the clean sheet approach. Um, my question is then, how do we run it in parallel? Um, we talked a lot about how we're going to have work groups and things running in parallel. Uh, we have assembled a team now in the Methods Committee. Um, so we've got Graham, we've got Tim Barnes, who worked on the original proposals. We've got Mark Davis. So we've got a number of new people brought in. So we effectively already have um, this team working on this. We've got extra people who have volunteered to join. So I'm getting smiles from over there. Um, so the question really is, if we accept my proposal H, can the Methods Committee actually continue to um, work on the new clean sheet proposals that we are keen to do? I, I realize that people will complain that it has taken us a while, but that's partly big, and I'll come on to the reasons for that when I do my proposal. Um, so that was question one. Um, the other part of uh, issue I have really, well, question I have is about the uh, final sentence where it says the maintenance of this framework will be the responsibility of the executive. Um, we need to have some kind of uh, kind of sign off on it um, but one of the things we have been concerned about in the methods committee is how we can make changes to the framework however however you know wide and good it is there's always going to be questions things where it needs to be updated um, so we need a group of people who are able to update this framework um, and it's not clear to me that the executive uh, would be the people who would want to do this. Um, maybe they should have sign off or maybe the core group has sign off of it but we need to have a group who are allowed to uh, develop, continue the ongoing development of this um, and in the proposal after lunch I guess it'll be, um, we have some words on that. So. Um, my question then, well, I don't know what I'm saying here really, but I'm concerned that Proposal H, it, it's a bit like the, the conversation we had before. We're forcing something to run it in parallel um, and we'll end up with two things trying to do the same thing if we're not careful here. Okay. Yes. So, uh, as, as, as Peter will know, um, we would not stop the Methods Committee proceeding with their work. However, we think it would be manifestly 
confusing and unwise to the ringers at large if we had one group doing it at the same time as we get someone different to do it. The reason why um, I would ask you to um, go with the proposal H version is that I think for credibility it needs to be quite a distance from the, the current methods committee. Now that's not because they're bad folk. Certainly aren't bad folk. Um, and we will be talking um, <laughs> later, I hope. Um, but there's a type of thinking that gets you to a particular point. And it's very difficult to change that type of thinking. And I would describe the, the, the type of thinking that has got there so far from a methods committee that has been very cohesive and for all of the criticisms has done a huge amount of good work in the method collections and so on. But nevertheless, the tie down every detail within the decisions approach is the one that has been the favoured approach for at least the last 33 years. Um, and those who read history will, will know that um, H. Law James was also of that view, although sometimes with slightly less intellectual rigour than the current methods committee. But nevertheless, the uber um, tying down every last detail strikes us as having got the council into a bit of a pickle. And we actually think it needs fresh thinking, fresh and independent thinking, which is why I would prefer Proposal H and would suggest that then having the work going on as part of the Methods Committee work at the same time would be confusing, not impossible. Thank you, Phil. And yeah. uh, he also asked about executive sign-off. This actually is the, the, one of the principles of the whole organisation, that there is an executive who are responsible. They will work through the work groups and we would expect that in the vast majority of cases, they would take the work group's advice and then, if you like, front it up, because that's what executives do. Um, certainly what I used to do when I was an executive, I used to front up what other members of staff had asked me to do. Uh, and it's no more and no less than that. That's what that sentence is for. Thank you, Phil. Can I, can I cut you short on the logistics there? Uh, can I ask, is it the wish of you all now that we put the motion to the vote? Yes. Those in favour of motion C? Any against? And motion C is carried. Any abstentions? Yeah, and a few against, but it's carried by majority. I'd carried by a very large majority. It's now, uh, it's now time for lunch. Lunch is being served downstairs. Uh, just to remind you to be back here, 1.45 is the Ringing World AGM. If you have not indicated on your sign-in sheet that you wish to partake in it, you need to initial the right-hand column if you haven't done so already. Also, any new members who have not had their photographs taken, John Harrison uh, will be there willing to uh, photograph you. Thank you. Could I, could I just explain the lunch arrangements with respect? Okay. Wait a minute, Jane. Can I just make a lunch announcement, please, if I could just break in? Uh, everyone is probably want, wanting lunch, and lunch is out and ready for you. There's a large number of people here. Would you like to go down the steps to the Undercroft area where you will receive your lunch, if you've booked a lunch with us? And if you could progress round to, to the... Um, uh, east side of the church 
then you could come back in with the food. That will be a natural flow of people. Um, people with special dietary requirements, would they make themselves known to the servery area and they will be served accordingly? Uh, I'd I'll hand the microphone over. I'm sorry about that. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I would like very Jane, much yes. from the floor of the meeting to say an enormous thank you to the Crag Group. I don't like a lot of what they've done. I like a lot of what they've done. Some of it, I think, is plain daft. They were enthusiastic enough to send someone doorstopping me, doorstepping me in Wester Ross on Friday. But they have done exactly what we asked them to do. They've done it extremely well. And I think we ought, really, before we have our lunch, to say a big thank you to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry about that, but I just had to get the... Uh, the uh, details.
gentlemen, the AGM of the Ringing World is commencing. Um, technical point first, has everyone got a ballot paper because you will be invited to vote for directors? Anyone missing ballot papers? There's some, some missing over there. Mary, have you still got some? Some over there. Free is coming round with some ballot papers. Um, I'd like to take um, receiving the chairman's report, looking forward right at the end. Uh, we are under some time pressure. I'd like to get through all the essential business first, and then you can listen to me rambling about the future of the rigging world, ask questions, and so on. So thank you very much for coming to this meeting and supporting the Ringing World Limited. In terms of attendance at the Central Council meeting, there are 167 present. Uh, five people have declined to sign on to take part in this meeting. Uh, Mary has informed us of 30 apologies for absence. And if anyone wishes to notify us of any more apologies for absence, I'd be grateful if you had a word with Claire after the meeting. So the first thing is to approve the minutes of the 2016 AGM, which you all should have received. Um, any points of accuracy in those minutes? No? Okay. Um, have we a proposal then that they be approved? There, Kate. Thank you very much. So, Kate and Angela proposed and seconded. Thank you very much. Those in favour of approving the minutes? Any against? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Uh, so we now go on to my report for the year ended 31st of December, but first I should just remind you of the names of this illustrious group of directors. On our left we have Linda Garton, we then have Richard Smith, we have Bill Hibbert, Nigel Orchard, the chairman, Richard Wallace, Claire Rulston, our company secretary, David Grimwood, our editor, Robert Lewis, very well known to you, and our assistant editor, as of November, Will Bosworth. So, we have, in fact, uh, commented extensively on our business activities in 2016 in the annual report, and I don't actually want to duplicate this to any extent. But just to summarise, the generosity of our donors in the last two years has enabled us both to increase our reserves and to invest in the business, both in the product quality and in the process. I hope you've been pleased with the content changes and enhancements made possible by the employment of a part-time editorial assistant, and I must acknowledge that Will Bosworth has made contributions to the company well beyond just supporting the editor. Major issues such as York Minster and the proposed Central Council reforms have been covered in a depth which is harder to accomplish in more transitory media, I believe. Replacement of the creaking IT system and improved IT support was essential and has greatly reduced the growing risk to the business. It's been done in such a way as to facilitate remote working. This means that we're no longer restricted to staff and volunteers who can readily get to our offices and might allow us to save money by di dispensing with an office entirely in due course, although that uh, decision hasn't been taken. I'm very pleased that the new software for the compositing has allowed us to move on from the scissors and paste production process that I remember from my days on the school magazine. Unfortunately, a number of technical problems have delayed our realization of the full benefits of the new process. These are being vigorously pursued 
and we hope to resolve them soon, following which further production costs, reduction savings should be realizable. I don't usually pick out individual board members for particular thanks, but Bill has gone way beyond the, uh, the, the call of duty, even moving his office premises to our offices on a Tuesday uh, in, in May, throughout May, to try and solve the many fascinating technical, uh, mechanical and human factors that have been thwarting our uh, maximum efficient use of the new compositing software. Thank you, Bill. Usage of Bellboard continues to soar, word chosen very carefully, year by year, clearly providing a highly valued and increasingly user-friendly service to the exercise. What is less clear to its many users is that it is also streamlining a number of our production and administration processes with cost savings and enhanced quality of service. Manual quart appeal processing has already been greatly reduced and a start has been made on doing the same for peels. This entails our closing down peels.co.uk as we have announced, but we take very seriously the need not to lose important record keeping and analysis functions as we do so. There's been consultation, as mentioned earlier, with council representatives about this, but we will respond to any further concerns that might be raised. Our finance director will now present his report and the accounts. For the second year in a row, after several years of reporting a deficit, I am pleased to be able to say that the company made a surplus again this year. The detailed figures are on the last two pages of the report and are probably the most interesting ones. The net income of £15,635 is a good result and better than the directors expected. I say that because subscription income held up well at around the £183,000 <coughs> level. We are still losing paper subscribers at a steady rate, but online ones replace some of these and, in percentage terms, is a high growth area. The modest increase in subscription rates did not discourage many from renewing and the price is rarely given as a reason for stopping to take the paper. We had budgeted for the ed editorial assistant to start earlier in the year than Will was able to start, but I think his contribution in his first nine months has been worth the wait. Returning to income, donations have held up well, but there has been a slight decline towards the end of 2016. We were able to claim some backdated gift aid going back to the start of Bellboard following the full integration of donations with Bellboard when the required box was ticked. Despite some production issues which we are addressing this year, the diary and the calendar made a significant contribution of £8,703 to the surplus. The plan is also to have a new Christmas card available for those who still send such things. The surplus has only been achieved as the directors continue to keep tight control of costs where they can. That doesn't mean that we do not try to be innovative and attempt new things at times. The printing costs include three 32-page issues and some extra colour pages. In particular, the eight centre spreads on training matters in the autumn. Franking is beyond our control but is steady. The final major spend is on salaries. The team of Robert, Chris, Will, Christine and Jackie all work well together in the office and produce the paper week in, week out and keep the back office administration ticking over. There are also two other items I would like to mention. As Nigel has already highlighted, some computer costs were up this year as we decided to upgrade the IT system in readiness for the future. This involved new equipment and utilising the cloud rather than have servers on site in Andover, so we do not need to be tied to an office base in the medium term. We also now use a more responsive local IT person to deal with issues sooner than was possible with the remote volunteers before. The other is the accountancy fees for the independent examination. First of all, you may have spotted that the, our previous examiner did not sign the independent examination report this year. On the 1st of March, Don Valida transferred his firm to a larger firm, also with offices in Andover. Don and his staff all moved over 
although the offices moved over this weekend. Um, the higher charge is not because of this, though. Last year, more paperwork and regulation at the last minute meant there was a higher fee in the end than the account showed. Because of the consequences of changing things, we decided not to change the accounts, but that means that the 3,300 figure has inflated some extra costs last year, too late to include in those figures. The charge for this year's work was £2,800 in total. The agenda asks you to reappoint the new company, if that isn't an oxymoron, but we will look to hold a beauty parade before next year's AGM and look at alternatives. It's been a long morning and there's still many motions to go through later, so I'll stop there for questions before formally proposing the adoption of the accounts. Right, we'll take any questions you may have about the accounts. Okay, no, clearly no burning issues. So, Richard, would you like to propose the acceptance? Yeah, I propose the acceptance of the accounts. Is that seconded? Yes, and I second the acceptance. And I think we should all say as board members a huge thank you to Richard for all the hard work he does on accounting and budgeting. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, on to the appointment. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, let's vote on that then. Uh, those in favour of adoption of the accounts, please show. Thank you. Any against? Any abstentions? Thanks for the reminder. So those are accepted. Move on to the appointment of directors, where you have David Grimwood standing for the first time. Claire Rulston standing for re-election and Richard Smith standing for re-election. So we have a proposer for David Grimwood. Would anyone like to second that? Thank you very much. You, pardon? you don't think we need one? Well, that's all right. It has been seconded. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Claire has been proposed Someone going to second that, just for completeness. Thank you. And um, Richard Smith has been proposed by David Richards. Have we a seconder for, yeah, okay, over there. Thank you very much. So you have your ballot papers. Uh, you may vote for all three, um, because we have uh, the ability to take all three of them on. So would I now, could I now ask you to vote, please? A, t a tick or a cross will do. Yeah. Nobody's interested in your vote. No, or mine. <laughs> Oi. Thank you. Linda, have you got one as well? Yes, I have. Linda at the end. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. The uh, results of that election will be given later during the Central Council meeting, unless they come before. Uh, we now move to the appointment of an independent uh, examiner where it has been proposed that we reappoint. Have we a formal proposal for that? David Grimwood has proposed. Have we a seconder for the reappointment? Yes, very happy to second that. Yep, okay. well, there's someone at the back there. Okay, um, those in favour of the reappointment, please show. Any against? Any abstainers? Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like, as I said earlier, um, if anyone wants to raise any other business at this point before I st start talking about the uh, future of the ringing world as we see it and greatly look forward to your contributions and observations about what we should be doing and where we should be going. 
But apart from the general subject, the future of the ringing world, does anyone else wish to raise other business? Fred, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Fred Bowen, Essex Association. Would you like to explain to us uh, why the board chose to stop describing our paper as the official journal of the Central Council? Certainly. First of all, I, I think we weren't actually quite sure what it meant and what it obliged us to do. Um, we do feel very strongly that the ringing world has to be independent of the Central Council in order to be able to criticise where necessary and to present a full range of views uh, relating to the Council, uh, which would fit uneasily, I mean, it's not impossible, but it would fit uneasily with actually being their official journal. That said, I think you can judge that we are very interested and supportive of the ringing world. And, sorry, the Central Council. Well, we support the ringing world as well, you know. <laughs> it's one, one of our part-time activities. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, and, and if you uh, think back over editions over the last few months, uh, the Central Council has had no trouble at all in getting the various things that the President has wished to say uh, and other viewpoints from the Central Council fully aired. So it's really more to do with editorial independence. But let us also be absolutely clear that we take our obligation to be the journal of record very seriously indeed. There is a debate at the moment as to how official record keeping for the future should go forward uh, with new technologies and so on. Uh, it must be recognised there is no obligation for people to send their performances in for printing and in fact uh, a fairly high percentage, I have the figure somewhere, um, of performances that are now submitted through Bellboard are also forwarded for printing. But that isn't, uh, it isn't 100%. Uh, and I've heard a lot of observations that, um, well, we don't really care if it's printed in the ringing world so long as it's in Bellboard. So we do take the importance of the historic record very um, much to heart, uh, and therefore we're in uh, communication with the Central Council about how this is taken forward. Um, does that seem a reasonable approach? Anyone else like to comment about that? Kate. Thank you. Kate Flavel, Surrey Association. Not a comment about that, but a kind of related question. I don't know if it's something you're going to cover in the statement you're about to make, but I wonder if you've had a chance to think about how the company structure of the Ringing World Limited might change in the light of potential future changes to the structure of the council itself. Thank you. That's, that, that's very important. We. Uh, we recently had an away day to think about the, the future of the Ringing World Limited, the charity which has the objectives of basically promoting uh, bell ringing. Um, and of course, for a very long time, the way that we have fulfilled that obligation is to publish the Ringing World. But we thought wider than that. We still do think it's very important to publish The Ringing World, but looking at declining subscriptions and so on, we, we need to think wider about how we fulfill the objectives of this charity. Um, and at our away day, we actually had Phil Barnes. He, he was good enough to attend. So we're keeping in close contact with developments. Um, and your point is a good one. We need to consider how we are structured. I will touch a bit more on, on perhaps how the changes to the Central Council will affect the ringing world um, in, in a minute. Anyone else want to raise any other business? Okay, right, we'll move on then.
just starting, starting with moving on from the budget. The budget is predicated on our achieving cost savings in the compositing area. That's the budget for this year, um, which are running late owing to the software problems uh, that I referred to earlier, software and other problems. Likewise, cost savings from streamlining the peel processing are being delayed by limited technical resources for implementation. We continue to look for further cost savings, but further reductions in staff costs are unlikely after the substantial reductions in recent years. We would be relu reluctant to reverse our investment in product quality. Would you like to comment briefly, Richard, about how we see the budget for 2017? Yeah, the, the slide briefly summarises the budget for the current year and what the directors thought would happen this year compared to last year. I am by nature prudent, so will always be a pessimist on income, so you probably won't do as bad as this. We continue to lose subscribers each year, but the modest increase in rates usually makes up that loss, so income is stable. Donations this year included some backdated claims that won't be repeated in future years. And um, the actual uh, figure coming in is slightly down month on month. Advertising continues not to be an easy sell, and we may lose Whitechapel's business now, for example. However, the director's efforts also try to minimise expenditure where it can. After the investment in computer <coughs> infrastructure that cost um, amount this year, this will reduce and has allowed us to continue to invest in the editorial team that will, so that Will can continue to be employed after the initial trial. We have less control over the weekly costs of printing and franking though. There could but also be some surprises, but I am hopeful that the company will achieve a small surplus in the end for 2017. Okay. Um. Our new IT does allow remote working and possibly dispensing with the office, but the directors are not sure that this is appropriate for the highly consultative process of assembling, editing and compositing the contents of the paper, and we're looking further into this. Looking beyond this year to 2018, the highly provisional budget shows a deficit of some £6,000. One step we could take to eliminate this for 2018 and a year or two beyond, other things being equal, would be to reduce the frequency of publication to fortnightly. We have said we would give 12 months notice of any change of this uh, to the publication frequency, and we have the reserves to do this. Um, the board considered this recently, but decided to spend more time on considering the implications, including the effect on our letters pages, which remain lively, though a much slower rate of exchange than social media. Alternatively, we could seek more donations with performances. That was the preferred way forward in the survey and has totally transformed our finances in the last two years. Taking out the effect of a catching up on reclaimed gift aid that flatters the 2016 donations figure, there is an underlying reduction of about 1,000 a year. This is not down to a decline in the overall number of performances, though the number of peels in 2016 was down a bit on 2015, the number of quarters was higher, so the total of performances was up. Interestingly, the percentage of quarter peels, which includes a donation at the suggested 50 pence per ringer, is about 70%, but the percentage for peels is about 25%. I'm not sure why this is. Peel ringers get a better display than quarter ringers, and this costs us more. There was a lot of discussion when we considered charging for printing performances, and we decided to stick after that discussion with asking for donations. Whatever you think about this approach, uh, it emerged from discussion and was the preferred funding approach as indicated in our extensive survey. Could I therefore thank quarter peel ringers for their support and ask peel ringers who do not donate to reconsider? 
a higher percentage of donations might delay us having to take major cost-saving steps, like reducing the publication frequency. On present projections, the circulation of the printed version should not drop below 2000 before about 2022. But we are aware again from uh, our knowledge of subscribers' age profile above uh, from our survey uh, that we really don't know much about above 65 and so we cannot rule out a cliff edge effect at some time. The big growth area, though from a low base, is in online subscriptions, currently at 281. We're now reviewing our pricing structure to ensure that all subscriptions contribute equitably to the fixed costs of the company. This will include reviewing our arrangements for overseas to our subscribers, where we've made some ad hoc arrangements for sharing of the online versions at, at Towers, where they also have a paper subscription. This is in recognition of the high cost of overseas printed subscriptions and to try and increase our low overseas take-up. We did, as you probably know, run a recent marketing exercise. We were so pleased with our May the 12th edition, which had something for everyone, that we made it free online, but uh, after our subscribers had had their copies. We had an extra 1,300 hits on that edition, over and above what we would normally expect in a week out of which I am aware of two new subscriptions being taken out. <laughs> so uh, the marketing of the ringing world is difficult. I have to say that with the current format, i.e. including the performances as well, uh, which I know some people question, but again the survey seemed to back continuing with, um, I believe that Robert and his assistant Will have now achieved a very high level of quality and content and I must thank also those of you who have contributed. We are dependent on our contributors for the material that we get and we've had some damn good stuff recently though I say it myself. Well done Robert, well done Will. A business should invest in its successes, and Bellboard is certainly a runaway success. In a board, all of whose members work hard and generally unacknowledged, it's invidious, as I've said, to pick out individuals, so I generally do not. But I think we'd all agree that Richard Smith deserves our recognition and thanks for his single-handed setting up and development of Bellboard. All its current services are free, and we hope to keep it that way. But we are looking to develop additional services that we can charge for. The problem is that Richard has found it very hard to find suitable people with the highly specialized skills and the time to carry out further developments. The board has therefore agreed that he may look for an IT professional who will do some development work part-time on a paid basis and has indicated a cost range for the first year. That is, this is not in our uh, budget and a sum probably in the range of 10 to 15,000 would be paid from our reserves this year uh, if we are successful in getting someone, but we would hope that it might become self-financing over a period. This would also alleviate the significant risk to the business if Richard became unavailable. We do have some kind volunteers who can and have fixed short-term problems with bellboards that have arisen in Richard's absence. Although we were able to get hold of his services even when he was uh, off in deepest Russia. So uh, he can't get away from us easily. Another uncertainty or opportunity in our future 
is what the council will become. Could the ringing world become a membership benefit? How would any new central organization wish to communicate? Really is too early to say, so we have had discussions with the CRAG chairman and indicated our willingness to bring our communications expertise to whatever organization emerges, but also stated our view that the exercise is not large enough to support competition in periodicals. A lesser consideration is what we should do about the proposed change of the Council's AGM to the autumn. It is mutually beneficial to us and Council members to have our AGMs coincident, but having it so long after the end of our financial year would make the information very dated and your ability, which we value, to influence the current year more limited. Our articles require us to hold an AGM not later than 15 months after the previous one. A move from the end of May into September would be just outside this limit. The board is considering this and will, if the Central Council changes its AGM date, bring proposals to the 2018 AGM. So we'll stay in touch about how developments go there. The board met on the 29th of April this year specifically to think about the future of the company. And as I've mentioned, Phil Barnes came to examine the possible Craig outcomes and for his help in other aspects of our deliberations. Colin Parker, a former board member, also joined us. You won't be surprised to know there were no eureka moments, but a focus on our vision and, action, and uh, mission, a la Craig, our strengths and weaknesses, and our company structure. Clear actions were placed on individual directors with defined timescales to develop ideas in the areas discussed and bring them back to the board. Achievement of this and implementation of agreed plans will depend, as usual, on the availability of volunteers. We are always interested in talking to people with relevant skills who may be able to help us. Now I open the discussion to all of you. Any wish, anyone wish to make suggestions, comments, criticisms over there? Tina Stuckland, Scottish Association. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have a question or a suggestion, but I would like to echo your words, Nigel, and congratulate the editorial team on what has been a, a fantastic year in the ringing world. And for those of you who come up to me and say, oh, what's going on? I don't get the ringing world. What's happening? What's happening? I'm not telling you anymore. Get your own call. <laughs> Anyone else want to comment? I know there's pressure on time. Yeah, there. Uh, Neil Dodge, Suffolk Guild. Uh, this is probably more of a question for Richard. I, I just wondered what sort of features you'd like to see in Bellwall going forward, and particularly, uh, Bellwall is an excellent tool. I've used it right from the start, and it's definitely the, the future of the ringing world and how we record performances. Um, and there are some excellent features, but they're often hidden deep either within the menus or um, not visible at all. For instance, I know you can export um, search results to Excel format, which has been incredibly helpful for me preparing our Guild quarter peer reports, and I think it would help loads of other members, but we, we just need to know about it and, and make it clear, you know, because um, it really is excellent, those sort of things, but a lot of, uh, not many people know about them. Thank you. I think there are perhaps three um, areas that I can immediately think of that I'm, I'm either working on actively or wish to work on in the near future. Um, the first of these is really quite underway, and um, I've never actually met him, but I gather Richard Hobbs is here. He's been, he's been helping me significantly um, with a, um, <coughs> an updated um, user interface, and a new style. Um, hopefully making it easier to find functionality, making it easier to link directly um, to pieces of functionality that are currently, as, as you indicated, quite hidden. Um, so that's one ongoing pro, um, piece of work, um, and I would hope that that can be complete imminently. Um, the second 
area that's going on at the moment um, is, is less advanced is improvements to the analysis we make available. Um, we want to make it, it, we want to make much better forms of statistics, data visualization and so on available. Um, to give an example, it would be nice if you could plot on a map where all of your peels were um, or to get um, better visualization of um, the, 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 year, the number of peels you rung in years as a graph perhaps. Um, a variety of things like this. Um, and some of these may well be part of the, um, the, the paid for service that we're contemplating that uh, Nigel alluded to a few moments ago. Um, and the third area that I would like to see significant improvements to, and we haven't yet started, is the diary. Um, I think the diary is an important part of Bellboard. It, it is a very useful way of finding out um, when your local um, district practices or um, other, other events in the area, and perhaps you're not in the habit of looking at your local association website every day, but perhaps you are in the habit of looking at Bellboard, if not every day, then once or twice a week. Um, it is a useful resource, and it's, been, it's not had the investment it deserves. Um, there, there's a lot I'd like to do to improve that. Um, there, there are other ideas as well, but off the top of my head, those are, those are basically the ideas. I hope this helps, and I hope you'll also feel that as the year goes on, you don't have to wait to come to this meeting, that you can push forward suggestions for development. Andrew Johnson, Winston, Portsmouth, Darson Guild. Could you explain briefly about the, the hard copy diary, how, um, what the relationship between the, the ringing world is and the contributors and how, how that gets assembled and how important that is to you? Sorry, the, the um, annual diary that we issue. Yeah, okay. Um, first of all, I, I, I must apologize for the, the, the quality of the diary this year. Um, it is compiled by former director, now former president of the Central Council, Chris Mew. He does an excellent job. We were direly let down by the printer, a printer who we have relied upon in the past, to rely on for the main publication. Uh, and he was, he, he's a print agent and um, he thought he'd got uh, a reliable printer and it was only when the stuff came back uh, that we started to realize we had problems and we have been doing a certain amount of refunds for people. Um, as a result of that, uh, we, we've had a bit of a rethink on the diary. It does still earn us useful money, so we intend to continue with it so long as there are, you know, um, older gentlemen like myself who prefer a hard copy uh, and, and usually enjoy the lovely, luscious uh, leather one, but this year that was a bit of a disappointment as well. Um, so we, we hope that we, we can prolong the life of that, continue to make a profit. We, we've had a little meeting with Chris Mew, myself and uh, Robert, just to go back to first principles and say, what do you use this for? Um, and it, it's not actually for getting up the tower to call appeal and looking up appeal composition uh, in most cases. It, it might be at the last moment when you meet short you need something. Um, and with Richard's help we've analysed which of the methods that are in the diary are actually rung and I think one of them, Cantua, was it, um, which has been there for some time. That wasn't the worst, but yes. Yeah, um, uh, well, it was really not something that people are going to want to have available in their pockets. Um, so w it, it, it is being revised and we will welcome your comment. I, I feel perhaps I haven't fully answered your question. It, that'll do, will it? Okay, thank you very much. Over there, yep. Thank you, uh, 
Clyde, Clyde Whittaker, Middlesex County Association, London Diocesan Guild. Um, firstly, I'll just follow your example of not picking on individuals, Nigel, by saying that in my view, the whole board deserves our thanks and congratulations. I think you've done a fantastic job, not only in terms of the editorial quality uh, and the improvements you've made this year, but also the, 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 the degree of thought that you've put into your business plan and your business planning, which I think is, um, is, is really excellent. The, the suggestion I or thought I had, it, it just occurs to me that you have as your readership a very valuable cohort of people. And of course, the ringing world is not just read by its subscribers. Copies are left in towers, and the total number of people who read its contents are very much larger than the number of people who subscribe. Um, it, it's therefore got a kind of an age profile um, and a financial profile, that cohort of people that would have some marketing directors, maybe not salivating, but certainly quite interested uh, in the possibilities. And in the work we did on Crag, we did look at um, other organizations, uh, making music, Royal College of Organists, a whole series of them. We didn't look at their journals. Um, you know, our focus was on their organization, the number of people in the executive and so forth. But anecdotally, I understand that quite a few of those journals, in terms of advertising, are looking outwards, oh. not just at adverts from companies inside that particular community, uh, but companies outside that community who see that target audience as being a good opportunity. And I just sort of wondered whether perhaps there is an opportunity to do some work looking at the experience of some of those other societies with their journals to see whether there's anything that could perhaps be learnt there. Might possibly need a slight tweak to editorial policy to make the content um, perhaps a little bit more inclusive. And I know you've been doing that recently with uh, the, the work you've been doing on uh, articles ab about what other non-ringing hobbies ringers have. Yep. Um, so I just wonder whether maybe there's an opportunity there just to, to do a little bit of work and see what other organisations are doing. Okay, thank you very much for that. We'd certainly like to build our advertising revenue. Um, if I remember correctly, it was at the last AGM that someone who I think had a background in the industry stood up and said, in effect, your profile stinks and I wouldn't actually be advising anyone to advertise with a circulation of 2,700, and I forget how she characterized our readership, um, which is probably just as well. Um, it, it does depend on um, volunteers with time and expertise. We have in the past tried to go with what we would regard as linked um, organizations for advertising such as breweries um, <laughs> but um, I don't know whether they take the view that ringers couldn't possibly drink any more of their beer if they advertised <laughs> uh, <coughs> but, but it, it, it is a slow process uh, and it does take time uh, we'll certainly take your points on board Clive I will look to be able to resource this um, it does need a certain sort of personality to be able to take the kickbacks and keep, uh, sorry, not financial kickbacks, but the refusals and so on, um, and, and, and keep persisting. Um, it, it's certainly not my profile, I'm afraid. Any other points anyone would like to raise? Because we do appreciate this opportunity for you to, Paul, down there, to, Give us suggestions. Thank you. Uh, Paul Flavel, Surrey Association. Are there any plans for a, another road show in the future? I think the, the, the short and succinct answer is no. <laughs> well, it uh, takes a lot of organizing and um, I, think, I think we'll say what would would do is bear it in mind. Um, not sure that the uh, what the role of the the ringing world is actually. Are we the Fonzette Origo of all of this stuff, or Jackie Roberts organised the last one, didn't she? She led a committee, and she wasn't actually on our board at the time, was she?
Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kate Flavel, uh, Chairman of the Public Relations Committee. Um, the Central Council and the Public Relations Committee have organised the last few roadshows. Um, people still occasionally misdescribe them as Ringing World Roadshows. The first one or two, I can't remember, were called that. One, was it? Just one. Mm. And then yes, since then, it's it. just been the Ringing Roadshow. Um, the Central Council doesn't currently have any plans to organise another one. Um, but as we will have heard this morning, there, are, there is uh, a move afoot to change the nature of this meeting weekend into... Um, I hope I'm not making hostage to fortune here if I, I use the word mini road show. Um, it, it won't be the same as what we've had before, but it might be something vaguely similar, and I'm sure the ringing world will be invited to make a substantial financial contribution for their, <laughs> <laughs> for, for their enormous stand that they will want at it. Yeah. Kate, I, I am deeply obliged to you. Thank you very much. Before I announce the result of the ballot on the directors, anyone else want to raise anything because we are under some pressure to wind up fairly soon. So you can go back to the real fun. Okay, thank you very much. I am pleased to announce that by large majorities, Claire, Richard and David have all been elected or re-elected um, 157 countable votes uh, were cast and the numbers against were all below five. So I think that's enough detail. Thank you very much then. I declare this meeting concluded. Uh, I'd just like to reiterate the, the thanks of the Council for all the work that the Ring World Board have done. Uh, a, a marvellous year and marvellous result. Uh, now it's tea and cake time, ladies and gentlemen. We'd like you back in here by five to three, please, if possible. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for that. The seems to work this time. Thank you.
plea from the heart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we now go to uh, item uh, D on the agenda, um, which is regarding the rate of subscription for affiliated societies, and I'll ask Andrew, our treasurer, to speak on that. Fine. Thank you, Chris. Um, the subscription is currently £30 per representative member, and it has been this amount since the 1st of January 2014, uh, which currently provides income to the general fund of about £6,000 or so. The subscriptions and other income from investments are intended to cover the cost of conducting the business of the council. Uh, cost of venues has increased together with other costs of the annual meeting, committee expenses, and other expenditure. Um, although we have had surpluses in the past because of the uh, roadshow, um, there is generally an underlying deficit uh, which really shouldn't be allowed to continue for longer than necessary. There is going to be considerable work planned by uh, CRAG and subsequent committees to implement the new style CRO. And this proposal will bring in an increase of round about an extra £2,000 prior or pending the adoption of any proposals as a result of the CRAG uh, report on the future funding. For the time being, deficits can be covered by reserves, but this shouldn't be allowed to continue indefinitely. We are, of course, continuing to monitor costs to keep them under control as far as possible. Um, I therefore propose that uh, we raise the subscription to £40 per representative from next January, which will be four years since the previous increase. Uh, Christopher Omani Anzeb, I'm happy to second this motion. Are there any questions for the Treasurer? In that case, we'll put the motion to uh, increase the affiliation fee from uh, current figure to £40 per representative per annum. All those in favour? Any against? Any abstentions? Two over there. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is carried. Thank you. Thank you. Um, motion E regarding the Bell Rescue Fund. Uh, now I ask Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Robert Wood, uh, University of Bristol Society. The Bell's Rescue Fund traditionally lent money to parishes to enable them to acquire rings of bells from redundant churches. The last such loan was made in 2007, repaid in 2010. The trustees feel that if the, loan isn't, if the fund isn't being used, then it should be wound up. At the moment, the only outstanding loan is, was made in two tranches of £8,500 to Caltech uh, for their purposes. So the trustees have agreed to wind up the fund. It simply remains for council to decide what to do with those funds. The total funds stand at just under £15,000. You'll see the figures on page 447 of the report. Um, and we are therefore proposing that the use of those funds should be passed to the admin committee. The rules of council say that those funds must be used, if the fund is wound up, the funds must be used for bell restoration purposes. So I move the report, the proposal. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Helen, do you wish to speak? Helen Webb, Ladies Guild, I'd like to second the motion. Thank you. So just to make that quite clear, this is to wind up the fund in its existing state. The the funds in hand of roughly £15,000 would be transferred to the control of the administrative committee, but they are restricted in their use for bell work. Anyone wish to speak on that? Tina. Uh, Tina Stuckland, Scottish Association. I just have a question. Are there any plans for what you might do with that money? 
Uh, are there any ideas or possibilities or potentials? I'm sure lots of people can think of ideas. Um, well, one possibility any? that occurs to me is that you will have seen um, the piece in Marine World of a while back from Simon Linford to transfer the bells from Hanley to some new home. If that scheme comes to pass, and that will depend on planning consent, I understand, then um, that might, for example, be a suitable use of some of these funds. That, that, that would be a, a, an excellent idea, I think, or something like that, yes. Katrina, have another one. Um, Anthony, I think you were first. Uh, Anthony Lovellwood, Salisbury Guild. Um, in view of all the other things the admin committee have got to sort out, would it not be more helpful if this kind of sorted today maybe by splitting it half and half between the, the Central Council, BRF, and Fay Celtic? And, and it, therefore, you know, that's another job that admin's going to have to look after. And we, it'd be one that would save us that job if the meeting today made the decision. Uh, I, I believe there would be no, uh, nothing under our rules which would prevent uh, the uh, admin committee through the officers uh, making suitable payments to, to more than one activity. I don't think this is going to take up a great deal of admin committee's time somehow. Somebody over here? Yes, Jane Wilkinson. Wilkinson, honorary member as was, as the person who actually, in the absence of illness of Kenneth Felsted, had to propose the setting up of the Rescue Fund. The Rescue Fund has done a very good job over the years. It has now run its course and been overtaken by events. I hope there will be no move to give the money to the admin committee for admin purposes. It should go to Bell Restoration, and I heartily commend the move to close the fund today. Thank you, Jane. Any other comments? Uh, Alison? Oh, Alison first, I think. Ladies first. Thank you, Chris. <coughs> Alison Hodge, Worcester, and follow on uh, words in our title. Um, I just wonder whether the fund as it stands in use as a loan and therefore remaining in use potentially in perpetuity is rather different from using it for specific projects and effectively now consuming it, whether in different financial climates actually having that reservoir to act swiftly with the capacity to loan is something that we are overlooking. Peter Wilkinson. Peter Wilkinson, Chester Diocesan Guild and Chairman of the Council's Bell Restoration Committee. Um, I'm more than happy with the proposal that, that Robert has put, um, that the assets be uh, transferred to the purview of the officers for the time being. Uh, it has been suggested that um, some of or all of that could find its way into the Council's Bell Restoration Fund that the uh, Bell Restoration Committee administers and I could assure you, if that uh, is what transpires, uh, there will be no shortage of takers for worthy projects to, uh, to use that money. Um, if the fund is restricted to, to loans only, and would obviously need to look at that, then that may be also uh, something that we can um, look after within the Bell Restoration Committee arena, if the officers would like us to. Thank you, Peter. Uh, all I can say to that is, uh, as I haven't got the rules in front of me, but as far as I recall, it doesn't say that it can only be used for loans. I think it, you have the option of loans or grants. Any other points? In that case, um, can we put, uh, are you ready to put the motion? Are you in favor of the uh, winding up of the Bell Rescue Fund? Any against? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we now have um, two uh, motions, F and G, which uh, emanate from the uh, Methods Committee. Uh, and notwithstanding the fact that uh, we have had major changes envisaged with this morning's votes, 
uh, I believe that these uh, immediate proposals are uh, to enable things to take place from now rather than waiting another year and if in due course uh, they, uh, there are amendments uh, submitted as part of the new decisions which uh, Craig envisages, uh, then th that is so be it. But uh, like so many things, you didn't want to uh, hold things up with a, uh, uh, which say a contrary vote this morning. Um, I hope you'll uh, look at these two uh, in the spirit in which the Methods Committee have submitted them. Peter. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Yes, I will, in the interest of time, I'll try and be quick. Um, I have discussed with members of the committee, and I think their view is they would like to proceed with these uh, motions. Um, before we start on F, uh, there is an error in the printed version, but it's shown correctly on there. It's actually Rule 15 for we're talking about, not 16 for. Okay, so in, in the Craig presentations we had yesterday and today, uh, Phil Barnes mentioned the importance of strategy and for having committees and working groups to have clear objectives uh, to deliver against that. Um, so Methods Committee agrees with that, and um, this is why we're proposing a more detailed set of terms of reference. So how does it fit with Craig? Well, we did word these motions bef uh, before we saw the details of the Craig motions, um, but it's our own belief that the council will need a technical working group um, and the terms that we're proposing here would form a good starting point for such a group. Um, so the current terms of reference, if anybody wants to look at them, uh, are very limited. Um, they simply are to consider and advise on all questions from the interpretation of the council's decisions relating to methods, calls and appeal rigging. So we kept those but added several other responsibilities. Um, they're written up there. I hope they're fairly clear, so I'm not going to go through each one. Uh, but I thought I would highlight a couple of them and then address a couple of the questions that have been already asked about this motion in the ringing world and elsewhere. Um, so the first thing I'm going to mention is it talks explicitly now about maintaining a library of named methods um, and also about resolving disputes related to method naming. Um, so in his uh, submission presentation this morning, a proposal this morning, Phil pointed out, uh, these things have been highlighted as positives, or the method collection specifically had been highlighted out, highlighted as a positive in the CRAG consultation, um, and also the fact that we used a standard set of method names throughout the world. Um, so this is really to support that. Um, the second item is that I'm going to mention is the one at the end, which is about the um, promotion of an interest in technical and theoretical aspects of ringing. Um, of course, there are other things like the ringing theory mailing list, and the committee isn't seeking to replace that in any way, but we think it would be good to widen the general knowledge of ringing theory to a bigger audience, uh, and in particular to engage the interest of younger ringers. They use this as a recruitment tool for a certain kind of young ringers, anyway. Um, so I think I probably should mention a couple of criticisms that have been made of the motion in the ringing world, which we have answered there. Um, first is that this represents some kind of land grab for the committee as its scope goes beyond methods and talks about appeals. Um, as I said, that's in the current terms of reference, but we also sense the desire from CRAG to consolidate the number of committees into fewer work groups, so it didn't seem to make sense to make the terms too narrow. Um, the second concern that was raised by Don Morrison is that it gives additional powers to the committee, uh, for example, its role in uh, resolving method naming disputes. Um, now, I find this a bit of a puzzling concern. Uh, on the one hand, we get people complaining the committee isn't doing enough, but on the other hand, when we try and formalise what it should do, we get complaints about that as well. Um, I'll just say that the principle of empowering committees to take their own decisions um, subject to appropriate oversight seems entirely consistent with the CRAG motions that we voted for earlier today. And so with that, I would like to propose the motion. Thank you. Peter. Mark, it speak? is seconded by Mark Davis, who actually isn't here in present today, so, um, but he's very keen, and Graham John also was involved in the wording of it, so um, we can, he's going to come and answer, help me answer any questions. Do you want to say anything, Graham? Or? Yeah. Uh, Graham John from the Oxford Diocesan Guild. Uh, I'll just say that uh, I'm probably responsible for triggering uh, this in the first place because um, outside the committee and actually outside the council, which I only joined today, um, I looked at the 
existing rules and was rather puzzled that the uh, Methods Committee's uh, terms of reference didn't seem to include most of the things it actually did. Um, so I wrote down a list of things which I thought it should do and um, that is uh, what has uh, really materialised as this motion is actually reflecting what the Methods Committee or what, what most of us believe the Methods Committee should be doing um, and it does encompass its existing role which was purely to uh, advise the council on the decisions. So that's the background of this. Uh, I believe that even in the, in, the, the, in the sort of crag situation, these are still the things that need to be done. So whether they're done by the current methods committee or they're done by a work group, uh, they still need doing. So it's still a part of the process as taking us forward to that step. I'm right, right in saying that, what, that uh, it gives you the freedom to uh, discuss with the, uh, the, those who will be working on the crisis proposals, uh, the, the greater freedom yep. in terms of, of subject matter. Anyone wish to make any comments? John Harrison. John Harrison, Oxford Diocesan Guild. Uh, as the chairman of the committee, which a few years ago, looked at the c his terms of reference which were written before the war subject to a tiny patch a few years ago uh, we looked at what we thought we should be doing within the wider remit and we broadened down terms of reference uh, i think what the methods committee has done they've done the same thing they had a very narrow terms of reference which as graham pointed out didn't cover what they were actually doing so they've stopped and looked and said well what should we be doing and I see this as moving towards the new regime where the work groups won't say you've got a narrow line to follow. They'll say the council's mission would broad dividing into chunks, look around, don't just do what you're doing, think what else you should be doing that's worth doing. So I I'm happy to support that. Thank you, John. Robert Brown, Devon Association. There's one phrase in there which has caused me a little bit of concern. Are you going to take on a censorship role in terms of naming of methods? There is effectively a censorship role at the moment applied that's in the current um, decisions that allow the council, allow this meeting to um, refer back a name if they don't think it's an appropriate name. Um, it was originally intended for names that were, you know, offensive um, in what they were. Um, it's not our intention to do that. When we talk about adjudicating or arbitrating on method names, um, we're mainly concerned with the issue if two people name it on the same day. We have to decide which one actually got there first. It's that kind of thing. We're not proposing to go back and say, don't like the name you've chosen, um, except for um, there is one other area which I think comes up occasionally, which is in the area of method extension. Um, I think most ringers generally agree that being able to call, seeing the relationship between Cambridge Major, Cambridge Royal, Cambridge Maximus is a sensible thing, and if somebody were to ring something at a different stage um, that wasn't related but had the same name, that would be bad. That's already covered by the current decisions anyway, so we wouldn't be doing anything special in the committee with regard to that. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Stefan, if you want to. Stefan Jentek, Chester Darcy and Guild. I'm, I'm broadly in favour with the motion, but I'd just uh, like to comment on the last four words on the second paragraph, or the main paragraph. Um, to, to promote an interest in technical and theoretical aspects of ringing to ringers at large. I would suggest that could be removed and that the Methods Committee could therefore maybe attract new people into ringing through an interest in technical and theoretical aspects of ringing, perhaps through mathematics yep. and journals and stuff like that. that. That was entirely what I was trying to get so, from so those my, words. My, I would suggest then perhaps a pr propose a, an amendment to remove those four words. You mean you want to uh, make it appeal to other non-riggers, effectively? No, well, what yes, so that you, you have the possibility to... Okay, um, yeah, I'm happy to delete the word, accept amendment to remove to ringers at large. Thank you. Thank you. I see my Just virtual delete. secondary is happy with that as well. Uh, <laughs> we're having a proposed amendment to... to, to, to no, if I accept the amendment, that's it. You don't right? have to vote. If I accept the amendment, you oh don't right. have to vote you're, on it. You're happy yeah. right. so I'm okay. trying to speed things up here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any other comments? 
In that case, we have a, a motion uh, which the uh, proposers have accepted to the deletion of the last four words uh, to ring us at large. Um, so it's as printed on your sheet. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Just deleted off the screen, right. Okay, good. Um, <coughs> yes, Peter. So let's put it. Let's put, let's put it. Can, we, can we put the motion, please? Are you in favour? Any against? Any abstentions? Uh, right, we needed a two thirds vote, but I think that happened. One yeah. one. Yes. Thank okay, you thank much. you very much. Right, motion G is. Here we go again. Um, I would. Yeah, okay. So, motion G is to actually make some changes to the existing decisions. So there are five parts to this that are independent of each other. Um, under the current rules, so following the consultation exercise we ran earlier this year, um, under the current rules, the council has to vote on such changes, um, which is why we're putting the motion for now, forward now. Um, each of these parts of the proposal relax some of the conditions currently in place concerning peels and methods, and there are no additional restrictions being added. Anything that meets the current requirements for peel or method will continue to do so if the motion is passed. Um, so before carrying on, there is some criticism that this looks like continued tinkering of the current decisions instead of a complete rewrite. Um, the main reason for putting the proposals forward now is that if they're passed today, they will take effect immediately. Um, but also we expect that the new decisions will contain many substantive changes beyond what we currently have. And I think it's gonna be easier to develop them if the principle, these principles of some of these decisions uh, have at least been agreed to first. Um, there have been explanatory notes um, showing what the before and after look like on our website. Um, I will very quickly summarize them all. Um, so the first one, change one, is to allow methods that are false in the plain course. Um, at the moment, methods have to be true in their plain course. There are about 10 in the collection that have been rung uh, at the moment uh, that are false in their plain course and are classed as non-method blocks. Uh, on our website, we've shown the new names or new titles they will get if the proposal is passed. So it does include Kent and Oxford treble bob minimus, which will now be 48 rows in the plain course, and now going to be, uh, would, if passed, would be valid methods, and also two of the original particles, quarks, peels, that caused all the um, difficulties, I guess, uh, some years ago, will now be classified as methods. Okay, so that's option number one. Number two is about uh, removing the requirement for bells to be audible outside the tower. Um, that's not a methods thing, it's a appeals thing, but it comes under the remit of what we were looking at. Uh, several people um, asked for that, and it should be self-explanatory. Um, I'll skip over number three, because that's the more controversial one, and come back to that in a minute. Uh, number four is to reflect um, uh, changes in the way uh, actually to reflect current peel ringing and peel conducting practice. Uh, so two of the decisions we have today are about the way you conduct peels. Um, they say any shift or error shall be corrected immediately and no error in calling shall be corrected later than during the change at which it would properly take effect. I s abbreviated slightly. So a number of ringers commented to us that these weren't strictly adhered to in all peels um, and <laughs> they bring <laughs> They bring the general credibility uh, in, of the whole of the other things into question. Uh, also, there's some problems with what do you mean by immediately, right? So obviously, if it was, you know, <laughs> you can't correct it after it's happened. So, um, so what we thought we spent some time on the words of this, and, and this also came from uh, external groups as well. Uh, so the proposed wording is shown there to put in something which actually isn't there at the moment, which is an exhortation to maintain a high standard of ringing. Um, and we're saying all errors in ringing or calling should be corrected quickly uh, rather than immediately. Okay, so that's that one. Um, now the last one, I'll come back to three in a minute. The last one is for a, a wider range of possible constructions of peels. Now this is a technical and complicated one, uh, but really it's just completing a change that we agreed to last year, uh, which was to allow 5,100 of doubles. Um, there are some anomalies in the way uh, that you could ring some kinds of 5,100s and not others, so this is correcting that. The details are in our paper if you're interested. Um, but it's actually at another level, it's also giving us the opportunity to redefine what we mean by truth in compositions. Um, and with this phrase, n or n plus one times in there. 
uh, which is something we think would be a useful uh, phrase to include in the next set of definition-based decisions. Okay, I will now go on to number three, which is about simulators. Um, so this is probably the most controversial. In the consultation we did, 25% of people objected to this who replied. However, 50% of people were in favour. Um, so that's why we are including it here. Um, we were careful to choose the wording. Uh, to work, we spent some time on precise wording of this because we didn't want to uh, inc include situations where somebody just presses a button and starts a computer playing or something like that. Um, so we've chosen the word simulated sound. You'll see it says there, appeals run with simulated sound. Um, and we're emphasizing the need for human ringers and for the activity performed by those ringers to be the same as when appeal is run on conventional tower bells or handbells. So the analogy really in this respect is, it's like imagine an organist giving a recital on an electronic organ rather than on a pipe organ. Uh, the organist is playing the instrument in the same way it's just the means of the sound production that's different. Um, so that's really what we try to capture in, in A and B. Um, we've also put in a bit that suggests that, well, that says that uh, record lengths with simulators should be kept, or simulated sound should be kept separate from ones with non-simulated sound. Okay, uh, so that's the end of what I was going to, introduction of this. Um, would Lee want to say anything? Would Lee want to say anything? <laughs> there he is. <laughs> <laughs> Lee Simpson College is uh, very happy to second the motion. I think it's uh, allowing some things that lots of people are doing already. <laughs> okay. um, can I suggest, uh, well, first of all, uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll take the, is it such a long uh, uh, yep. thing? We'll take it section by section, the, the, the one to five sections. And um, are there any, first of all, are there any, any, any We'll take section one. Are there any comments on that, please? John? Harrison? It's coming. It's just coming. It's coming. John Harrison, Oxford Diocese and Guild. Uh, this is actually a general comment that applies to all, including one, and it might speed things along. I've long been a critic of the continual patching of a defective system. However, we now have a firm commitment that there will be a new ship. They've already designed the patches for the next year, so I think we should just let them fit the patches, sail the ship until it's scrapped in a year or whatever's time, uh, and then we'll have the new ship. Okay. So or despite being against another patch in general, we now have the commitment to do the job properly. Let's, you know, we've done the work, let's have the next year a little bit nearer to what it should be than what it was before. John, any other comments uh, at the back there? Sorry. Yeah. Andrew Johnson, Winchester Diocesan Guild, Winchester and Portsmouth. Um, for the true uh, appeals which are false in the plain course, um, every time you make a decision, people take it as a, an excuse to step over that line. So how long before someone just has two courses of plain bob doubles or plain bob major as a new method. Okay, any other questions on this one or shall I answer? Uh, Steve, Stephen oh, uh, Petman, Suffolk Guild of Ringers. Um, just one quick question about the, will the non-true methods be listed in separate categories to the true methods? Because I think it may cause some confusion for, to people who are perhaps not as experienced as some of us at looking through these things and using computer proving for anything, be ring or whatever. Any more? Peter, do you want to answer? Okay. So, answer to the two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, the uh, behaviour that Andrew described can already be done effectively today. People can ring uh, things that are really... Well, there are various ways of casting uh, methods that are... Um, different um, and people don't do it yeah if you really want to do that I guess you can but I don't see that's a reason for excluding things like cantonots with treble bob minimus okay we will deal with that as it arises the other question um, yeah uh, my personal view is that we should in the collection put a warning against methods that are false in the plain course so that people know that they can't call wrong home wrong for the mix up for example um, and expect it to work in the normal way. So I don't think that's a problem with that. You have a problem with that? No. Okay, good. Thank you. 
Any more, any more points in the first question section? Can I ask a leading question at this point? John Harrison has suggested that we might take the whole uh, proposal, G, uh, as a whole, as being uh, a step forward um, towards the eventual aims of CRAG, which were outlined this morning. Um, it will give additional freedoms as from now. Can I ask the view of the Assembly whether you'd be willing to take all the whole of uh, Proposal G in one go? Yes. Yes. Just yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Right, okay. Well, uh, in that case, we'll go back to Plan A. <laughs> um, can I ask, are you... Uh, Yes, yeah, sorry. Well, well, you can, can you propose we move straight to a vote. Yeah, yeah just, just go straight to a vote. That's one person who's got an issue. You'll, you'll just no, get to the vote. No, 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 there's more, there's more than one, Doug. Yeah. Um, right, can I ask, are you uh, willing to approve uh, section G1 as proposed? Those in favour? Well, you can, Fred. All right. If you if you want to if you want to treat it in that way, in that case, sorry. They just going to snooze it. Mm. All right. Um, discuss section two then. Any comments on section two? Yes. So. Um. For this one, what effect does it have on record length peels in, in, in ranging that they're actually audible for people wanting to hear? Record, sorry, record length peels have to have an umpire anyway now if they're over 10,000 changes, so this wouldn't affect that. If I held the previous record, I, I might want to hear that this performance was actually better. The, yeah. Is a requirement to give notice of record length, the person you could then come along and I'm sure arrangements could be made. Andrew Astman, the Yorkshire Association. Um, really this applies to both two and three. I consider appeals to be performances and um, uh, and they should be capable of being heard by people um, who want to hear them um, outside the tower. And we've just also got a leaflet on our chairs which reminds us that uh, bells are a sign of hope and a source of comfort. People want to hear church bells. Why do we have to hide what we do? Yeah. There's somebody at the back here, over there. Who's it? Uh, Pat Hickey, Gloucester and Bristol. Um, going back to the previous comment, um, I think the, the point has been covered by the fact that um, peals rung with artificial sound will be recorded as such. I don't think that there's any problem for people with existing record lengths. They will still be record lengths on open bells. Yes, uh, sorry. Yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Ladd, Durham University Society. I'm currently fronting a project to install a ring of bells in a church in France. I would love to be able to invite everybody here to come and ring peals on them. I would love for the residents not to be able to hear those peals. <laughs> so I, I'm sure there are churches and other towers where it's very appropriate. I take Andrew's point about ringing be a, a performance, but I think there are places where it's appropriate for the bells not to be heard at all outside, never mind quietly, and I'd be perfectly happy to open the church to people to hear them inside. Uh, Veronica, over here. Veronica Downing, Suffolk Guild. Yes, uh, my, my point follows on from what's just been said. We have to ring long lengths using sound control, and where are you drawing the line? Because inside, um, the ringers who are ringing can hear everything very clearly. People who want to come inside the church to listen to the ringing can hear it. 
but we have to have the ringing dampened so that complainants outside can't be disturbed. Okay. Further points? Can I comment? One thing we could consider in the future is a requirement to record um, internally the uh, record length so there's actually a, a record of it. I don't know if that's the thing that people might find uh, useful, but I just put that forward as a suggestion, not as a proposal now, obviously. Um, then you'd actually have a record for history of the record length of whatever it was, if anybody really wanted to listen to it all. With today's technology, I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Peter? Um, do you want to go on to, s sorry, one over there? Yeah. So, thank you. Uh, Susan Welsh, Yorkshire Association. Um, as a ringer, I completely agree with what you're trying to bring in. It just concerns me that we're opening the door for incumbents possibly in the future to say, well, you don't need to make a noise, you can do it on a simulator once we've established that precedent in other places. Thank you for that point. Move on to section four. Three. Three, yes, a three, sorry. We have had some comments on simulated sound. Section four, and this is about standards of ringing. Fred's got the point there. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Fred Bowen, Essex Association. Um, we're told that uh, the existing um, uh, requirements on what I consider the etiquette of peel ringing um, are widely ignored. Uh, I've spoken to a number of people I would consider, <coughs> excuse me, people I would consider to be uh, leading pill ringers, and they um, uh, all have told me that they disapprove of uh, this change. At the moment, um, the, the requirement, as you can see in the, your copy of the decisions, which is on your, uh, which was put on your chairs this morning, is that mistakes should be corrected immediately and that calls are not, m must not be put in retrospectively. Uh, I consider what we've got here to be woolly in the extreme, and I would like to propose deleting part four from this motion. Thank you. Any response to that, uh, Leighton? Well, actually, I think you should ask if there's a seconder, but I didn't actually say they were widely ignored. I just said they weren't strictly adhered to in all peels. Is there a seconder for that proposed amendment? Yes. yes. Andrew Johnson. Right, we have a proposed and seconder to um, delete section four from the uh, proposal. Uh, those in favour of the amendment to delete section four from the proposal, which is affecting uh, the standard and correction of uh, ringing. All right. Those against the amendment. Thank you. That's clear the amendment is lost. Uh, can we carry on with just the last uh, discussion, the last section five? Um, Peter, do you want to say any more about the triple? Not really. Um, I expect Andrew's going to object to this one. But um, so, as I said, this is to allow you, at the moment, you can ring a 5,100 of doubles con consisting of 42 extents and a touch of 60 changes. Uh, what we'll now let you do with this proposal is to ring 41 extents and a touch of 180. Um, it makes it more regular, removes an anomaly, um, and it allows you to ring a rotation that counts. And it's the same rows that you'd be ringing. Um, so that's one part of it. The other part is it allows to introduce this concept of tr a true touch now being you ring N or N plus one times, um, but not N or N plus two times. Um, okay. Please, um, any comments? Yes, again, Andrew. <laughs> again, Andrew Johnson. Again, I object to this one. The importance of extents in uh, ringing has been around since, right since the entire time of Fabian Stedman of bringing all the changes once and once only, and the extension of doing that multiple times. 
and this is totally against it. And as I pointed out in my letter in The Ringing World, this would allow people to ring appeal of granted triples and deliberately to repeat a course just to get queens to come up twice. And then to, further on, they get uh, titums, which is a bit uneven. So he says, well, we'll just repeat that course so it comes up again. And then near the end, he misses out a bob, says, well, we'll just repeat that course and put it in the right place. And it's just totally against the completeness and, and truth in change ringing. Any other comments? John, Harrison? Presumably, Andrew, given the sanctity of the extent, would have felt that in the 18th century they should not have contemplated ringing less than 40,320 for appeal of major. <laughs> um, I, I think there's, the, there's a degree of practicality. It's certainly the extent is part of the evolution. Uh, but to say that you can't ring appeal between 5,040 of triples and 10,080 of triples does seem to me completely nonsense. Uh, you can ring a long, to, a long peal of uh, short of minor, you can ring a long peal of major, but not to do it to triples. So I think this is just a little bit of common sense and Andrew's, Andrew's suggestion. Whilst I can understand the sentiment, I think we do have to move on. Any further comments? Yes, over the back. Uh, David Smith, Anza. Sorry to go backwards. Could I seek a clarification of notion three? Um, just looking at the wording up there, it appeared to state something about simulating simulators on tower bells. It doesn't seem to make it clear what happens if you ring on a simulator where, from a human point of view, the action is exactly the same as on a tower bell, but there isn't actually a bell. Uh, yes, uh, the, this would include that situation where there is no physical bell as of a metal object up there. That would be my interpretation of it. All right. Uh, Robert Perry. Yeah, uh, Robert Perry, True Dossers and Guild. Um, I'm sorry if this appears pedantic, but this is the Central Council of Church Bell Ringers, and I fail to see why we're spending so much time in debating uh, something which is uh, highly unlikely, I would have thought, to happen in many, if any, churches. Somebody, uh, was there another? Paul, did you want to? No? Okay. Any more? Okay. If there's no more comments, um, can I suggest that? Uh, yes, sorry. Chris Turner, Lincoln Gill. Can I just have clarification of that last point on motion three, uh, which I thought we were coming back to? Your definition of a bell, a Saxelby simulator, for instance, would be classified as a simula uh, bell, would it? A peal would be allowed to be rung on a, on a, on a, a Saxelby simulator. The analogy I gave was... Um an electronic organ versus a pipe organ. So in a pipe organ, you actually have, as you can see up there, you've actually got metal pipes and the sound comes out of those. Okay, and you ring on a real tower bell, there's a metal object that swings um, and you get the sound out of that. All right, what this is saying is that um, we're talking about a situation where the person pulls the rope, just like the organist plays the keys, um, but the method of sound production is not by um, a metal object being hit, a bell-shaped metal object being hit uh, by a clapper. Okay, so however that works, there may be a real bell there, um, but it's tied, or there may be some other kind of simulator, some other kind of object there that simulates the physical uh, behavior, just like the organist keyboard simulates the touch of the organ. Okay? So the answer is yes, then. Sorry. Another yes, again. Yeah. Um, just go, going back, the Andrew Johnson again. Just going back to this one. I just had a thought. Does this also allow the flower pots again? Is that there's a kind of a simulated bell sound that comes out of a flower pot? Yeah. <laughs> Sigh. <laughs> Now you're asking a question of what's the sound, how close does the sound have to be to the sound of a bell, I think. Um, this illustrates the uh, need for um, kind of, yeah, 
judgment on... For, yeah. I don't think we should try and change the words from what we've currently put. I think it's close enough to what we're expressing, the spirit of what we're trying to do. Uh, I personally don't think there's any problem uh, with ringing um, on flower pots, provided the sound produced is clear and distinct that you can actually tell the notes apart from each other. Um, I'm speaking as someone who has rung peel on a flower pot, by the way. <laughs> One more over here, and then Angela. Jeff Ladd, Durham University Society. Following on from that, I was going to ask, does the sound actually have to be that of a bell at all, or could it be, for instance, eight words from Ulysses? I could see that people might want to do that. There are precedents for doing that in music. You've only got to listen to the music of Steve Reich. Would you count a peal of grants or triples that didn't actually sound like bells at all? Jeff, if you'd like to do that, I don't think the Central Council should stop you. <laughs> Angela? Actually, Alison, Alison but sorry. Chris, I accept Al Angela as well these days. Um, Alison Hodge, Worcestershire and Districts. I'm just looking at that, and I'm no keeny on this sort of thing, but what about the number of people, the human ringers, in relation to the number of bells? Convention is one, sometimes it's double-handed, similarly in handbells, two each. Is there any scope here for saying that one person has rung a peel with simulated bells, so on. Are there any more comments? Otherwise, I'm going to ask that the motion be put, that <coughs> motion G, the five parts. Are you willing to approve motion G in, in its entirety. Those in favour? Against? That's clearly carried. Thank you very much for your forbearance in a, a, a difficult technical issue. Thank you. Now we come to the um, receipt of committee reports. Uh, I would say two things. First of all, uh, the committee chairman should be ready uh, at the microphone to uh, present and answer any questions on their reports, respective reports. This is, ladies and gentlemen, your opportunity to question omissions and future plans of committees, should you so wish to do. Uh, this was one of the points which uh, the, the Crag report made about being accountable. Uh, I think if we, the, as, as I said, you know, we sometimes uh, just take things on the nod. If there is anything that you wish to ask the committee chairman, uh, please, this is your chance to do so. So we'll start off with uh, the administrative committee, Mary. Right, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, first, I'd like to apologise to you and to the members for a few typographical errors in the supplement. Peter's already referred to one of them. There was a bug in the software, presumably introduced to correct something else, and this bug was corrected after we'd gone to the press. I'd particularly like to thank Fred for typesetting the supplement in order to save time and effort by the Ringing World staff who were, of course, especially busy just after the Easter bank holidays with producing the weekly edition. <coughs> they do have to get the regular paper out. And I'd like to thank Robert, Chris and Jackie for their assistance to us. Thinking of the supplement in the years ahead, could I just ask for a quick show of hands on how many of you are using the paper version today and would continue to need this in future? Are you using paper? Thank you, that's a majority. Right, okay. Right, okay. Uh, could I can, uh, draw your attention to the forthcoming meeting with Historic England and the Church Buildings Council on the 25th of July? And please contact me or Christopher or David Cacaldi as soon as possible about any matter which should be placed on the agenda at that meeting. Once again, we attempted to keep the central administrative costs of this meeting to the minimum, 
by only distributing printed sets of papers in advance to those members without email. And this continues to save several hundred pounds which would otherwise be spent on copying and postage. So I'd like to thank you for supporting that. For the benefit of, of new members, I should perhaps explain that there's normally only one physical mailing a year when the brochure for the annual meeting is dispatched. So do please let us know if you change your email address. Carol and I are not actually psychic. <laughs> we hope it appears that way, but it's not actually true. It also helps if you can ensure that cccbr.org.uk is whitelisted for email, and if you can make sure also that your society secretary whitelists cccbr addresses. With that, I formally propose adoption of the administrative committee report. <coughs> Christopher Omani Anzeb, um, I've been asked to formally second the motion to adopt the report and in so doing I'd like to highlight members' attention uh, in the section uh, emboldened reform of the council and then of the administrative committee and there's a section in there that discusses uh, future council meetings. Um, I'm inviting Andrew Wilby and Ernie Delay Runciman to, to step up to help talk about um, arrangements for Lancaster next year. I'm hoping that everybody has now received one of these on their seats, uh, which is a little brochure uh, concerning that. If not, could I, if I could ask the stewards and tellers perhaps, there's a box up here up the front, and if anybody's not seen one of these, raise your hand and we'll get, we've got a box up the front here um, with spares. Um, so Andrew and Ernie are gonna talk quickly about arrangements for next year, but I mean, the key thing is what we took on board in the reform agenda um, that the Lancaster meeting is arranged jointly by the admin committee and in this instance the Lancashire Association. It is in May. Uh, the formal business of the meeting is designed to be shorter. Um, the overall weekend is going to be more all-inclusive um, with a broader appeal and planning is well advanced. So over to Andrew and Ernie. Thank you. Mr. President, I'd um, like to thank uh, the Vice President for doing my job for me. <laughs> Very kind. <laughs> um, you'll see from your brochure that there's been quite a lot of work put into this, and it's part of the movement to try and turn this conference, this meeting, into much more of a conference, because I think some of us are very conscious that a lot of people here sit there staring at the back of somebody's head and don't really get that much chance to take part. And a couple of years ago at Hull, when we did have those breakout sessions, I think one of the significant things that happened was pretty well everybody on the council got to speak. And I think there's a feeling that that's, what, that's the way we should be moving. Um, you'll see that uh, from the brochure that uh, it becomes a two-day event. There's something else behind that. It takes an awful long time to, f to uh, create a climate of opinion in a body like this when you only meet once a year. And it's really healthy and really good if you can actually get together at the minimum for two days and be able to talk, meet in the bar and, and converse. And that's something we, a lot of us would like to see this council improving on. So there you are. It's a, it becomes a two-day event. That leads on to the other part of this in that um, the research showed that we could find one academic institution that would take us at the, the Maybank holiday, and that's at Lancaster. All the others we researched, um, it's term time. Now the reason for going to an academic institution is they are considerably cheaper than other conference facilities. And the sort of packages you can get will actually reduce the amount of money we all spend, because when you add up the, um, the meals and the um, hotels and what have you, you'll find if you actually do the sum properly, you'll find it's quite expensive, particularly here in Edinburgh, of course, this year. So that's the thinking behind it. And um, the, the figures on the back of the card are correct at the time of publication, but they are subject to one or two bits of variation, um, one of which was we did make an allowance for your, part of your subscription to be part of your conference costs in these costings. Well, by raising the subscription, we can go back over that again and just see where that leads us, because I think there may be scope to 
um, effectively reduce the upfront cost to you because you'll already have paid a bit more in your subscription. Um, having said that, Ernie. Right. Thank you, Andrew. As you see, the, um, it'll start on the Saturday. Um, we're hoping some committees will provide seminars and workshops. I know Tower Stewardship Committee are moving to a workshop, and I've been talking with Towers and Belfries. They're talking about the maintenance workshop. So I will be talking to other, other committees. On the Sunday, we're not going to have um, a Songs of Praise as such, but we're hoping that the members of the council will adopt a local tower to help them with service ringing. Um, the, we're going to open, we're hoping to hold the AGM of the Ringing World on the Sunday, but that's with further negotiation with the Ringing World to see what's going to happen there. Um, we're looking for a keynote speaker to help us on the Sunday, very similar to what we had yesterday with Sir Tony Baldry. Um, we have some feelers out at the moment, and then the formal opening of the, of the council will be on the Sunday with the the minutes, the matters, uh, matters rising, the uh, obituaries, etc., etc., followed by the dinner and the reception and the dinner. Then on the Monday, um, more of a workshop-based um, meeting, obviously with the formal motions. I think we're going to have quite a bit of work now next year with the um, changes of the rules, etc. Um, we're asking. Um, want the local association to give us an overview of what's happening in ringing in the area and a number of breakout sessions as well. Right? Thank you, Andy. Any questions? Before? Can I say also, moving forward beyond 2018, <coughs> um, as alluded to earlier today, looking towards a more a, a mini roadshow style, um, moving the meeting to September so that we can avail ourselves of better conference fees. Um, so watch this space. Um, and with that, I propose, I second the adoption of the report. Okay. Are you in favour of the adoption of the admin committee report? Yeah, you have a question, Robert? <coughs> yeah, uh, Robert Perry, Trogill. Uh, two, two things. Uh, firstly, on the idea of the two-day conference, that, that has no trouble for me personally. But uh, when I was at work, I was involved with an organization, a national uh, organization, which held uh, such conferences. And uh, as time went by, uh, colleagues from, uh, in my line of work from elsewhere in the country found it increasingly difficult to um, get time to travel, uh, in most cases, considerable distances, uh, on, and be away from their offices for two days. So, um, although, I, as I say, it causes me personally no problem, uh, and indeed I welcome the, the, the new concept, I do wonder whether it might deter some members from being present, certainly on, on, on both days. Uh, secondly, uh, as to the uh, p p uh, possibility of changing the date of the uh, 2019 meeting, we did discuss this, I think, last year, or maybe, no, maybe it was a whole meeting. Uh, either way, um, the, the idea of meeting, I thought the, the idea of meeting in the autumn had been rejected, so I'm a little bit surprised to see it back on the agenda now. Um, when uh, it was discussed at the Hull meeting, Robert, yes, absolutely, uh, it did go to the vote and rejected, not by a, a strong majority. Um, but again, if I use the, um, the CRAG colour coding on what's within the gift of uh, uh, the council as it stands at the moment, it's, it's not the kind of thing that actually needs a vote. Right. John, come on, John Harrison. My recollection of that meeting was that because it was desired not to put on too much at once. The proposal to move the date was put forward without the exposure, the full thinking behind it that Andrew's just done in terms of dates and accommodation and so on. Uh, and the, the message I remember from that meeting is, don't ask us to move the date without giving us a good reason. Now we've got the good reason. Uh, there's a logic behind it, which those who had been in the admin committee were already aware of. I think the problem at that meeting was that the whole rationale for moving wasn't clear, and the members, predictably, some said I can't go, I mean, the usual problem. Uh, so I don't think we should read too much into that vote, which was based on 
an inadequate presentation of why we wanted to move it. We've now got a much more solid case of why it's worth moving, and I think we should judge it on that basis. Thank you for that comment, John. Right. Can I have your approval to the adoption of the... Somebody else? Oh, right. Yes, Roland. I'm assuming it's switched on. Um, I was one of those that spoke against moving it. Oh, sorry, I was no better. Uh, Roland Backus, Bath and Wells. Um, I was one of those that spoke specifically against moving um, the meeting to September or early September because it's one of the times of the year when a lot of families and things like that, um, they're getting ready for their children to go to school, to college, etc. And one of the reasons that particular weekend that you talked about um, and chose, and why, and why was it a quiet weekend? Because of all the other things that outside of ringing that are going on in families and that. And if we want young family or mem younger members to take part in this, then they're not going to be available at that time of year. Thank you, Roland. Any other comments? Neil? Neil first, and uh, Neil Dodge, uh, Suffolk Guild. I just wondered if the uh, area of the location of the 2019 meeting has been uh, decided. We've got a couple of quotations from a couple of university venues, but I need also to be chatting with the territorial associations in those areas before, uh, so if I can keep my powder dry a little longer. Sorry, Doug, can I just add something there? Um, I think the concept we have is that the um, meeting would move around the country. Um, it would not draw on resources of um, guilds who ought to be putting their time and effort into doing other things. Organising a council meeting gets easier for a body when you're doing it year by year by year because it's just sort of more or more of the same, you know what you're doing. Um, but the idea is to move the uh, meeting around the country and use the event to do what good we can in the different locations with the local guilds. Thank you, Andrew. Doug, do you want to? Yeah, Doug Davis, Kent County Association. Just to follow on about the, the timing of September and things, Actually, as someone with two young children and a busy family life, this weekend is actually more problematic than any other because it's half term, it's bank holiday, and actually my family would much rather I be there at home with them than they would if I happened to disappear when the kids are going back to school. So, you know, I think that's an invalid argument really for families these days. Can I just add to that? that uh, when you look at it, there's no good weekend. There's always somebody that's uh, so. But the first weekend in September is the one weekend in the ringing calendar where, funnily enough, there is nothing. That is why ringing uh, road shows have been held on that Saturday. Right. Uh, can we put it to the vote, please, the adoption of the admin committee report? Those in favour? Any against? Abstentions? No. Thank you very much. Um, oh, there was one over there, right. One abstention. Um, we have um, Michael Chester and Tony Smith are no longer members of the council, and Michael Church and Derek Simpson retire. There are four vacancies for the admin committee. Proposals Michael Church and Philip Barnes. Are you anyone <coughs> against that? Or are you all in favour? In favour? Thank you. So they are duly elected to the admin committee. Now, subsequent committee reports, I'll just remind you, uh, they've all been published in, uh, in the supplement between pages 433 and 447. So I hope you've all read them. Um, I'm very conscious that we have to press on. Uh, Public Relations Committee, Kate. Kate Flavel, Surrey Association. Just a very little to add to the published report. I'm very pleased to say that the new version of Bells in Your Care leaflet for the clergy has been updated and circulated. You should all have a copy of that on your chairs. We're not really intending to keep this as a, 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 as a hugely available paper leaflet, but just to use it electronically. It's on our website. There are some paper copies. Um, 
We're very grateful to Sue Hall, who joins our committee today for carrying out most of the uh, design and production work of this excellent leaflet. We heard this morning that the Central Council should get closer to the BBC. Um, the BBC are very keen to have ringing featuring in their music day rearranged for the 15th of June because of the general election. You will have seen information about this um, covering the whole of one back page of the ringing world among other places. Clyde Whitaker has been leading our work on this and I do hope all your towers are joining in, especially overseas towers which the BBC is particularly keen to include. This is another of those unexpected opportunities that seem too good to, to miss despite creating additional work for us. Other work that we've been doing with the BBC has led to an interview with Derek Bro uh, Dennis Brock on the Radio 4 Sunday program yesterday, um, the oldest ringer at nearly 99. Um, Bells on Sunday, of course, is a regular feature that our committee looks after, and yesterday featured the bells from this church. Um, and the BBC also, uh, we had a, a broadcast manager speaking at our PR Matters Day, which is referred to in the printed report, and it turns out he has a big involvement with children in need and is very keen to see if we can come up with some pudsy bear methods, um, specially created for children in need this year, um, and we're following that up with him. Um, so watch this space for that. A lot of work we're doing with the BBC at the moment, um, and um, I have great pleasure in proposing the adoption of the report. Thank you. Okay. I would just add that your president uh, was on the radio BBC Glasgow this morning, and um, back to tell the tale. <laughs> um, any questions for the PR committee? Uh, seconder, please. Neil, the point. Uh, Neil Dodge, Suffolk Guild. Uh, I'd just like to thank the committee for their excellent work. Um, I just wondered if, uh, what lessons have you learned from uh, the, the media buzz that was created around things like the uh, ringing as a sport and particularly York Minster um, uh, and how you're going to ch perhaps change the media strategy going forward because all, uh, a lot of the York Minster press was focused on what York Minster said. There were quotes from uh, the, de uh, well, the bishop and things like that, but there was very little from uh, the ringing organisation side apart from individual York ringers um, and uh, criticisms I've, I've received because um, I'm the public relations officer for our guild is that ringing was too slow to uh, act on um, uh, putting forward our position on, on that side. I just wonder what, what you've learned from that and how you're going to develop going forward. Thank you. I think that you always learn from every experience with the media. Um, no two scenarios are the same. With York Minster, it, as, as our president has referred to earlier today, was a unique experience, unique to that tower and that group of clergy and their relationship with that group of ringers. Um, I think our official view, which we put forward very quickly, was that in general, the relationship between ringers and the church, as I mentioned earlier today, is extremely good, that we as ringers work very hard to help maintain that, and when we become aware of breakdowns in those relationships, it is extremely sad. It is very hard, as our president found out, for an outside body to the, dispute, the parties in dispute to intervene, a bit like a marriage breaking up, you know, would you march in and give your view as to what should happen or who should do what when you don't know all the circumstances? It was very difficult for the Central Council, um, and I think that, our, you know, we, what we have learnt is that we need to, all of us, take away, when we get home, the need to work hard on building our relationships with our clergy in our own towers and making sure that they are excellent. 
Thank you, Kate. Any other points? Uh, Bruce? Thank you, Bruce. Second. Other comment? Ever? Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Anthony, uh, Lo Anthony Lovell Wood, Salisbury. Is this available as a PDF from the system? It is. It's on the website as a as PDF. A PDF. Okay. Yep. Thank you. And Anthony was referring to the bells in your care leaflet. Bells in your care for, for clergy. Any other points? If not, I'll ask. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, Roland, yes. Here we go again. Um, oh, uh, what's that? Uh, yeah, Roland Backus, Bath and Wells. Um, is the new logo part of the PR? Because, to be honest, when I look at it, I don't see bells. I see skittles. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I have heard of other things that other people see in it. I think that that logo really needs to be reconsidered. Um, it's just a mess. The PR committee had no hand in designing the logo. <laughs> <laughs> All I'd add is branding is part of the um, uh, Craig. Yes, I, I, I trust Roland voted for that. For, no. for proposal I, which is the rebranding exercise. <laughs> But Doug? Yeah, Doug Davis, Kent County Associ Association. Just in response to the logo, um, we actually outsourced that to a professional <laughs> company. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so no, nobody in here can be blamed for that specifically. But, um, yeah. But if there are no other points, can we uh, can I move the adoption of the PR report, please? In favour? Any against? Extensions? No, thank you very much. Um, there have been four nominations for the committee Kate Flavel, Susan Hall, Vicky Chapman, and Mike Bale. You, are you all happy with those nominations? Yeah. Yes. Can't hear me. Right, okay. I'll repeat it. There were four nominations for the PR committee. Kate Flavel, Susan Hall, Vicky Chapman, and Mike Bale. Are you all in favour of those persons? Yes? Thank you. Okay. Declare yep. elected. Yes, declare elected. Okay. Uh, publications, Beryl Norris. Uh, John Cooperthwaite, Guildford Guild, pretending to be Beryl Norris. <laughs> you haven't got the legs for it. <laughs> I had once, Mr. Brilliant. Chairman. Uh, just two quick things to add to what's uh, written on page 437. Uh, the first thing is that we are now able to offer the normal discounts with uh, orders of our PayPal. And the second thing is that on sale on our bookstall is this new book by Bill Butler, um, which, if you ask him nicely, Bill will be very pleased to sign for you. <laughs> um, with, with that, Mr Chairman, the uh, report is as it stands, and I propose its adoption. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Beryl Norris, Guildford Guild. I'd like to second the Thank you, Beryl. Report. Any questions for the Publications Committee? Are you all in favour of the adoption of their report? Any against? Thank you very much. And we have two nominations, Beryl Norris and Jan Wyatt, so I declare them elected to the committee. Redundant bells, uh, Julian. Uh, Mr. Jim, may, may I uh, just uh, add a little bit? Uh, the bookstore will be open for a few minutes after the meeting, if anybody's right, thank interested. You. I'm sorry, Fred, was there something you wish to raise? Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Fred Bone, Essex Association. Um, I, I did try to wave my hand at you uh, Sorry, before you took... Anyway, um, I'd just like to ask the Publications Committee if they would be kind enough to forward the PDF of the New Decisions booklet so that it can go up on the website because there have been some adverse comments about the fact that the version on the freely downloadable from the website is the 
previous 2013 edition. Thank you. Thank you for raising that, Fred. The, the 2016 uh, edition of the rules is, is available. Uh, we can certainly do just that. Thank you, John. Uh, moving on, Julian, redundant bells. Robert Wood, Robert, uh, thank you, pardon. University of Bristol Society. Um, happy to propose the report of the Redundant Bells Committee. A um, couple of points I'd just like to add, if I may. The report is on page 437. We would like to encourage all associations, or at least territorial associations, I think, to address the question of redundant bells within their areas and to have somebody or a committee, an individual, some, some sort of arrangement for ha keeping an overview of um, towers where they are becoming changing use or closing or whatever and um, representing Ringer's interest in those situations and if whoever is going to take on that role would like to contact us so that we can maintain that link that would be very helpful. The other thing I would like to do is to pay tribute to the work of Bob Cools who as you've heard earlier on today has resigned from council and in as also from this committee. He chaired the committee over a great many years. He also acted as secretary to the Bowes Rescue Fund. We are enormously grateful to him for all of the work he's done and I'd appreciate it if council could r yeah. record that. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. David Westerman, Peterborough Guild. I'd like to second that report. Thank you. Do you have any questions for the committee? No. In favour of adoption of the report, please. Any against? Any abstentions? No. Thank you very much. Uh, two nominations for the committee uh, Ian Hastelo and Helen Webb, so they are duly elected. Ringing centres. Paul. Right, the Ringing Census Committee. Name? Paul Marshall, Worcestershire and Districts Association. Um, to report that uh, our latest newsletter, Training Times, has been published and is available on the Central Council website. And I'm told a copy will be sent to all reps following the meeting. Our annual survey has been sent to all 41 Ringing Centres uh, which are affiliated with the Council and the database which we maintain will be updated and certificates issued when we have received the returns. As stated in our report, we are having discussions with the Education Committee uh, regarding closer uh, cooperation in the future. Uh, I assume with the uh, changes coming about with CRAG, this will uh, come about naturally anyway. Um, as well as the one nomination, uh, we uh, unfortunately Phil Bailey's nomination um, didn't uh, make the cut line. So he, we have in our um, meeting which we held at in Birmingham uh, earlier this year, uh, we co-opted in onto the committee. And with that, I am happy to propose the adoption of this report. Thank you, Paul. Barry. Uh, Barry Dove of the Yorkshire Association. My great pleasure to second th this. Thank you. Any questions for the committee? I ask you you're in favour of adoption of the committee's report, please. Thank you. Any against or abstentions? No. Um, for re election to the committee, Paul Marshall is uh, proposed and so is duly elected. The ringing trends, as you know, um, has not been populated uh, since last year. Uh, there is going to be ongoing work, and I would make a plea to you on behalf of the incoming president um, that if anyone is interested in uh, work which will involve looking at how there are so many things which are affecting the ringing exercise, that uh, if anyone's willing to take up the cudgels and do that work as part of Ringing Trends, 
uh, they should contact the officers. Thank you. Towers and Belfries. Uh, yes, John? You're expressing an interest, are you, John? I, John Harris, an Oxford Diocese and Guild. I wish to ask a question. Uh, we knew this time last year that there were nobody willing to stand on that Trends Committee. I think we all agree its work is important for this council. I would like to ask what measures have been taken by the officers in the last year to overcome the emptiness of that committee? Christopher Romani, ANZEB, just to respond to John. Um, um, I had some conversations with uh, Elva and Mark Ainsworth uh, quite soon after the Portsmouth meeting to secure the records, the data, uh, that Ringing Trends had amassed, um, and I still have those uh, usernames and passwords so that that data is not lost. Um, uh, we've certainly asked for volunteers to come forward, none have been forthcoming. I've also been speaking with, uh, uh, with Tim Hine on the Education Committee about the possibility of the work of the Trends Committee to be absorbed into the work of the Education Committee. That conversation continues. Um, and will also be absorbed into the ongoing work that we've had highlighted through the CRAG proposals today. Um, as Chris has just alluded, um, there are trends that we need to be tracking, commenting on. Um, there are the big picture items that we already know are the big issues that we need to act on, recruitment, retention, leadership. Um, and the engagement that we have with external stakeholders, whether that's church buildings, council, churches, conservation trust, um, uh, the C of E in general, to make sure that we are proactively engaging with wider trends in our society and, and the Christian world. Uh, so it's certainly not forgotten, John. Thank you. Towers and Belfries. Thank you, Mr. President. David Cocoldy, Sussex County Association. Uh, our report is on page 437, 438. Uh, a couple of uh, quick updates on that. We have held a bell frame recording seminar earlier in April. The maintenance handbook or manual of maintenance, uh, that hopefully will be going to the publications committee within the next couple of weeks. Uh, and we are in the early stages of arranging a bell maintenance seminar for the autumn. Uh, we've, we've had a, a few requests for one of those uh, this year. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to propose, uh, propose the adoption of our report. Thank you. Alison. Alison Hodge, Worcestershire and Districts. I'm, I'm pleased to second that report. Any questions for the towns and belfries? In that case, can I ask your approval for the adoption of the report? Any against? Abstentions? No? Thank you. And uh, three persons nominated for the committee, uh, continuing Alison Hodge, David Kirkcaldy, and Alan Yaldon, though they are duly elected. Tower stewardship. Hello, Ernie Dilley from Samantha Lancashire Association. Um, my report is very much as printed. Just a, a comment based on some of the other comments that have been passed around today about our relationship with the church. Over the past year, we receive a number of inquiries for help and advice, inquiries like um, safeguarding, health and safety, insurance, etc. And when you dive into it, about I would guess about 40 to 50 percent of the problems that they are reporting aren't so much with those subjects, but the problems are actually with communication with the church, where ringers are not talking with the vicars or church ones, etc. So, yes, I would very much encourage that we go back and we actually talk to our churches. With that comment, I'd like to propose the adoption of my report. Thank you, Ernie. David Mattingly, Winchester and Portsmouth. I would like to second the report. Thank you. Any questions for the committee? Very important committee to our stewardship. It covers a lot of legislation and interface with outside bodies, which uh, impacts very greatly on, on ringers. It's very important. 
Mr. Can I ask... Be, be, before I go any further, can I pay tribute to yourself with the vast amount of work you have done on safeguarding? Thank you, Ernest. Thank you. Um, can I ask for your uh, approval of the adoption of the report? Any against? Any abstentions? No, thank you. And one nomination for the uh, committee, one Chris Mew, whoever he is, this is <laughs> so he can carry on his work. <laughs> Bell Restoration. Peter. Thank you, President. Peter Wilkinson of the uh, Chester Diocesan Guild. Um, I just crave your indulgence for a moment before I address Bell Restoration matters, uh, just to say a, a very public and sincere and brief thank you to those who voted for me in the election this morning. And lest there be any doubt, uh, my enthusiasm for bell ringing and for this council is undiminished by the result, <laughs> and I wish David Cacoldi every success. You're not uh, going to ask for your £5 pound for bribes back, are you? <laughs> <laughs> now, to important things, <coughs> the Bell Restoration Committee report. Uh, the report is before you on pages 438 and 439, um, and I trust you've all had a read of that. Uh, just a few updates since the report was prepared and published. Um, Black Borton, who received £57,000 from um, what was CETA and now Suez, uh, that project is uh, still on course to complete by September of this year. So that's uh, obviously very good news. Uh, we are sponsoring, I'm not sure sponsoring is quite the right word, we're providing the material for the Ringing World calendar uh, for 2018 um, as another avenue to try to get the message out there to as many towers and, and ringers and indeed non-ringers as possible um, about our aspect of the work of this council. Um, so I commend that calendar to you and I trust everybody in this room at least will be buying a copy. Um, <clears throat> you'll remember uh, a couple of years ago that we received a, a very generous legacy and we decided because of the amount of money involved that we would actually distribute grants in two tranches. We did one tranche in 2015 and most of those projects have now completed and we have <coughs> awarded the second uh, tranche of grants uh, in February of this year so all of that money is now committed to various projects and those have been published in the ringing world um, so you should all be aware of where they are. Uh, similarly, Fred Duke's fund, uh, we usually, um, that's a capital fund where we only have the interest at our disposal. Uh, we traditionally invite applications uh, round about uh, November, December, with a view to receiving applications and awarding grants at our February meeting. <clears throat> we had one uh, eligible application, uh, so a grant was awarded in February, and that also has been published in the ringing world. Uh, we've had feedback from some projects that have been adversely affected by the uh, Whitechapel situation. Uh, and obviously any help we can give to those projects to resolve those hiccups, uh, we will be more than happy to do. Uh, last year I reported that uh, uh, Stella Bianco uh, was uh, wishing to stand down from uh, the uh, jigsaw project, uh, which has been a very valuable source of income to us. Uh, Stella's been um, very helpful in sort of handing over responsibility of that project to the Bell Restoration Committee, and it certainly is our intention to continue with um, further editions in the series. And of course, we can obtain reprints. So anybody who's missing that vital one to complete their set, if you let us know, we'll see what we can do for you. I did thank Stella last year in her absence uh, but I'd now like to do so again in her presence. I think she's around somewhere. Over Stella. There. Um, so, Stella, thank you for all your work uh, on, on that project and also for all your assistance in handing over the project to our tender care, and we'll do our best to continue the good work. 
I don't like to mention names particularly, uh, but one name does need to be mentioned, that of Chris Rogers, a former secretary to the council, and uh, latterly for a number of years, a member of our committee. Uh, Chris has um, stood down from the council this year, uh, and therefore uh, from our committee. Um, and we are obviously very grateful for all his hard work and wise counsel while he was a member. He has offered any assistance to us um, if we want to uh, avail ourselves of that, and I'm sure we will be uh, in the future. You've seen our list of bullet points for ongoing tasks. That's our sort of bread and butter business, if you like, uh, and those largely will continue. Um, personnel change, people need to be reminded those things are sort of uh, standing items, more or less. Uh, future work, uh, we do intend to hold seminars in the future to take our work and expertise and advice out to um, projects in various parts of the country. Um, so uh, that's um, continuing on the back of the successful seminar in 2015. Uh, we will be um, availing ourselves of, of some outside advice to update our um, guidance note for charity registration, VAT and gift aid. Um, and I've, I've, as I've already mentioned, the Ringing World Calendar and the jigsaws. Um, just one point that's, that's been mentioned previously today, several times, that of diaries. We try to publish our meeting dates on the Bellboard Diary feature uh, and previously on Campana File as well. And um, it's regrettable sometimes when there are clashes of date. Uh, I know it can't always be avoided. There are only sort of 52 or there about Saturdays in the year. Um, but it would be um, advisable for people organizing, particularly council uh, events, to look at that diary and, and see what else is already in there. Um, so with that, Mr. President, I would present the report and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Peter. Jay Bunyan, Bath and Wells. I'd like to second the adoption of the Bell Restoration Committee report. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions after that foursome report, Helen? Helen Webb, Ladies Guild. Um, I have a general question about bell restoration grants. Um, th they generally include clauses that the restoration has to be for the, um, to advance the Christian religion. Now we've got an increase in secular rings and we're also looking at the change of use of some church buildings in the future. So what is the committee or the council going to do about changing the terms of these funds so that monies can be granted to secular and other rings? Uh, we, we'd be very happy to look at the, the terms of um, reference for the, uh, the, the, the grants. Uh, the priorities for grants are published uh, every year um, as to where we would aim the money if, if we need to, uh, to prioritise. Um, but I do take on board the point that uh, there will be, I'm sure in the future, many more rings that are not uh, church rings as we understand them at the moment so thank you for that we will take that on board and I have a second question um, York Minster put into sharp relief that even though ringers fund largely um, bell installations they can be blocked from having access to those rings um, is also from being on redundant bells looking at the um, closure of churches and the fact that those bells become the property of the church to dispose of what clauses can we put on grants such that if the change the um, change of ownership or change of use such that and, th and this applies to associations giving grants as well that actually that money can either be returned to the awarding body or the access is maintained to those bells after the church has been closed or an ownership has changed. Uh, uh, Robert Wood uh, has, uh, and, and Chris Sharp uh, have uh, already got the, the whole question of, of redundancies and, and arrangements with, uh, with access to redundant bills. Um, we are in the process of, of uh, setting up a sort of joint committee 
with Church Buildings Council um, to, to look at that, that whole question uh, of uh, caveats and uh, uh, safeguards for ringers. How soon is that going to come out? Because associations are still giving grants of, I mean, Kent County gives out up to £10,000. Um, how soon is this going to come out into the ringing community such that we're not losing control of things that we're paying for? And I'm not sort of saying that in terms of we've got to maintain access, but we are paying for these assets and then we are losing control of them. I think it would be very difficult to make, uh, put a condition on a grant for a, 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 an active church uh, in, in the possibility that it might be redundant 20 years' time. Yeah, but I think in terms of... It's got of to be taken uh, as, as situations are at the time grants are made. Yeah, but if, if it's going to be within five years' time, then that is money that could be reclawed. Mm. Right. Point taken, but we so it, it is being looked at, Helene. Mr President, if, if I, I might uh, add a little bit to that. Um, following the um, Redundant Bells Committee meeting, which I, I think was yesterday, uh, the Chairman Robert spoke to me uh, yesterday uh, about those sorts of issues and I said that we would be happy to consider um, those points at our next meeting which is on the 10th of June, uh, so only a couple of weeks away. Um, it is a difficult area as you've said Mr President but we're certainly very happy to look at it and see whether we can uh, make any progress on that. I do understand the point that you're making that if significant money is given by ringers through either the central council fund or uh, association funds whether there is anything that we can do to safeguard uh, the access and use of those bells when circumstances may change at the church uh, if only for a certain period of time perhaps could be sir. any other points in that case can i sorry one more yes duncan yeah, Duncan Walker, Carlisle, Dorset and Gill. May, on, on that point of possible conditionality on grants, can I just suggest that instead of reinventing the wheel on that, you look at other grant-making bodies' approach to that conditionality, such as the Big Lottery Fund. Having managed a Big Lottery Fund grant, I can tell you their conditions are kind of voluminous. And so, you know, rather than reinventing the wheel, just suggest you look at how that's handled by other grant-making bodies. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for Duncan. that. We will certainly take that on board, Duncan. Any other points? In that case, can I ask for your approval of the adoption of the report? Any against? Abstentions? No, thank you very much. Um, there are two uh, persons nominated for the committee, Peter Kirby and Pat Orwin. I declare them elected. Biographies? Biographies? <laughs> Come on, John. Sue, I went up to Sue, Sue and you were talking about Elaine, so I hated it. <laughs> John Harrison, Oxford Diocese and Guild. A um, few things have changed since we wrote our report at the year end. Um, superficially, there are now 950 records on the website rather than 941. More significantly, the recent ones, we have not had to send them to the ICT committee to put them up for our benefit. With an introduction of a new website, we can now, within minutes of having produced the PDF, get them online without putting any imposed load on the ICT committee, and that is a significant step forward. Um, in our report, there was a rather long list of possible future plans and aspirations. Several of those uh, we are making some progress on. One particular uh, that we aren't, and I'd like to put it on appeal, we would like to make the bridge between ringing history and the outside community of family history societies. We believe there's a productive link there, um, but anybody who's involved in that world, who's involved in family history societies, who could help us work out a way, for instance, to write an article that they might find of interest, um, that would please get in touch, because we think if we could get to the point where people doing family history, the standard guidance says, look at BMD, have they got any military, because they have records, were they a bell ringer, because they've got good records. Uh, we'd like to link ringing into the wider fabric of society and social history. Uh, and we do that by forming bridges, but we don't quite know how to form the bridges at the moment, because we haven't got those connections. So if anybody's got those connections, please get in touch. 
Uh, and with that, I'd like to propose our report. Thank you, John. Richard. Uh, Richard Andrew, St Martin's Guild. I'm happy to second the adoption of this report. Thank you. Are there any questions for the committee? Can I ask then for your approval of the committee's report? Thank you. Any against? I would just remind you, as John did earlier on, if any of you hadn't had your mugshot taken, um, uh, he would be grateful for you to pose for the police after the meeting. Thank you. Uh, we have two uh, names, nominations for the committee, David Jones and David Willis, and I declare them elected. Compositions. Richard. Richard Alton, Ancient Society of College Youths. A couple of comments on the report. We note that all our updating of compositions submitted goes to Don Morrison's website. Those of you who aren't aware, Don has done quite a major revamp of his site this year, mainly in the last month or so, which means we have been a bit slow putting things up, for which we apologise. And if anybody has any suggestions or things they would like us to do articles on, please let us know. With that, I'd like to propose the report as it is on the paper. Thank you, Richard. Paul? Uh, Paul Flavel, Surrey Association. I'd like to second the report. Thank you. Have you any questions for Richard and Paul? Nothing will happen. In that case, can I move the adoption of the report? All in favour? Thank you very much. Any against or abstentions? No. Thank you. Um, one nominee for the committee, Andrew Johnson, duly elected. Education. Mr. Hine. Mr. President. <laughs> Fellow ringers. <laughs> Trying to be brief. You've got the report Hine. there. Tim Hine. North, North Staffs Association. <laughs> Apologies. Um, Trying to be fairly brief here, there are four highlight things that have arisen since this report was written. Everything that we've been doing has come much more under the microscope and we are much more into working with others. As the report mentions, we welcome the involvement of other organisations Working alongside those it is going to be an increasing focus for us. So there are four points to make. Uh, a leadership, which we plan to do more work on this year. Support for associations. This is down to um, what people want, really. And Pip Penny and Clyde Whitaker, who we have already co-opted, have agreed to head up that. So if you have ideas of what you would like, do contact them, please. We had ringing trends mentioned earlier on and ringing centres, and we are quite keen to do what we can on both those areas. That's it. Thank you, Tim. Second that. Lucy Hopkins, Till, Oxford Diocesan Guild. I'd like to second the adoption of this report. Thank you, Lucy. Any questions for the committee? No? In that case, can I move the adoption of the report, please? All in favour? Thank you. Anyone against? Abstentions? No? Thank you. And uh, three nominees for the committee, Lucy Top Hopkins Till, David Hibbert and Clyde Whitaker, who are duly elected. Information and Communications Technology. Hi there, uh, David Richards, Cambridge University Guild. Um, it's been said several times today already that it's impecunious to mention people who've put in special effort. However, here we go again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, particular thanks to Doug on my left, uh, Andrew Hall, and also Caroline and Clyde who put in excellent effort to get the new website to where it is this year. <laughs> Hopefully people can agree that it's a good step forward. There's a lot more work to be done, but hopefully everyone feels confident in using the new site. If they don't, get in touch with us. Um, also, in terms of special thanks, I'd like to say an extra special thank you to the Scottish Association. They've provided us a fantastic venue, um, and the facilities that have been provided for running today's meeting, and Craig Collin up there, take, take a, stand up and take a round of applause, because it's been absolutely great.
absolutely tremendous amount of effort has gone in and we've received a lot of positive comments. <laughs> A lot of positive comments about, about the uh, quality of the streaming that's gone out today, and it's a, it's a level that uh, we will really struggle um, to provide in the future. That leads into the next point, uh, which is that um, you've read the report, but really the focus for ICT this year will be working out um, how CRAG affects us um, and where the division is going to be between what is currently ICT and what will um, become uh, in the new structure. So, um, without um, much else, I, I would commend this report to the Council. Thank you. Doug Davis, Kent County Association, I second that report. Thank you. Have you any questions for the committee? No. Roland Backhurst. Uh, normally, uh, Roland Backhurst, Bath and Wells, yet again. Uh, normally, I um, throw brickbats at people. At this time, I'd like to compliment you. Um, I had a problem when I first logged into the um, new website. There was an awful lot of flicker. I emailed you about it, and it was corrected very quickly, especially on the larger screens that um, people tend to use at home. Um, I don't know whether that was just a case of you'd done some of it on sort of smaller screens when you're developing the system or not. <laughs> but yes, congratulations on such a quick response. Thank you, Roland. Any other comments? Yeah. Christopher Romani, Enzeb, I also would like to add to the, uh, the compliments, not the brickbats. So my compliments to all the members of the ICT committee, a tremendous year's work. Thank you. And uh, I wouldn't speak out of turn. Because it, the, IT is the new window for our ringing activity. It's already proven itself with access uh, through the website and it's going to be a big leader uh, in the coming years and with the proposals being looked at by Craig. So I'll c commend the work. Uh, can I have your approval to the adoption of the report? Anyone against? No? Thank you very much. And uh, one nominee to the committee, Peter Harrison, duly elected. Library committee. Alan Glover, Shropshire Association, a poor substitute for Linda Fodderingham. Um, one of the first publications by the Library Committee back in the last century was a CD of the Trollope Manuscript, which is about 7,000 pages of the history of ringing. Uh, one or two users have pointed out to us that your modern computing contraptions don't use um, the same format that we used to produce that. Uh, the response was for mainly Paul Johnson to get on with reformatting the whole thing. Um, it's now available on the new Central Council website um, and is being well used. Uh, we also acquired another volume of Trollope's work, uh, this time on his science of change ringing, and the 400 pages of that have also been scanned and added to the Central Council website. If you're deeply into the science of ringing, as it was in 1922, I'm sure you'll be fascinated. As well as the ongoing projects, which we try to keep up with, um, we did have the possibility of a project to do with um, peel boards. We wanted to collect at least a sample of those in image form and make them available. We had a good long think about this, and because of doubts about whether the committee will exist in 12 months' time, who the members will be in 12 months' time, we decided that we would not take on a prospective long-term project because the people who replace us um, may just knock it on the head. Uh, so that one we have put into abeyance if we like what Craig does and we end up with a situation where we feel it's viable, we'll pick that one up again um, in, a year, in a couple of years' time. Uh, the report's on page 441. I propose it. Thank you. Ian Self, Truro Diocesan Guild. I'm pleased to second adoption of the report. Thank you. Any questions for the Library Committee? Very important committee. It's something that's there in the background. We've probably got the best collection of books on ringing anywhere 
even taking into account the British Library. And uh, we should appreciate it and take care of it and use it. Um, any questions? No? In which case, can I move the adoption of the report, please? In favour? Thank you very much. And two nominations for the committee, Sue Marsden and Paul Johnson, duly elected. Methods Committee, you've heard quite a lot of that for, from Peter Niblett, but we'll, we'll, we'll let him get up on the stand oh, again. Here I am again. <laughs> okay, thank you. Everybody. No hissing, please. Right, I'm not going to... Um, I think we've discussed quite a lot of the things that are in the report, um, but there are three points I would like to make. Um, first of all, um, to say thank you to the, the, the new members we had, new team that we have, um, joined the Methods Committee. We had Mark Davis joined last year, David, my seconder here, um, Graham John, who you've heard from already, um, and Tim Barnes, who's uh, in the US. Um, and I think we have really good momentum going. We've been using uh, new tools to help us um, do that, and I would like to make sure that momentum carries forward as we go on to CRAG. So thank you for that. Um, Secondly, I do need to point out that um, you now we've talked a lot about the value of having the uh, methods collection, um, online methods collection. That does really rely on us having a robust set of decisions. Um, so I think we need to be very careful that going forward we have decisions that allow us to uh, unequivocally maintain that collection. Um, now, third point um, on a kind of personal note here. Um, I'll notice, we'll note that uh, Tony Smith is no longer um, on the council. I know that he's been regarded as the enemy by a number of people, particularly outside the council. Um, he has suffered quite a bit of personal abuse from people. Um, but I think we as a council ought to recognize the enormous effort that he's put in. The fact that we have the online collections today is really entirely due to his initiative and drive. He's put a huge amount of time as well as his own um, you know, money in hosting the websites. Um, and I think that should not, his contribution should not go unrecognized by the council as we go forward. <laughs> Thank you. Um, with that, I would like to propose the adoption of the report. David Grimwood Kent, uh, happy to second that. Thank you. Have you any questions for the Methods Committee? In that case, can I ask for the adoption of the report, please? In favour? Thank you. Any against? Thank you very much. And uh, there are four, uh, five nominations for the committee uh, Derek Williams, Graham John, Andrew Johnson, Tim Barnes, and Lee Simpson all of whom duly elected. Peel Records Committee. Richard again. <coughs> Richard Alton, Asian Society of College Youths. The report is the biggest one that you can see, ranging from quite a few pages. Um, one correction I've been notified so far on page 446, the appeal of Gina McDonnell, new Bob Triples, Despite being wrong in Peterborough, was actually it should have been for the EVBA. Uh, the second thing I'd like to point to just mention is all this data that we provide has been generated mainly from the good work that Bill Hibbert on the, as part of the Ringham World Board from Pills.co.uk, and we are in discussions with Richard Smith and the Ringham World Board for taking that forward using Bellboard. And with that, I propose the report. Thank you, Richard. Chris Turner, Lincoln Guild, I second the support. Any questions for the Peel Records Committee? Can I ask for your approval for the adoption of the report, please? Thank you. Any against? Abstentions? No? Thank you. And uh, two nominees for the committee, Chris Turner and Alan Baldock, duly elected. Um, we now have... Um, the reports of the stewards. Uh, the stewards of the Carter Ringing Machine collection, which you'll find on page 446. Um, Is that ready? Sorry? 
Yes, right. You're there. Hello, Bill. <laughs> Carry on. Bill Purvis, ex officio. Um, the report is in the papers and I recommend it to you. I'm happy to take any questions. James Blackburn, Beverley and District Ring and Society. I'm happy to second the report. Thank you, James. Any questions for the stewards of the Carter Ringing Machine? No? Okay. Can I ask for your approval for the adoption report? Thank you very much. And um, we have uh, stewards uh, uh, appointed Bill Purvis uh, and James Blackburn duly elected. Thank you very much for your work. Report of Steward of the Rolls of Honour. Thank you, Mr. President. Alan Regan, ex officio, Steward of the Rolls of Honour. Um, the report appears on page 446 of the supplement. Um, and since the production of the or production of the report, there has been additions. I'm very grateful to, to Robert and Will of the Ring and World for continuing to publish these roles of honour. April, May and June 1917 have now been included. It mentions in the report that I have 22 new names to be added. Uh, this has been increased considerably and I'll perhaps explain what's been going on. So my research has um, now 23 new, uh, new names and the 23rd one is a chap Private Frederick Lawrence, who died on the 19th of June 1917, who was a ringer here in Edinburgh, down in Leith. So he is the latest addition. He will be commemorated with a, hopefully, a handbell peel uh, in the church hall, which is now the church down at Leith. Um, David Willis, a member of the Biographies Committee, has decided to look at newspaper reports um, that appeared uh, back through the war years. Um, and indeed, many of these, it has been found, mentions bell ringers. I've often said that I believe there are hundreds of names to be gathered. And what David's research has shown is this is a week's work that he's undertaken looking at all the online newspapers that there are. Not every newspaper is online yet, but more are coming uh, as we speak. He has found 36 ringers from Devon alone, who were not remembered in the role of honor already, and extending his search, 55 from elsewhere across the country, making 114 new names to be added to the role of honour. This will continue and I'm sure we are finding some of these several hundred that I've mentioned. Um, one of these, a chap called Private Herbert Rowland, who came from a place in Devon, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this right, but Thrushelton, and he was in the Devonshire Regiment and he was killed on the 1st of July, 1916, first day of the Battle of the Somme. And he's buried in a particularly important cemetery on the Somme, which contains just over 100 um, graves. They were brought back in from no man's land by the chaplain. And this is the Devonshire Cemetery. All but one belonged to the same Devonshire Regiment, 8th Battalion, the other one is a Royal Engineer. They all died on the 1st of July, 1916. And I was particularly keen that we would find a ringer from Devon amongst those, <coughs> and we now have. Um, and just people that we should remember, as we did last year, on the 29th of May, 1917, there were two ringing casualties that we know about. Sergeant Ernest Edward Sherlock from Runcorn in the Chester Diocesan Guild. He was buried at Runcorn Cemetery. He died of wounds uh, from the war. And there's Private Hugh Chapman Nash 
of Old Swinford, Worcestershire's, and he is buried in Baghdad, the Northgate Cemetery there. So we remember those two particularly today. They died a hundred years ago today. I'm happy to take any questions if you would like, but I'd like to propose the adoption of the report. Thank you, Alan. Any questions for Alan? Uh, Peter? Well, more uh, a quick comment. Uh, the, the Runcorn Ringer that you mentioned is due to be commemorated by a court appeal attempt this evening, which I was invited to take part in, but as I have a Ford Focus, not a TARDIS, I wasn't able to uh, accept. So he should be commemorated with some special ringing today. Thank you, Peter. Is there somebody else over there? No. Robert Wood. Robert Wood, um, Robert Wood uh, University of Bristol Society. Mr. President, I'm in awe of the work that Alan does um, on our behalf. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I see from the minutes from last year, I seconded his report last year, and I'm delighted to do so again this year. I'm just staggered by the amount of work he does, the detailed knowledge he has, and the help and support he provides to all of us in order to enable us to remember these people from 100 years ago. Thank you. That comment, Robert. Yes. I think I would echo what, what's already been said. Uh, apart from uh, the, the information and research which you've done, Alan, it's enabled so many communities across the country uh, through their bell ringers to mark uh, individual ringers' lives. And I think it's that community sense of involvement that has been so important. And we have a great debt of gratitude to you for that. Um, can I move the adoption report, please? Thank you very much. And um, pleased to uh, declare that uh, Alan is reappointed as the steward. Thank you. Um, we now come to the um, Steward of the Dove database. Now, John Baldwin, who has been uh, the key Dove steward, along with Tim Jackson, for uh, a long period of time, uh, has retired. Um, <coughs> he couldn't be here today, uh, but uh, I did go down to see him in Cardiff uh, the Friday before last, and uh, we made a presentation to him, for which um, Tim was present. We have got a photograph here. Well, I sent them. Oh, right. Have you got photos? I sent them to Terry. Oh, yes, there we are. are. Um, well, that, that's not John. That's actually... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's Beryl. <laughs> and there's John, John and Tim. Uh, John, sorry, John and myself. Um, we presented him with a uh, certificate and, uh, and uh, some <laughs> tangible gifts as well. And I think it's... Uh, only right that we recognise the tremendous amount of work which uh, John has uh, undertaken over the years in compiling, uh, building on the original Dove uh, data, uh, compiling the database, getting it online, and of course assisted very ably by Tim Jackson, who has done a tremendous amount of work as well. Um, the, there is a transition period because I think uh, as I said earlier on that the Dove database is being transferred to a secure uh, modern program server. Uh, but in the interim, um, we are the, the transition, uh, we are having three uh, stewards. Um, and uh, Tim Pett has been proposed. Uh, Doug Davis and uh, obviously continuing Tim Jackson. Uh, anyway, um, would you like to say anything, Tim? No, Tim Jackson, the ex officio. I think the only other thing to say is that um, in the interim, John and I will be carrying on with the existing system until the new system is up and running. So apart from that, um, I pr propose the adoption of the report. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Tim? No. Uh, propose the adoption of the report. A seconder, please. A seconder. Yeah, seconder. Yes, we seconder, please. Thank you. Yep. 
Thank you, Fred. Right, can I, in that case, can I move the adoption report, please? Thank you very much indeed. And, um, could we give John Mike? Sorry? If we knew that John Mike was watching, could we give him a round of applause? Yes, yes, in case uh, John is watching on, on stream, I think we ought to give him a, a round of applause. <laughs> Rescue fund for redundant bills. Well, we've already had one thing. Right? Yes. No, the rescue fund is currently with separate charities. Yes, right. Robert and Helen. Are you going to come and speak, Robert, or just speak from there? Robert Wood, University of Bristol Society. Um, <laughs> the, I'd like to propose the report for the uh, Bells Rescue Fund, um, which we've al already agreed to close down. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Robert. Any, any, com any comments, anyone? Seconder? Helen Webb, Helen. Um, Ladies Thank Guild, you. I'd like to second the report. Thank you. Any, any comments or questions? In that case, I'll move the adoption report, please. Thank you very much. Okay. Future meetings. Have uh, you got anything to add? No, nothing, nothing to add. No, you've already heard about Lancaster. Uh, okay. Did you mention Irish invitation? Yes, yes. Um, we've had an invitation from the Irish Association um, for 2023, uh, which has been acknowledged and will be considered in due course in, in relation to future arrangements. If there are any guilds who would like to invite the council to, be, to locate in their areas, <laughs> somebody waving there. <laughs> okay, right. Um, right, I'll now ask, to, uh, ask Mary to just give us a, a rundown on the attendance this uh, council. Right, okay, so there are 31 societies fully represented here, um, that's under half, uh, with 85 members present, 27 societies partly represented with 68 members present, and 8 societies not represented at all, so that's 153 representative members present, 5 life members present, 3 additional members and 6 official ex officio members so the ex officios get a um, clean sheet 100% attendance record and that's a total of 167 thank you mary and i'd like to thank obviously i'd like to thank stephen franklin carol's husband who beavered away compiling this while we were talking about other things thank you um, right um, first of all do i have your agreement that ballot papers be uh, destroyed. Thank you. And uh, Mary, I think, would like you all to re return your badge holders. She gets thrumps back for each one. Uh, Mary, uh, maybe you had right. something else? Uh, I think this got mentioned earlier when somebody said they didn't actually know what the date would be for next year's meeting or something like that. Um, the nomination deadline for, under the current rules, committee elections or additional membership for next year's meeting is 28th of March. The meeting is the 28th, 27th, 28th May. If, if the meeting formally opens on the Sunday, then the nomination deadline will obviously be adjusted to suit and would become the 27th of March. I've just got a few more points as well. I know you're all getting twitchy, but bear with me, please. Right. Um, at the beginning of each triennium, we try and obtain a snapshot of the number of ringers in our various societies. This is actually particularly important in the absence of people currently working on trends, and while well, we hope that that will change. There's a document on the website. Um, there are lots of gaps. A number of societies merrily paid their affiliation fees but forgot to actually fill in the form or tell me how many members they've got. Um, I caught up with the change in the Durham and Newcastle 
with their decrease in membership fairly recently. If your membership increases, of course, under the current rules, you are entitled to more representative members to increase your voice on our deliberations. I would really, really appreciate it if everybody could take a look at that document on the website and email me so that we can fill in the gaps. I have got one or two, the Durham and Newcastle and the Oxford, to, to fill in anyway, but it would be very helpful as we look at ringing ahead to fill those in. Uh, we caught up today with the fact that Anne Anthony has resigned as a Central Council representative for the Guildford Guild. Um, there do seem to be a few glitches occasionally in who is responsible for telling us things. So it, if you could, if things change in your area, I don't mind how many times I'm told. I'd rather be told three times than not told at all, please. So keep the emails coming in. And I'd like to apologise to Cathy Thorley because I omitted her name this morning from the list of new members, so she didn't get the chance to stand up and wave to us then. So my apologies to Cathy. Derek wanted to say a word. All right, OK. Um, right, uh, now I believe uh, Derek Sibson wanted to say a word. Microphone, please. Wait for the microphone, Derek. Mr. President, thank you. Uh, having been thwarted this morning from saying something which I wanted to do uh, by the fact that Mary was opposed, uh, returned unopposed and therefore did not need a speech, I would like to explain that she has now been secretary for eight years and Carol has been her assistant for the last three years and I would like to propose a vote of thanks to them for all their hard work over many years. Yeah. Right, it's now my turn to say some words of thanks. Of course, the thing is, with uh, those that are uh, sort of re-elected and carrying on, you tend to uh, sort of not get the chance to, to welcome them as, as, as officers. But my thanks go out to all the uh, fellow officers who've supported me over the last three years. Um, they've all been a tremendous help and uh, it's been a great privilege to work with them. I'd also like to thank all members of the council, uh, especially those who served on committees. Your work is often not appreciated by either your societies or ringers at large and it is important. I'd like to thank uh, all our, the stewards of, uh, of the uh, Dove and Rolls of Honour, etc. And uh, to all your individual support, which you've all, in various guises, given me over my term of office. And now it's, it's a duty to, um, and pleasure to propose a vote of thanks to so many people that have made this weekend uh, enjoyable. Um, it gave, it's given me great pleasure to come to Edinburgh. Those of you at the dinner last night will know that I was born in Scotland and I suggested that we should come here for my last meeting. So it's a great pleasure to be in Scotland. Thank you for, from all of us uh, to the organising committee of the Scottish Association, Simon Aves, Barbara Bell, Ian Bell, Mike Clay, Jonathan Fry, Jenny Holden, Ruth Marshall, Colin North, Ruth Ogilvy, Tina Stocklin, and especially to Terry Williams, whose name you probably had most to do with. I'd like to thank also all the members of the Scottish Association who manned the reception and help desk, to the ringing members at the various towers who acted as stewards and made us so welcome, and to association members who acted as stewards at uh, St Andrews and George's here. The tellers, the ballots, microphone operators up in the gods, and all other association members of Scotland who have involved in any way with the arrangements. It's been absolutely superb. We must also thank, record our thanks to the Minister of St Andrew and St George's, Reverend Ian Gilmore, particularly for his humour last night, 
um, for leading us in prayer and his kind words of welcome at the dinner. And for the use of St Andrews and George's West for the meeting. I think you'll agree this is almost an ideal uh, layout for a meeting. There's none of you too far away that you can't throw tomatoes. You, hopefully, with or without the microphones, you can all hear well. It's not been too hot or too cold, and uh, absolutely brilliant. Reverend Callum uh, John McLucky, Vice President of uh, yes. Vice Provost of St Mary's Cathedral for the Even Song uh, and at the cathedral, and the use of the uh, the Walpole Hall for our uh, meetings on Sunday afternoon, and indeed to all the incumbents and ringers of local churches who've made bells available during the weekend. So a great thanks to all of them. <laughs> and, uh, and now it's... Uh, uh, it now, before, before Chris moves on, it's my turn. So I uh, speak on behalf of all those present. So sit down. <laughs> Good start, isn't it? Okay, so today, as we all know, is Chris's last meeting as chair of Central Council, as president. We all know that Chris has got a deep affection for ringing and a boundless, boundless enthusiasm for its well-being. He, over the last six years, has shown enormous energy and commitment, demonstrated by his willingness to participate in ringing-related activities all over the country. Uh, these include committee meetings, seminars, dedications, funerals, uh, board meetings, uh, and much, much more, either very much in the foreground or working tirelessly in the background. He continues, as you know, to be the Council's subject matter expert in all things related to safeguarding, to which we're greatly indebted to him, and we know that this will continue. Thank you, Chris. He's pursued his own ringing for the future reform agenda with determination, striving to reach out to associations and individuals and ringers at all levels. A particular highlight has been such things as organising the events surrounding the 125th anniversary of the Central Council, so closely linked to Sir Arthur Haywood, events such as the uh, First Peel 300 um, event, and many more. In his own personal life, Chris is a devoted husband, father and grandfather. He's a man of deep Christianity, of deep honesty and humility, bringing his warmth, wit, wit and wisdom not only to these meetings but to many other ringing forums and as a great help to me personally. So Chris, it is going to be a hard act to follow, but I know that I speak for all of us here on the Central Council to propose a vote of thanks to Chris and to pass on a token of our appreciation. Something, something for Anne as well. <laughs> I won't call you down. <laughs> well, thank you very much for those kind words, Christopher. And that gives me great pleasure uh, to pass this badge of office over to you. I hope that uh, mm, that's people will give you the same support <laughs> in your term of office as I've had in mine. Congratulations and best wishes for the future. And, And I can now declare the meeting closed. <laughs> your first Australian, and I hope not your last. Yeah. 